The Mind Illuminated A Complete Meditation Guide Integrating Buddhist Wisdom and Brain Science By Chula Dasa, John Yates, Ph.D., and Matthew Immergut, Ph.D. With Jeremy Graves Narrated by Sean Renette Forward So, how does a neuroscientist end up as a meditation master? The two disciplines are different, to be sure. My training in brain science deals with neurons and synapses, while my study of meditation is concerned with matters of attention, introspective awareness, and investigating the nature of subjective experience. But in many ways I've found that the two modes of understanding the world are more complementary than one might think, and they've given me a unique insight into how mindfulness actually changes the brain and our perceptions of the world around us. I've always been a seeker. For as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated by both the mind and the physical sciences. I always felt there must be a way to make sense of and unify our understanding of the world. What I sought, and what eventually crystallized into a lifelong passion, was nothing less than a search for ultimate truth. Little did I know what a long and convoluted but ultimately rewarding journey I would take to find it. I spent my teen years reading philosophy and psychology, Kant, Husserl, James, and Jung in particular. Despite the many insights they offered, it was disappointing to discover how little we knew about the mind, especially as compared to the precision and rapidly increasing depth of our knowledge of the physical world. So I then turned to religion, Christianity specifically, in the hope of finding answers. Inspired by the writings of John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, Meister Eckhart, and the anonymous author of The Cloud of Unknowing, I thought this might offer a path to my goal. After about three years of dedicated study and practice, I became a seminarian and was soon immersed in church history, philosophy, theology, and interpretive doctrines. But after another year and a half, I left, disillusioned at how unrepresentative the great mystics were of the modern church. Another dead end. However, I was not deterred in my search for truth. Since this happened during the mid-sixties, I followed in the footsteps of a whole generation of seekers and turned to mind-altering chemicals and plant medicines for further exploration. Through my experiences with these, I gained, for the first time, some sense of what the early Christian mystics had spoken about. The search for truth seemed almost within my grasp. However, entheogens, as they are sometimes called, have their limitations. Mostly, I realized just how fluid our perceptions are and how much they depend upon neurochemical events in the brain, much more than on the data provided via our sense organs. Shortly after realizing this, I was introduced to Eastern religions with their promise of exactly the kind of truth I sought. Unfortunately, I couldn't afford to go to Asia, like Ram Dass and others who had discovered both the virtues and limitations of mind-altering substances. But then the Beatles introduced Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and Transcendental Meditation to the West. This marked the true beginning of my meditation career. Not all of my exploration has been in the spiritual world. I've always had an interest in the so-called hard sciences, first sparked by my father, who was himself a research scientist with interests in everything from geology to astrophysics. By this time, I was a graduate student in physiology, the study of the mechanisms of the human body, and the idea of exploring the mind introspectively while at the same time studying its relationship to the brain was fascinating. These parallel explorations were to become my life's work. I spent two years practicing transcendental meditation, during which time I also completed my master's degree and began working on my Ph.D. When I discovered Buddhist meditation, the many pieces of my life so far began to fall perfectly into place. I'd come into possession of a sitar in need of repair, and I wanted to learn to play it. By chance, I met someone who could help me do both, and who had also spent several years studying Buddhism and meditating in Burma and Thailand. 
he was to become my first real spiritual teacher. Upasaka Kema Ananda had returned from Southeast Asia to teach others what he had learned and had created a small residential community of students. Over the course of several weeks of sitar repair, as we carefully fit pieces together and waited for glue to dry, he gradually introduced me to the Buddha Dharma. He also encouraged me to attend one of the frequent weekend meditation retreats he offered. Everything he'd taught me so far sounded very appealing, but what clinched it was the day he told me the Buddha had said, Don't take my word for anything I teach. Don't accept it on my authority. Come and see for yourself. Kema explained that everything the Buddha taught was available to anyone willing to take the time and train the mind to discover it for themselves. This sounded like science to me. I immediately asked to attend the next weekend retreat. I was soon part of a strong community of dedicated meditation practitioners with ready access to excellent teachers. This particular group represented a unique confluence of Tibetan and Theravadan teachings in the person of Namgyal Rinpoche, also known as George Dawson. Originally ordained as Ananda Bodhi, he was an acknowledged master in the Southeast Asian tradition before being recognized as the reincarnation of Namgyal by the 16th Gyalwa Karmapa, Rangjung Rigpe Dorje. My own teachers, Upasaka Kema Ananda and Jodhidama Bhikkhu, were his students. As Kema's student in this mixed lineage, I simultaneously engaged in the Tibetan Kagyu Foundation practices, Nundro, and the Theravadan Mahasi-style noting meditation practice. Meanwhile, I completed my Ph.D. thesis, and my interests turned more and more to neurophysiology and cognitive psychology. It was the beginning of a hugely exciting era that continues to the present day, in which the neural circuitry of the brain is being mapped out in detail and correlated with various mind states, mental activities, and functions. However, throughout my postdoctoral fellowship years, I experienced a growing conflict between the kinds of animal experimentation required by laboratory research and the moral precepts that urged me to refrain from causing harm and suffering. In the end, I took the Upasaka vows of a dedicated lay practitioner, a sort of layman's version of monastic commitment, and ceased to be active in laboratory research. Instead, I dedicated myself to teaching neuroscience and studying the research of others, while at the same time engaging intensely in meditation and studying ancient wisdom texts from many traditions. The best description of the intervening years is to say they have been dedicated to studying the brain from the inside through meditation and the mind from the outside through neuroscience and cognitive psychology. The confluence of meditation and neuroscience is a fascinating one, with the potential for each to greatly enhance the other. Both are, in fact, sciences, although meditation falls in the category of first-person science, which is only gradually gaining legitimacy among traditional scientists. In the science of meditation, the mind itself is the laboratory and the various meditation practices and techniques constitute the experimental apparatuses that are utilized in this research. It is a science in the sense that it is objectively verifiable through repeated testing and replication of results. Everyone who accurately performs the same experiment in meditation reports the same results. And as with the physical sciences, meditation also generates technologies for change, profound changes in perception, worldview, mental states, and behavior. Through meditation, we begin to see and understand the fine structure and workings of the mind. The descriptions of the mind produced by meditators can then point out to a neuroscientist where and how best to apply various methods and technologies in their investigation of the brain. Likewise, the information about the brain revealed through science can guide us in our meditation practices, making them not only more effective, but also giving us new perspectives on what we experience in practice. One great example of this is the distinction I make in this book between attention and awareness. 
Despite hundreds of thousands of meditators practicing over millennia, it has never before been clearly conceptualized and articulated that the ordinary mind has two distinct ways of knowing, even though these different ways of knowing have so much to do with achieving the goals of meditation. However, cognitive psychology and neuroscience have recently shown that there are two distinctly different kinds of knowing that involve completely different parts of the brain. This is a finding that deeply informs new ways of practicing meditation and interpreting our meditation experiences from beginner to adept. This is only one example, but the point should be obvious. Meditation can guide and inform neuroscience, and neuroscience can do the same for meditation. A very clear pattern has emerged from our scientific explorations of the brain. Over and over again, we find there are neural correlates for mental activities. Although some will resist this statement, I believe we will eventually find that all mental phenomena, without exception, have their neural correlates. This has led many scientists to become staunch materialists, insisting that the mind is merely what matter does when organized to an appropriate degree of complexity. I am not one of them. Historically, the prevailing view in cultures throughout the world has been dualism, the idea that matter is one thing and the mind another. However, close examination renders this view untenable. As a result, two reductionist interpretations have always existed side by side with the dualistic view, each eliminating one side or the other of this dualism. Materialistic reductionism asserts there is only matter, and the mind is at best an emergent property of highly organized matter, and modern neuroscience is believed by many to support this view. On the other hand, meditation and other spiritual practices often make it clear that our subjectively experienced reality is mind-created, exactly the realization I had in my teens, although I arrived at it from a different route. This realization often draws people to some form of idealism, the other reductionist interpretation, which asserts there is only mind and that matter is an illusion, a mere projection of the mind to account for experience. For them, science is irrelevant to any search for ultimate truth. Obviously, I'm not one of those, either. I am a non-dualist. Primarily as a result of meditation experiences, but supported by rational analysis as well, I hold strongly to this fourth alternative view. There is only one kind of stuff, and both mind and matter are mere appearances. When looked at from the outside, this stuff appears as matter, and as such has been the subject of scientific investigation. But when examined from the inside, this exact same stuff appears as mind. Non-duality, as realized through direct experience in meditation, completely resolves this dilemma. Both the implications and explanatory power of non-dualism are vast and would require at least another book to even scratch the surface. But thus, I say that I have spent my life investigating the mind from the outside through neuroscience and the brain from the inside through meditation. The core of my career as a dedicated lay practitioner has been a combination of daily study, practice, and numerous meditation retreats. This has been interspersed with several marriages, children, career moves, and all the ordinary distractions of a layman's life. The latter were as helpful as much as they were distractions, giving me plenty of opportunity to apply what I had learned by working through my own conditioning under challenging circumstances. I am especially blessed to have been present for this great intersection of the various Buddhist practice traditions, once so isolated from each other, as they have come together in the great melting pot of a developing global culture. I am equally blessed to have witnessed the tremendous advances in technology and research that are revealing the nature of physical reality, which includes unlocking the mysteries of the human brain. In particular, I feel deep appreciation and gratitude for the opportunity to bear witness to and participate in a process in which the cumulative wisdom of these Buddhist traditions rub shoulders with Western scientific inquiry. 
This has all been part of my own personal journey, from despair to joy, and from ignorance to wisdom, for which I am incredibly grateful. This book is my offering to all truth-seekers everywhere who are on their own special journeys. Introduction my purpose in writing this book was to create a detailed and comprehensive meditation manual that is easy to use. Much has been written about the many benefits of meditation and its contributions to emotional, psychological, and social well-being. But there is surprisingly little information available on how the mind works and how to train it. This is an attempt to fill that conspicuous need. This book is appropriate for anyone with a strong interest in meditation, from a complete beginner to someone who has practiced for decades. It will be particularly useful for those who already have a practice and feel ready to go further on the contemplative path. It's also for people who are dissatisfied with their progress, despite years of meditation. This includes practitioners who feel they've actually benefited from meditation, but who have started to believe the more profound states of consciousness meditation offers are beyond their reach. Rest assured, the full rewards of meditation are closer than you think. By necessity, the material I cover is often quite detailed and nuanced, yet it is my sincere belief that anyone with motivation can succeed. And it doesn't have to take a long time. The whole training process is divided into ten distinct, easy-to-identify stages, with thorough explanations and instructions presented along the way, from your first steps on the contemplative path, all the way to being an adept practitioner at the threshold of awakening. Meditation The Science and Art of Living Meditation is a science. The Systematic Process of Training the Mind It is the science of meditation that allows people from all walks of life to experience the same amazing benefit. A regular sitting practice has been shown to enhance concentration, lower blood pressure, and improve sleep. It is used to treat chronic pain, post-traumatic stress, anxiety, depression, and obsessive-compulsive disorders. Meditators develop valuable insights into their personality, behaviors, and relationships, making it easier to recognize and change past conditioning and counterproductive views that make life difficult. They have a greater awareness and sensitivity to others, which is enormously helpful at work and in personal relationships. The calming and relaxing effects of meditation also translate into increased emotional stability when confronting the inevitable stresses of life. Yet these are only incidental benefits. Fully developed meditation skills also give rise to unique and wonderful mental states characterized by physical comfort and pleasure, joy and happiness, deep satisfaction, and profound inner peace. States that can open the mind to an intuitive appreciation of our interconnectedness and dispel the illusion of separateness created by our egos. Furthermore, these fruits of meditation can be enjoyed all day long, for many days at a time, and we can renew them whenever we like, just by sitting down and practicing. I will describe these mental states in detail, and the systematic training presented here will lead to them with unfailing certainty. But even so, these peak experiences aren't the ultimate benefit of meditation. While bliss, joy, tranquility, and equanimity are delightful, they are also transitory and easily disrupted by sickness, aging, and difficult life circumstances. They also offer no protection from the corrupting influences of lust, greed, and aversion, nor their consequences. Therefore, these states are not an end in themselves, but only a means to a higher goal. That higher goal is awakening. Other commonly used terms include enlightenment, liberation, or self-realization. Each of these refers to a complete and lasting freedom from suffering, unaffected by aging, disease, or circumstance. True happiness, the bliss of perfect contentment, follows upon liberation from suffering. 
Awakening isn't some transient experience of unity and temporary dissolution of ego. It's the attainment of genuine wisdom, an enlightened understanding that comes from a profound realization and awakening to ultimate truth. This is a cognitive event that dispels ignorance through direct experience. Direct knowledge of the true nature of reality and the permanent liberation from suffering describes the only genuinely satisfactory goal of the spiritual path. A mind with this type of insight experiences life and death as a great adventure with the clear purpose of manifesting love and compassion toward all beings. While this book is a kind of technical manual, it's also an artist's handbook. Meditation is the art of fully conscious living. What we make of our life, the sum total of thoughts, emotions, words, and actions that fill the brief interval between birth and death, is our one great creative masterpiece. The beauty and significance of a life well lived consists not in the works we leave behind or in what history has to say about us. It comes from the quality of conscious experience that infuses our every waking moment and from the impact we have on others. Know thyself is the advice of sages. To live life consciously and creatively as a work of art, we need to understand the raw material we have to work with. This is nothing other than the continuously unfolding stream of conscious experience that is our life. Whether we are awake or dreaming, this stream consists of sensations, thoughts, emotions, and the choices we make in response to them. That is our personal reality. The art and science of meditation helps us live a more fulfilling life because it gives us the tools we need to examine and work with our conscious experience. In other words, for your personal reality to be created purposefully rather than haphazardly, you must understand your mind. But the kind of understanding required isn't just intellectual, which is ineffective by itself. Like a naturalist studying an organism in its habitat, we need to develop an intuitive understanding of our mind. This only comes from direct observation and experience. For life to become a consciously created work of art and beauty, we must first realize our innate capacity to become a more fully conscious being. Then, through appropriately directed conscious activity, we can develop an intuitive understanding of the true nature of reality. It's only through this kind of insight that you can accomplish the highest purpose of meditative practice, awakening. This should be the goal of your practice. When life is lived in a fully conscious way, with wisdom, we can eventually overcome all harmful emotions and behavior. We won't experience greed, even in the face of lack, nor will we have ill will even when confronted by aggression and hostility. When our speech and action come from a place of wisdom and compassion, they will always produce better results than when driven by greed and anger. All this is possible because true happiness comes from within, which means we can always find joy in both good times and bad. Although pain and pleasure are an inevitable part of human life, suffering and happiness are entirely optional. The choice is ours. A fully awake, fully conscious human being has the love, compassion, and energy to make change for the better whenever it's possible, the equanimity to accept what can't be changed, and the wisdom to know the difference. Therefore, make the aim of your meditation the cultivation of a mind capable of this type of awakening. This is the perspective from which this book is written. I sincerely hope it will be your perspective as well. There's so much myth and mystery surrounding awakening that many people tend to dismiss it. Rest assured it's a goal within everyone's reach. The Buddha said that, with proper training, it should take no longer than seven years, and can happen even more quickly. Here you will learn all you need to know about what must be done, how to do it, and why. Think of this book as a traveler's guide, providing you with maps of the territory and detailed directions for getting where you want to go.
A Modern Roadmap for Meditation This book is the result of discovering how few long-time practitioners have ever experienced any of the more exalted states of meditation, much less the profound realizations that it offers. What I learned is that even after many years of trying, people weren't making the kind of progress they should have. The sincerity of their aspirations and the amount of time they spent practicing were definitely not the problem. What they lacked was a clear understanding of exactly which skills they needed to cultivate, in what order, and how to go about doing it. Put another way, what they needed but didn't have was a clear map of the process. It isn't that these kinds of roadmaps don't exist, because they certainly do, but they are largely inaccessible to most meditators. Some 2,500 years ago, the Buddha presented meditation training as a sequence of developmental stages in a series of verses known as the Anapanasati Sutta. Each verse describes one step in a progressive method for training the mind. Yet these verses are short on practical details, and so cryptic as to be incomprehensible to any but the most experienced meditators. Perhaps there wasn't any need for the Buddha to go into specifics, because at the time there were many others who could interpret his words and provide clear instructions. Around 800 years later, the Indian monk Asanga identified nine distinct stages in the process of developing concentration. Four centuries after Asanga, another Indian monk named Kamala Shila, who later taught in Tibet, elaborated on these stages of training in his three-part Stages of Meditation, Bhavana Krama. Another invaluable source of information is the Path of Purification, Visuddhi Magga, compiled in the fifth century by the great Theravada commentator Buddha Gosha. As all these masters realized, Teaching meditation by stages is an easy and effective way to help someone achieve the highest goals of the practice. Unfortunately, these and many other excellent maps of meditation lie buried in the commentarial literatures of different Buddhist traditions. Considering the volume and diversity of these commentaries, and that many of them have yet to be translated into European languages, it's no wonder the average Western meditator remains unaware of them. There is also the issue of interpretation. A few people, other than serious scholars, are able to cope with the obscure terminology and complex language of dense texts from a very different time and culture. However, traditional meditation teachings can't be properly understood without some experience of the kinds of mental states being described. Unless these scholars are also serious meditators, which is often not the case, their attempts at interpretation will always fall short. The modern roadmap offered in this book combines experience, tradition, and science. It's a synthesis based on first-hand experience and expanded on through the shared experiences of many other dedicated practitioners. To make sense of my own meditations and find guidance about where my practice should go next, I turned to my teachers, the Pali Suttas, and the commentaries of several different Buddhist traditions. Over and over, these traditional sources gave me the information I needed and provided an appropriate context to fit the pieces together. By integrating this information and my own experiences with the insights of psychology and cognitive neuroscience, I've reverse-engineered traditional meditation instructions to create a contemporary map of meditation. It's divided into ten progressive stages to be used in charting your progress. While the structure of this presentation comes directly from traditional teachings, a sangha in particular, the meditation instructions that flesh it out do not. Also, this book is a fusion of teachings from different Buddhist traditions. While it is entirely consistent with all of them, it does not reflect any one tradition in particular. I believe this is one of its great advantages. It brings together the Indo-Tibetan Mahayana and traditional Theravada meditation teachings and shows how each fills in the gaps of the other. The techniques presented here apply to every kind of meditation practice. Keep in mind that all these source teachings 
were intended for monastics living in supportive communities of meditators. There wasn't much need to provide basic instructions and practical details, or to give examples. This isn't the case for modern lay practitioners. Most are practicing with little guidance, and often on their own. Therefore, while closely following these original teachings, I provide much more detail and give examples. I have also added an extra stage, establishing a practice to Asanga's nine stages to help people with jobs, families, and other responsibilities navigate the challenge of finding the time for meditation in their busy lives. These and other differences in this book reflect the differences between practicing as a householder and as a monastic. To help you progress as a householder, I offer you a clear map of the process that describes the whole journey, step by step, what needs to be accomplished at each stage and how to do it, what things are better left until a later stage, and what pitfalls should be avoided. Otherwise, the contemplative path can seem like traveling from New York to L.A. with directions like turn right and turn left, but without a road map or a description of the terrain. Some people might make it eventually, but the majority would get lost. However, an accurate map will let you know where you're at and where you need to head next. It will also make the whole journey much quicker, easier, and more enjoyable. A book like this inevitably requires its own technical vocabulary. Some of these terms are influenced by Western psychology and cognitive sciences, and a few come from the ancient languages of India, Pali and Sanskrit. Many others are familiar words you're quite used to hearing, such as attention and awareness, but I will use them in a very specific way. Taking a little extra time to learn the meaning of these terms will be immensely helpful. It gives us a precise language to describe the practice and understand subtle experiences and states of mind. I define these key terms as simply and clearly as possible, emphasizing them each time they appear in a new context. Putting this practice into context The meditation landscape in the West is a vibrant but confusing place. Tibetan practices emphasize elaborate visualizations or sophisticated analytical meditations, whereas Zen strips meditation down to the bare bones, giving you minimal instructions like, just sit. Some Theravada teachers emphasize rigorously cultivating mindfulness to the exclusion of stable, focused attention, while others insist that intense concentration leading to deep meditative absorption is best. Rather than argue for any specific technique, this book will help you make sense of all these different approaches without having to reject any of them. But to do this, I first need to clarify an important set of terms commonly found in meditation literature, showing how they relate to each other and the goal of awakening. These terms are shamatha, tranquility or calm abiding, vipassana, insight, samadhi, concentration or stable attention, and sati, mindfulness. Awakening from our habitual way of perceiving things requires a profound shift in our intuitive understanding of the nature of reality. Awakening is a cognitive event, the culminating insight in a series of very special insights called vipassana. This climax of the progress of insight only occurs when the mind is in a unique mental state called shamatha. Shamatha and vipassana are both generated using stable attention, samadhi, and mindfulness, sati. Although it's possible to cultivate either shamatha or vipassana independently of one another, both are necessary for awakening. Shamatha has five characteristics, effortlessly stable attention, samadhi, powerful mindfulness, sati, joy, tranquility, and equanimity. The complete state of shamatha results from working with stable attention and mindfulness until joy emerges. Joy then gradually matures into tranquility, and equanimity arises out of that tranquility. 
A mind in shamatha is the ideal instrument for achieving insight. Vipassana refers specifically to insight into the true nature of reality that radically transforms our understanding of ourselves and our relationship to the world. However, meditation also produces many other very useful, mundane insights, such as a better understanding of our own personality, social interactions, human behavior in general, and how the everyday world works. It can give us flashes of creative brilliance or intellectual epiphanies that solve problems or help us make new discoveries. These useful insights are not vipassana, however, because they neither transform us personally nor our understanding of reality in any profound way. The insights called vipassana are not intellectual. Rather, they are experientially based, deeply intuitive realizations that transcend and ultimately shatter our commonly held beliefs and understandings. The five most important of these are insights into impermanence, emptiness, the nature of suffering, the causal interdependence of all phenomena, and the illusion of the separate self, that is, no self. You can experience the first four of these insights using stable attention, samadhi, and mindfulness, sati, to investigate phenomena, dhamma vichya, with persistence and energy, virya. The fifth insight into no-self is the culminating insight that actually produces awakening, because only by overcoming our false, self-centered worldview can we realize our true nature. But this crucial insight requires, in addition to the first four insights, that the mind also be in a state of shamatha, filled with deep tranquility and equanimity. For both shamatha and vipassana, you need stable attention, samadhi, and mindfulness, sati. Unfortunately, many meditation traditions split samadhi and sati, linking concentration practice exclusively to shamatha and mindfulness practice exclusively to vipassana. This creates all sorts of problems and misunderstandings, such as emphasizing mindfulness at the expense of stable attention, or vice versa. Stable, hyper-focused attention without mindfulness leads only to a state of blissful dullness, a complete dead end. But just as stable attention without mindfulness is a dead end, the opposite is also true. You simply cannot develop mindfulness without stable attention. Until you have at least a moderate degree of stability, mindfulness practice will consist mostly of mind-wandering, physical discomfort, drowsiness, and frustration. Like two wings of a bird, both stable attention and mindfulness are needed, and when they are cultivated together, the destination of this flight is shamatha and vipassana. Also, brief episodes of shamatha can occur long before you become an adept practitioner. Insight can happen at any time as well. This means a temporary convergence of shamatha and vipassana is possible and can lead to awakening at any stage. In this sense, awakening is somewhat unpredictable, almost like an accident. Although the possibility of awakening exists at any time, the probability increases steadily as you progress through the stages. Therefore, awakening is an accident, but continued practice will make you accident-prone. You're training your mind throughout the ten stages, cultivating all the qualities of shamatha. As you progress, the mind inevitably becomes more and more fertile for the seeds of insight to ripen and blossom into awakening. The ten stages provide a systematic process for developing stable attention and mindfulness together, in balance, with shamatha and vipassana as outcomes. The most accurate and useful description of this method is shamatha-vipassana meditation, or the practice of tranquility and insight. Again, the practice offered in this book doesn't have to be a replacement for other techniques— but instead can complement any other type of meditation you already do. 
you can use the Ten Stages approach in combination with or as a precursor to any of the many Mahayana or Theravada practices. How to use this book Here's a brief summary of the book's structure, so you have an idea where you're headed. It begins with an overview of all ten stages and the four milestone achievements that mark your progress through the stages. Detailed chapters on each stage follow, with a series of interludes that come between the stages. The first interlude lays the groundwork for the practice. You'll be introduced to the model of conscious experience and learn about working with attention and peripheral awareness. The second interlude introduces you to the major hindrances and problems you will face in your practice. The third interlude builds on ideas you've learned so far to explain how mindfulness works. The fourth and fifth interludes introduce new, more in-depth models of mind, the moments of consciousness model and the mind system model. The sixth interlude lays the foundations for stages seven through ten. The seventh interlude provides further refinements to the models of mind you've learned so far to help you fully understand subtle and profound meditative states. This book can be used in several ways. You can listen to the whole thing, or you can use it more as a reference guide, picking which chapters to hear based on the current state of your practice. Many will find the interludes of great help, but those less technically inclined may prefer to no more than lightly listen to the later interludes, just to give their practice some context. If you ever find yourself feeling adrift, uncertain about where the path is headed, the chapter to listen to again is an overview of the ten stages. Together, the stages and interludes will lead you on a profound adventure of self-discovery and mental cultivation. If you take your time studying the ideas and putting them into practice, you'll overcome psychological challenges, experience extraordinary states, and learn to use your mind with amazing proficiency. You'll discover an unprecedented inner calm and gain a deep understanding, even a direct experience, of ultimate truth. An Overview of the Ten Stages the entire process of training the mind unfolds through ten stages. Each stage has its own distinct characteristics, challenges to overcome, and specific techniques for working through those challenges. The stages mark gradual improvements in your abilities. As you make progress, there will also be four milestone achievements that divide the ten stages into four distinct parts— these are especially significant transition points in your practice, where mastery of certain skills takes your meditation to a whole new level. The stages and milestones, considered together, form a broad map to help you figure out where you are and how best to continue. Yet because each person is unique, the route your spiritual journey takes will always be at least slightly different from that of somebody else. For this reason, we will also talk about how the process unfolds, how fast or slow you may experience progress, and what kind of attitude to have. The point isn't to force your experience to match something you have heard. Instead, use this book as a guide for working with and understanding your own experiences, no matter what forms they take. This chapter outlines the general arc of the practice, and the rest of the chapters provide the details. It will be helpful to revisit this chapter from time to time to keep the big picture fresh in your mind. The more clearly you understand the stages and why they happen in the order that they do, the quicker and more enjoyably you will walk the path toward happiness and freedom. How the Process Unfolds each of the ten stages on the path to becoming an adept meditator is defined in terms of certain skills that you have to master. Only when you have mastered the skills of a particular stage will you be able to master the next stage. This is because your abilities as a meditator gradually build on each other. Just as you have to learn to walk before you can run, you must move through the stages in order without skipping any of them. To make progress, you should correctly determine your current stage, 
work diligently with the techniques you are given, and move on only when you have achieved mastery. Mastery of one stage is a requirement for the mastery of the next, and none can be skipped. Taking shortcuts just creates problems and ultimately prolongs the process, so they're not really shortcuts. Diligence is all you need to make the fastest progress possible. However, even though the stages are presented as a linear path of progress, the practice doesn't actually unfold in such a straightforward manner. For example, a beginning meditator will be working on stages one and two at the same time. As your practice progresses, you will frequently find yourself navigating several stages at the same time, moving back and forth between them over weeks, days, or even during a single session. This is perfectly normal. You can also expect to have times when you seem to have jumped to a more advanced stage, as well as days when you seem to have gone backward. In every case, the important thing is to practice according to whatever is happening in your meditation in the present. Don't get ahead of what is actually happening. On the other hand, once you have overcome the obstacles for a given stage, even temporarily, then you can work with the obstacles for the next stage. You will also notice that many of the techniques are similar in several different stages. A meditator at stage 3, for instance, uses similar techniques as a meditator at stage 4. The same is true for stages 5 and 6. However, the goals for each stage are always different. The secret to progress is working with the specific obstacles and goals appropriate to your current skill level. It's like learning to skate. You have to learn the basics before you can start doing triple axles. The earlier stages take longer to master. However, because the stages build on one another, the methods overlap, and the skills you develop in one stage are used in the next, you start making faster and faster progress. Advancing from stage 3 to stage 4 might take a long time, but progressing from 4 to 5 usually happens more quickly, and so on. It's common to have occasional or even frequent meditation experiences that correspond to more advanced stages. Even a beginning meditator at stage two may have experiences that resemble those of advanced stages. When this happens, you might overestimate your abilities and try to replicate the experience instead of working to master the skills for your current stage. Such experiences have no real significance in terms of your progress, although they do show you what is possible. Use them as inspiration while continuing to work toward mastering your current stage. Isolated meditation experiences can happen at any time, but if they can't be repeated consistently and intentionally, they are of little value. Once your practice matures, you will have the knowledge and skills to consistently create these kinds of experiences. The Rate of Progress Through the Ten Stages Some books give the impression that it takes many, many years or even decades to become an adept meditator. This simply isn't true. For householders who practice properly, it's possible to master the ten stages within a few months or years. What you need is a regular daily sitting practice of one to two hours per day. Meditation retreats are quite helpful but one's lasting months or years are certainly not necessary. Diligent daily meditation, combined with occasional longer periods of practice, will be enough for success. That said, there are several factors that determine how fast we make progress. Some of them we can influence, others we can't. To start with, different people have different natural abilities for working with attention and awareness. Some lifestyles and career paths are more conducive to developing these skills. Also, some people are better able to discipline themselves to practice regularly and diligently. Regardless of your natural abilities, you absolutely must master Stage 1, establishing a practice to make progress. Life factors and stressful events can also affect the process. 
Losing your job, the death of a spouse, or a health problem can set even an advanced meditator back to the earliest stages. In fact, almost anything that happens outside of meditation can potentially have this effect. This just serves as another reminder that meditative accomplishments, like everything else, depend on certain conditions and can therefore be influenced by worldly events. Another factor that affects your progress is the problem of compartmentalization. We have a common tendency to separate meditation practice from the rest of our life. If the skills and insights we learn on the cushion don't infuse our daily life, progress will be quite slow. It's like filling a leaky bucket. This may be one reason why some people consider long retreats the only way to make real progress. Retreats are certainly wonderful and can help bring your practice to a whole new level. Yet we can only experience the full benefits if the wisdom we acquire permeates every facet of our life. And that takes work. Otherwise, long retreats are like filling an even bigger leaky bucket. The most important factor for improving quickly is a clear understanding of each stage. That means recognizing the mental faculties you need to cultivate, as well as the correct methods to overcome specific obstacles. It also means not getting ahead of yourself. Be systematic and practice at the appropriate level. Just as a scalpel is more effective for surgery than a large knife, skillful means and positive reinforcement are much better for pacifying the mind than blind, stubborn persistence. Finesse and patience pay off. The Ten Stages of Meditative Training Here I briefly describe each stage's distinct characteristics, goals, challenges, and the techniques for achieving those goals and working through those challenges. Four particularly significant achievements divide the ten stages into four distinct parts. One through three are the stages of a novice. Four through six are the stages of a skilled meditator. Seven is a transition stage. And eight through ten are the stages of an adept. It is helpful to think of each stage in terms of the milestone that lies ahead. You will also notice a number of key terms. Don't worry if you don't know what the terms mean or can't remember everything being presented here. All of it is explained in greater detail in later chapters. The Novice Stages 1 through 3 Stage 1 Establishing a Practice This stage is about developing a consistent and diligent meditation practice. Being consistent means setting a clear daily schedule for when you're going to meditate and sticking to it except when there are circumstances beyond your control. Diligence means engaging wholeheartedly in the practice rather than spending your time on the cushion planning or daydreaming. Goals. Develop a regular meditation practice. Obstacles. Resistance. Procrastination. Fatigue. Impatience. Boredom. Lack of motivation. Skills. Creating practice routines. Setting specific practice goals. Generating strong motivation. Cultivating discipline and diligence. Mastery. Never missing a daily practice session. Stage 2. Interrupted attention and overcoming mind wandering. Stage 2 involves the simple practice of keeping your attention on the breath. This is easier said than done. You will discover that attention is easily captured by a distraction, making you forget that you're supposed to be paying attention to the breath. Forgetting quickly leads to mind wandering, which can last a few seconds, several minutes, or the entire meditation session. This sequence is so important it's worth committing to memory. The untrained mind produces distractions that lead to forgetting, which results in mind wandering. In stage two, you only work with the last event, mind wandering. Goals. Shorten the periods of mind wandering and extend the periods of sustained attention to the meditation object. Obstacles, mind wandering, monkey mind, and impatience. Skills. 
reinforcing spontaneous introspective awareness and learning to sustain attention on the meditation object. Spontaneous introspective awareness is the aha moment when you suddenly realize there's a disconnect between what you wanted to do, watch the breath, and what you're actually doing, thinking about something else. Appreciating this moment causes it to happen faster and faster, so the periods of mind-wandering get shorter and shorter. Mastery You can sustain attention on the meditation object for minutes, while most periods of mind-wandering last only a few seconds. Stage 3 Extended Attention and Overcoming Forgetting Stages 2 and 3 are similar but mind-wandering gets shorter and shorter until it stops altogether. The biggest challenge during this stage is forgetting, but sleepiness often becomes a problem as well. Goals. Overcome forgetting and falling asleep. Obstacles. Distractions. Forgetting. Mind-wandering and sleepiness. Skills. Use the techniques of following the breath, and connecting to extend the periods of uninterrupted attention and become familiar with how forgetting happens. Cultivate introspective awareness through the practices of labeling and checking in. These techniques allow you to catch distractions before they lead to forgetting. Mastery. Rarely forgetting the breath or falling asleep. Milestone 1. Continuous Attention to the Meditation Object The first milestone is continuous attention to the meditation object, which you achieve at the end of Stage 3. Before this, you're a beginner, a person who meditates rather than a skilled meditator. When you reach this milestone, you're no longer a novice, prone to forgetting, mind-wandering, or dozing off. By mastering stages one through three, you have acquired the basic first-level skills on the way to stable attention. You can now do something that no ordinary, untrained person can. You will build on this initial skill set over the course of the next three stages to become a truly skilled meditator. The Skilled Meditator, Stages 4 through 6 Stage 4 Continuous Attention and Overcoming Gross Distraction and Strong Dullness You can stay focused on the breath more or less continuously, but attention still shifts rapidly back and forth between the breath and various distractions. Whenever a distraction becomes the primary focus of your attention, it pushes the meditation object into the background. This is called gross distraction. But when the mind grows calm there tends to be another problem, strong dullness. To deal with both of these challenges, you develop continuous introspective awareness to alert you to their presence. Goal. Overcome gross distraction and strong dullness. Obstacles. Distractions. Pain and discomfort. Intellectual insights. Emotionally charged visions and memories. Skills. Developing continuous introspective awareness allows you to make corrections before subtle distractions become gross distractions and before subtle dullness becomes strong dullness. Learning to work with pain. Purifying the mind of past trauma and unwholesome conditioning. Mastery. Gross distractions no longer push the breath into the background and breath sensations don't fade or become distorted due to strong dullness. Stage 5. Overcoming Subtle Dullness and Increasing Mindfulness You have overcome gross distractions and strong dullness, but there is a tendency to slip into stable, subtle dullness. This makes the breath sensations less vivid and causes peripheral awareness to fade. Unrecognized subtle dullness can lead you to overestimate your abilities and move on to the next stage prematurely, which leads to concentration with dullness. You will experience only a shallow facsimile of the later stages, and your practice will come to a dead end. To overcome subtle dullness, you must sharpen your faculties of attention and awareness. Goal. To overcome subtle dullness and increase the power of mindfulness.
obstacles. Subtle dullness is difficult to recognize, creates an illusion of stable attention, and is seductively pleasant. Skills. Cultivating even stronger and more continuous introspective awareness to detect and correct for subtle dullness. Learning a new body scanning technique to help you increase the power of your mindfulness. Mastery. You can sustain or even increase the power of your mindfulness during each meditation session. Stage 6. Subduing Subtle Distraction Attention is fairly stable, but still alternates between the meditation object and subtle distractions in the background. You are now ready to bring your faculty of attention to a whole new level where subtle distractions fall away completely. You will achieve exclusive attention to the meditation object, also called single-pointed attention. Goal. To subdue subtle distractions and develop metacognitive introspective awareness. Obstacles. The tendency for attention to alternate to the continuous stream of distracting thoughts and other mental objects in peripheral awareness. Skills. Defining your scope of attention more precisely than before and ignoring everything outside that scope until subtle distractions fade away. Developing a much more refined and selective awareness of the mind itself, called metacognitive introspective awareness. You will also use a method called experiencing the whole body with the breath to further subdue potential distractions. Mastery. Subtle distractions have almost entirely disappeared, and you have unwavering exclusive attention together with vivid mindfulness. Milestone 2. Sustained Exclusive Focus of Attention With mastery of stages four through six, your attention no longer alternates back and forth from the breath to distractions in the background. You can focus on the meditation object to the exclusion of everything else, and your scope of attention is also stable. Dullness has completely disappeared, and mindfulness takes the form of a powerful metacognitive introspective awareness. That is, you are now aware of your state of mind in every moment, even as you focus on the breath. You have accomplished the two major objectives of meditative training, stable attention and powerful mindfulness. With these abilities, you are now a skilled meditator and have achieved the second milestone. The Transition Stage 7 Stage 7 Exclusive attention and unifying the mind. You can now investigate any object with however broad or narrow a focus you choose, but you have to stay vigilant and make a continuous effort to keep subtle distractions and subtle dullness at bay. Goal. Effortlessly sustained exclusive attention and powerful mindfulness. Obstacles. Distractions and dullness will return if you stop exerting effort. You must keep sustaining effort until exclusive attention and mindfulness become automatic. Then effort will no longer be necessary. Boredom, restlessness, and doubt tend to arise during this time. Also, bizarre sensations and involuntary body movements can distract you from your practice. Knowing when to drop all effort is the next obstacle. But making effort has become a habit, so it's hard to stop. Methods. Practicing patiently and diligently will bring you to the threshold of effortlessness. It will get you past all the boredom and doubt, as well as the bizarre sensations and movements. Purposely relaxing your effort from time to time will let you know when effort and vigilance are no longer necessary. Then you can work on letting go of the need to be in control. Various insight and jhana practices add variety at this stage. Mastery. You can drop all effort, and the mind still maintains an unprecedented degree of stability and clarity. Milestone 3. Effortless Stability of Attention The third milestone is marked by effortlessly sustained exclusive attention, together with powerful mindfulness. This state is called mental pliancy and occurs because of the complete pacification of the discriminating mind, meaning mental chatter and discursive analysis have stopped. 
Different parts of the mind are no longer so resistant or preoccupied with other things, and diverse mental processes begin to coalesce around a single purpose. This unification of mind means that, rather than struggling against itself, the mind functions more as a coherent, harmonious whole. You have completed the transition from being a skilled meditator to an adept meditator. The Adept Meditator Stages 8 through 10 Stage 8 Mental Pliancy and Pacifying the Senses With mental pliancy, you can effortlessly sustain exclusive attention and mindfulness, but physical pain and discomfort still limit how long you can sit. The bizarre sensations and involuntary movements that began in Stage 7 not only continue, but may intensify. With continuing unification of mind and complete pacification of the senses, physical pliancy arises, and these problems disappear. Pacifying the senses doesn't imply going into some trance. It just means that the five physical senses, as well as the mind sense, temporarily grow quiet while you meditate. Goal. Complete pacification of the senses and the full arising of meditative joy. Obstacles. The primary challenge is not to be distracted or distressed by the variety of extraordinary experiences during this stage. Unusual and often unpleasant sensations, involuntary movements, feelings of strong energy currents in the body, and intense joy. Simply let them be. Method. Practicing effortless attention and introspective awareness will naturally lead to continued unification, pacification of the senses, and the arising of meditative joy. Jhana and other insight practices are very productive as part of this process. Mastery When the eyes perceive only an inner light, the ears perceive only an inner sound, the body is suffused with a sense of pleasure and comfort, and your mental state is one of intense joy. With this mental and physical pliancy, you can sit for hours without dullness, distraction, or physical discomfort. Stage 9. Mental and physical pliancy and calming the intensity of meditative joy. With mental and physical pliancy comes meditative joy, a unique state of mind that brings great happiness and physical pleasure. Goal. The maturation of meditative joy, producing tranquility and equanimity. Obstacles. The intensity of meditative joy can perturb the mind, becoming a distraction and disrupting your practice. Method. Becoming familiar with meditative joy through continued practice until the excitement fades, replaced by tranquility and equanimity. Mastery. Consistently evoking mental and physical pliancy accompanied by profound tranquility and equanimity. Stage 10. Tranquility and Equanimity You enter Stage 10 with all the qualities of shamatha, effortlessly stable attention, mindfulness, joy, tranquility, and equanimity. At first, these qualities immediately fade after the meditation is ended. But as you continue to practice, they persist longer and longer between meditation sessions. Eventually, they become the normal condition of the mind. Because the characteristics of shamatha never disappear entirely, whenever you sit on the cushion, you quickly regain a fully developed meditative state. You have mastered stage 10 when the qualities of shamatha persist for many hours after you rise from the cushion. Once stage 10 is mastered... The mind is described as unsurpassable. Milestone 4. Persistence of the mental qualities of an adept. When you have mastered stage 10, the many positive mental qualities you experience during meditation are strongly present, even between meditation sessions, so your daily life is imbued with effortlessly stable attention, mindfulness, joy, tranquility, and equanimity. This is the fourth and final milestone and marks the culmination of an adept meditator's training. Cultivating the right attitude and setting clear intentions We naturally tend to think of ourselves as the agent responsible for producing results through will and effort. 
Certain words we can't avoid using when we talk about meditation, such as achieve and master, only reinforce this idea. We often believe we should be in control, the masters of our own minds. But that belief only creates problems for your practice. It will lead you to try to willfully force the mind into submission. When that inevitably fails, you will tend to get discouraged and blame yourself. This can turn into a habit unless you realize there is no self in charge of the mind, and therefore nobody to blame. As you continue to meditate, this fact of no self becomes increasingly clear, but you can't afford to wait for that insight. For the sake of making progress, it's best to drop this notion, at least at an intellectual level, as soon as possible. In reality, all we're doing in meditation is forming and holding specific conscious intention, nothing more. In fact, while it may not be obvious, all our achievements originate from intentions. Consider learning to play catch. As a child, you may have wanted to play catch, but at first your arm and hand just didn't move in quite the right way. However, by sustaining the intention to catch the ball, after much practice, your arm and hand eventually performed the task whenever you wanted. You don't play catch. Instead, you just intend to catch the ball, and the rest follows. You intend, and the body acts. In exactly the same way, we can use intention to profoundly transform how the mind behaves. Intention provided it is correctly formulated and sustained, is what creates the causes and conditions for stable attention and mindfulness. Intentions repeatedly sustained over the course of many meditation sessions give rise to frequently repeated mental acts, which eventually become habits of the mind. At every stage, all you really do is patiently and persistently hold your intentions to respond in specific ways to whatever happens during your meditation. Setting and holding the right intentions is what's essential. If your intention is strong, the appropriate responses will occur and the practice will unfold in a very natural and predictable way. Once again, repeatedly sustained intentions lead to repeated mental actions, which become mental habits the habits of mind that lead to joy, equanimity, and insight. The exquisite simplicity of this process isn't so obvious in the early stages. However, by the time you reach stage eight and your meditations become completely effortless, it will be clear. While useful, the lists of goals, obstacles, skills, and mastery provided in this discussion so far can obscure just how simple the underlying process really is. Intentions lead to mental actions, and repeated mental actions become mental habits. This simple formula is at the heart of every stage. Therefore, here's a brief recap of the ten stages, presented in a completely different way that puts the emphasis entirely on how intention works in each stage. Refer to the earlier outline when you need to orient yourself within the context of the stages as a whole. But look at the outline that follows whenever working through the individual stages begins to feel like a struggle. Stage 1. Put all your effort into forming and holding a conscious intention to sit down and meditate for a set period every day and to practice diligently for the duration of the sit. When your intentions are clear and strong, the appropriate actions naturally follow, and you'll find yourself regularly sitting down to meditate. If this doesn't happen, instead of chastising yourself and trying to force yourself to practice, work on strengthening your motivation and intentions. Stage 2 Willpower can't prevent the mind from forgetting the breath, nor can you force yourself to become aware that the mind is wandering. Instead, just hold the intention to appreciate the aha moment that recognizes mind wandering, while gently but firmly redirecting attention back to the breath. Then, intend to engage with the breath as fully as possible without losing peripheral awareness. In time, the simple actions flowing from these three intentions will become mental habits. Periods of mind wandering will become shorter. 
periods of attention to the breath will grow longer, and you'll have achieved your goal. Stage 3. Set your intention to invoke introspective attention frequently, before you've forgotten the breath or fallen asleep, and make corrections as soon as you notice distractions or dullness. Also, intend to sustain peripheral awareness while engaging with the breath as fully as possible. These three intentions and the actions they produce are simply elaborations of those from stage two. Once they become habits, you'll rarely forget the breath. Stages four through six. Set and hold the intention to be vigilant so that introspective awareness becomes continuous, and notice and immediately correct for dullness and distraction. These intentions will mature into the highly developed skills of stable attention and mindfulness. You overcome every type of dullness and distraction, achieving both exclusive, single-pointed attention and metacognitive introspective awareness. Stage 7. Everything becomes even simpler. With the conscious intention to continuously guard against dullness and distraction, the mind becomes completely accustomed to effortlessly sustaining attention and mindfulness. Stages 8 through 10 Your intention is simply to keep practicing, using skills that are now completely effortless. In stage 8, effortlessly sustained exclusive attention produces mental and physical pliancy, pleasure, and joy. In stage 9, simply abiding in the state of meditative joy causes profound tranquility and equanimity to arise. In stage 10, just by continuing to practice regularly, the profound joy and happiness, tranquility and equanimity you experience in meditation persists between meditation sessions, infusing your daily life as well. As with planting seeds, at each stage you sow the appropriate intentions in the soil of the mind. Water these intentions with the diligence of regular practice and protect them from the destructive pests of procrastination, doubt, desire, aversion, and agitation. These intentions will naturally flower into a specific series of mental events that mature to produce the fruits of your practice— Will a seed sprout more quickly if you keep digging it up and replanting it? No. Therefore, don't let impatience or frustration stop you from practicing or convince you that you need to seek out a better or easier practice. Getting annoyed with every instance of mind-wandering or sleepiness is like tearing up the garden to get rid of the weeds. Attempting to force attention to remain stable is like trying to make a sapling grow taller by stretching it. Chasing after physical pliancy and meditative joy is like prying open a bud so it will blossom more quickly. Impatience and striving won't make anything grow faster. Be patient and trust in the process. Care for the mind like a skilled gardener, and everything will flower and fruit in due time. First Interlude Conscious Experience and the Objectives of Meditation In this chapter, I introduce a basic conceptual model of conscious experience. You can consider this a map of the topography, the landscape of the mind, so to speak. The meditation instructions are like the roads allowing you to explore this landscape comfortably. However, remember that a map is only a representation not the thing itself. When circumstances change, as your practice improves, you'll find yourself wanting a new map. This is why, in later chapters, I provide two additional, much more in-depth models of the mind for you to work from. Each map builds on the previous ones, and together they lead you toward the two major objectives of meditation practice, stable attention and mindfulness, both of which we will look at more closely in this interlude. A Model of Conscious Experience Consciousness consists of whatever we're experiencing in the moment. It's a lot like vision. Just as the objects in our field of vision change from one moment to the next, objects in our field of conscious awareness, like sights, sounds, smells, and other external phenomena, also arise and pass away. Of course, this field isn't just limited to what we perceive with our outer senses. 
It also includes internal mental objects, which come in the form of transitory thoughts, feelings, and memories. Attention and Peripheral Awareness Conscious experience takes two different forms, attention and peripheral awareness. Whenever we focus our attention on something, it dominates our conscious experience. At the same time, however, we can be more generally aware of things in the background. For example, right now your attention is focused on what you're hearing. At the same time, you're also aware of other sights, sounds, smells, and sensations in the periphery. The way attention and peripheral awareness work together is a lot like the relationship between visual focus and peripheral vision. Try fixing your eyes on an external object. You will notice that as you focus on the object, your peripheral vision takes in other information elsewhere in your field of vision. You can compare that with your experience of attention and peripheral awareness in daily life, where you pay attention to some things while remaining peripherally aware of others. For instance, you may be listening intently to what a person is saying. At the same time, you're peripherally aware of the flavor of the tea you're drinking, traffic noises in the background, and the pleasant feelings of sitting in a cozy chair. Just as with vision, we're more fully conscious of the object in the focus of our attention, but we remain conscious of the many objects in peripheral awareness as well. When we shift our focus, what had been at the center of attention moves to the periphery. As attention moves from one object to another, from the conversation to the mug of tea, we become more fully conscious of each object in turn, while remaining peripherally aware of the others. It's important to realize attention and peripheral awareness are two different ways of knowing the world. Each has its virtues, as well as its shortcomings. Attention singles out some small part of the content of the field of conscious awareness from the rest in order to analyze and interpret it. On the other hand, peripheral awareness is more holistic, open, and inclusive, and provides the overall context for conscious experience. It has more to do with the relationships of objects to one another and to the whole. In this book, Whenever the term awareness is used, it refers to peripheral awareness. It never means attention. The distinction between the two is key. The failure to recognize this distinction creates considerable confusion. In meditation, we work with both attention and peripheral awareness to cultivate stable attention and mindfulness, the two main practice objectives of meditation. Jump-starting your practice Although a full understanding of attention and awareness is essential, some of you might want to get right into the practice. So here is a quick and basic version of the meditation instructions. 1. Posture A. When you sit in a chair or on a cushion on the floor, make yourself as comfortable as possible with your back straight. B. Get your back, neck, and head in alignment, front to back and side to side. C. I recommend closed eyes to start with, but you can keep them open if you prefer. 2. Relax. A. While maintaining a straight back, release any tension in the body. B. Relax your mind. Take some moments to appreciate the fact that you're gifting yourself with time away from all the usual tasks and worries of your life. 3. Intention and Breath. A. Resolve to practice diligently for the entire meditation session, no matter how it goes. B. Breathe through your nose as naturally as possible, without trying to control your breath. C. Bring your attention to the sensations associated with the breath in and around your nostrils or upper lip. Another option is to center your attention on the sensations associated with breathing in the abdomen. See which of these is the easiest for you to focus on, and then stick with that one, at least for the sit at hand. This is your meditation object. D. Allow your attention to stay centered on your meditation object while your peripheral awareness remains relaxed and open to anything that arises. For example, sounds in the environment, physical sensations in the body, thoughts in the background. E. 
try to keep your attention centered on the meditation object. Inevitably, your mind will get distracted and drift away. As soon as you recognize this has happened, take a moment to appreciate the fact that you have remembered your intention to meditate and give your mind an imaginary pat on the back. The tendency is to judge yourself and feel disappointed for having lost your focus. But doing so is counterproductive. Mind-wandering is natural, so it's not important that you lost your focus. Remembering and returning your focus to the meditation object is what's important. Therefore, positively reinforce such behavior by doing your best to reward the mind for remembering. F. Now, gently recenter your attention on the meditation object. G. Repeat step three until the meditation session is over. And remember, the only bad meditation session is the one you didn't do. The first objective of meditation. Stable attention. Concentration, as a concept, is rather vague and in danger of being misinterpreted or of having meditation students bring their own preconceived ideas to it. I prefer to use the more accurate and useful term, stable attention. It's more descriptive of what we're actually trying to do in meditation. Stable attention is the ability to intentionally direct and sustain the focus of attention, as well as to control the scope of attention. Intentionally directing and sustaining attention simply means that we learn to choose which object we are going to attend to and keep our attention continuously fixed on it. Controlling the scope of attention means training the mind to adjust how wide or narrow our focus is and being more selective and intentional about what is included and excluded. Again, as an analogy, consider how vision works. To see something in all its detail, we must hold our gaze steady for as long as necessary, while focusing neither too narrowly nor too broadly. For many, everyday life is a combination of distraction and hectic multitasking. Having focused, sustained, and selective attention is a much more peaceful and engaging way of experiencing the world. It's also the most valuable tool we have for investigating our minds and coming to understand ourselves. Let's consider in more detail how stable attention is cultivated. Spontaneous Movements of Attention To develop intentionally directed, stable attention, you must first have a clear understanding of its opposite, spontaneous movements of attention. Attention moves spontaneously in three different ways. Scanning, getting captured, and alternating. Scanning is when our focus moves from object to object, searching the outer world or the contents of our mind for something of interest. Getting captured happens when an object, like a thought, bodily sensation, or some external stimulus, suddenly captures our attention. An ambulance siren can take our attention away from the book we're reading, or the pain of a stubbed toe can take our attention away from pleasant thoughts while we're out for a walk. You're probably familiar with this sort of spontaneous movement of attention as it happens all the time. The third type of spontaneous movement, alternating attention, is a subtler kind of scattered attention only apparent to an experienced meditator. To be clear, everyone's attention alternates, whether they meditate or not. The difference is that the non-meditator doesn't experience his or her attention as alternating. Instead, there is the illusion of paying attention to two or more things simultaneously. What's actually happening is that the focus of attention is moving very quickly among several different objects, but staying with each one for about the same amount of time overall. It's the kind of attention we have when multitasking. If you're doodling in class while listening to a professor, your focus is moving so swiftly that there doesn't seem to be a break in your attention to each object. Attention to both seems simultaneous. Another way we might experience alternating attention is when our attention seems to stay focused on one object while certain things stand out from peripheral awareness. For instance, you might be answering an email, but you also hear the cat meowing to be fed and feel pressure in your bladder. Attention is still shifting rapidly among different objects, but it lingers longer on the main object, 
answering the email. Essentially, anything that stands out from the background of peripheral awareness does so because it is intermittently becoming an object of attention. In all these examples, we experience a continuity of attention, but attention is shifting rapidly among different objects. Unless you're purposely multitasking, alternating attention is a kind of spontaneous movement of attention. That means a certain amount of distraction is present. During meditation, intentional movements of attention will eventually replace all three types of spontaneous movements of attention. This process unfolds gradually and systematically through the stages. Let's look at what it means to intentionally direct and sustain attention and how to control the scope of attention. Intentionally Directing and Sustaining Attention Intentionally directed attention means just that. We make a conscious decision about what to pay attention to. When we're at work, we have to purposely shift our focus from one thing to the next to finish a job. Also, when we get distracted and lose our focus, we have to intentionally bring ourselves back to the job. Beginning in the very first stages, two and three, you exercise and strengthen your ability to intentionally direct attention. But that's only half the work. After directing your attention to the breath, you'll soon find that your mind has wandered off. For this reason, you also have to learn how to sustain attention. This means you want to stop all spontaneous movements of attention. Now, sustaining attention is trickier than directing attention. Why? It's possible to voluntarily direct attention. However, the part of the mind that sustains attention for more than a few moments works entirely unconsciously. We can't use our will to control how long we remain focused on one thing. Instead, an unconscious process weighs the importance of what we're focusing on against other possible objects of attention. If an object is important or interesting enough, attention remains stable. If something else is judged more important or interesting, then the balance tips and attention moves elsewhere. Even though this weighing process isn't under our conscious control, we can still influence it through consciously held intentions. Just by intending to observe an object and to come back whenever we get distracted, we're training that unconscious process to help us stay focused more continuously. It's a lot like learning to throw darts. The complex motor skills you need for dart throwing also involve training an unconscious process for using intention and repetition. By holding the intention to hit the target as you throw the darts, you train unconscious and involuntary hand-eye coordination until you can consistently hit the target. Any information held in consciousness is communicated to the unconscious. Formulating the conscious intention to focus on the meditation object provides a new piece of information for unconscious processes to take into account. Holding this intention, together with returning our attention to the breath over and over whenever we get distracted, informs the unconscious weighing process that keeping the focus on the breath is important. You start throwing mental darts at the target of sustained attention in Stage 2. By Stage 4, you have developed a consistent ability to keep your attention on the meditation object. Attention feels continuous and stable at Stage 4, but the focus of attention still alternates rapidly between the meditation object and distractions, which we experience as objects that stand out from peripheral awareness. In order to truly master directed and sustained attention, we have to overcome this tendency for attention to alternate. Exclusive attention to one object, also called single-pointedness, is very different from alternating attention. Exclusive attention doesn't move back and forth between distractions and our intended focus. In stages one through five, you greatly improve your overall stability of attention, but you only achieve exclusive attention in stage six. We've just described how conscious intention influences the unconscious mechanisms that sustain attention, but that's only the beginning. Throughout the stages, you use conscious intention to train the unconscious mind in a variety of ways. 
The correct use of intention can also transform bad habits, undo incorrect views, and cultivate healthier perspectives. In short, skillfully applying conscious intention can completely restructure the mind and transform who we are. This is the very essence of meditation. We reprogram unconscious mental processes by repeating basic tasks over and over with a clear intention. We'll talk more about how this simple activity changes unconscious processes when we introduce the mind system model in the fifth interlude. Scope of Attention Once you can direct and sustain your attention, you will then work on controlling the scope of attention how wide or narrow you want your focus to be. Many tasks in daily life require us to expand or contract our focus of attention. When threading a needle or straining to hear somebody talk in a noisy room, we really have to focus in and pay attention to detail. When watching football, our attention might start on the quarterback, but as soon as he gets the ball, the scope of our attention expands, taking in all the action on the field. Although we do have some control, without training, our scope tends to change automatically due to unconscious influences. An expanded scope is a lot like alternating attention, in that you can include more things in attention. It, too, can be a useful tool for multitasking. Yet when we're trying to have stable attention, a scope that keeps spontaneously expanding will let in all kinds of distractions. Attention won't really be stable until you can intentionally determine the scope of your focus and keep it steady. This is a skill you cultivate mainly in Stage 6, after your focus of attention has become more stable. You learn to control the scope through a series of exercises where you deliberately shift between a narrow and a broad focus. In both Stages 6 and 7, you give particular emphasis to exclusive focus on the meditation object. By stage eight, you have mastered control of your scope and can broaden your focus so it includes the entire field of conscious awareness in a single, open, and expansive, non-focus. Ordinarily, having so broad a focus would just mean being dimly aware of many things at once. Fortunately, we can also increase the power of consciousness meaning everything will still be quite clear. This brings us to the second objective of meditation, mindfulness. The second objective of meditation, mindfulness. When the mindfulness of a samurai warrior fails, he loses his life. When we lack mindfulness in daily life, something similar happens. We become so entangled in our own thoughts and emotions that we forget the bigger picture. Our perspective narrows and we lose our way. We do and say regretful things that cause needless suffering to ourselves and others. Mindfulness allows us to recognize our options, choose our responses wisely, and take control over the direction of our lives. It also gives us the power to change our past conditioning and become the person we want to be. Most importantly, mindfulness leads to insight, wisdom, and awakening. But what is mindfulness? Mindfulness is a somewhat unfortunate translation of the Pali word sati because it suggests being attentive or remembering to pay attention. This doesn't really capture the full meaning and importance of sati. Even without sati, we're always paying attention to something. But with sati, we pay attention to the right things and in a more skillful way. This is because having sati actually means that you're more fully conscious and alert than normal. As a result, our peripheral awareness is much stronger, and our attention is used with unprecedented precision and objectivity. A more accurate but clumsy-sounding phrase would be powerfully effective conscious awareness or fully conscious awareness. I use the word mindfulness because people are familiar with it. However, by mindfulness, I specifically mean the optimal interaction between attention and peripheral awareness, which requires increasing the overall conscious power of the mind. Let's unpack this definition. Normal functions of attention and peripheral awareness. 
To really grasp mindfulness, we first have to know what attention and peripheral awareness normally do. Each has a different function, and they provide two distinct kinds of information, but they also work together. And to respond intelligently to our environment, we need both. With this understanding, you will see how ordinary attention and awareness can become that optimal interaction we call mindfulness. Attention has a very specific job. It picks out one object from the general field of conscious awareness, then analyzes and interprets that object. It's the faculty of attention that helps us discern between conflicting pieces of information. For example, is that a snake in the road or just a piece of rope? Once an object of attention has been identified and analyzed, it can be further examined, reflected on, judged, and responded to. In order for this process to happen quickly and effectively, attention turns all of its objects into concepts or abstract ideas, unless, of course, the object is already a concept or idea. Generally, attention translates our raw experience of the world into terms we can more easily understand, which we then organize into a picture of reality. Peripheral awareness, on the other hand, works very differently. Instead of singling out one object for analysis, it involves a general awareness of everything our senses take in. Peripheral awareness is only minimally conceptual. It is open and inclusive, as well as holistic. That is, it's concerned with the relationships of objects to each other and to the whole. Peripheral awareness allows us to respond more effectively by giving us information about the background and context of our experience, where we are, what's happening around us, what we're doing, and why. For example, not mistaking the rope for a snake, since we're in Alaska, and it's winter. Attention analyzes our experience, and peripheral awareness provides the context. When one or the other doesn't do its job, or when there isn't enough interaction between the two, then we respond to situations less effectively. We may overreact, make poor decisions, or misinterpret what's going on. Any new sensation, thought, or feeling appears first in peripheral awareness. It is here that the mind decides whether or not something is important enough to become an object of attention. Peripheral awareness filters out unimportant information and captures the objects that deserve closer scrutiny by attention. This is why specific objects can seem to pop out of peripheral awareness to become the objects of attention. Attention will also browse the objects in peripheral awareness, searching for something relevant or important or just more entertaining, to examine. This is the scanning process we described earlier. But what we do with attention trains peripheral awareness to select certain things as well. If you're interested in birds, for example, peripheral awareness learns to keep watch for flying feathered objects. As attention hones in on something, peripheral awareness is alert and on the lookout for anything new or unusual. When awareness takes in something that might be of interest, it frees attention from its current object and redirects it toward the new object. Say you're engrossed in a conversation while walking, when out of the corner of your eye you notice a shape moving toward you. Peripheral awareness alerts attention, which quickly processes the information. We're in the bike lane, and a biker is heading straight for us. So you grab your friend and step out of the way. Peripheral awareness helps us stay alert to our surroundings and to use attention as effectively as possible. When peripheral awareness doesn't do its job, attention moves blindly, without guidance, and can be taken off guard. Fortunately, not every experience needs to be analyzed. Otherwise, attention would be quite overwhelmed. Peripheral awareness takes care of many things without invoking attention such as brushing a fly away from your face while you're eating lunch. Attention can certainly be involved with brushing the fly away, as well as with other small things, like choosing what to eat next on your plate. But there are simply too many basic tasks that don't require attention. Using it for all of them would be impossible. There are also situations that happen too fast for attention to deal with. For instance, attention can't provide the quick, 
reflexive response of a mother who stops her child from running into a busy street. Because peripheral awareness doesn't process information as thoroughly as attention, it responds much more quickly. If peripheral awareness doesn't do its job, attention is too easily overwhelmed and too slow to take over these functions. As a result, we don't react to these events at all, or we react to them in a completely unconscious and automatic way, blindly, mindlessly, and with none of the benefits of conscious processing. Another way attention and awareness work together is by helping us see things more objectively. On its own, attention usually involves a strong concern for self. This makes sense, considering that part of attention's job is to evaluate the importance of things in terms of our personal well-being. But it also means that objects of attention can be easily distorted by desire, fear, aversion, and other emotions. Attention not only interprets objects based on self-interest, it leads us to identify with external objects. This is my car, or mental states. I am angry, happy, etc. Peripheral awareness is less personal and takes things in more objectively, as they are. External objects, feeling states, and mental activities, rather than being identified with, appear in peripheral awareness as part of a bigger picture. We may be peripherally aware, for example, that some annoyance is arising. This is very different from having the thought, I am annoyed. Strong peripheral awareness helps tone down the self-centered tendencies of attention, making perception more objective. But when peripheral awareness fades, the way we perceive things becomes self-centered and distorted. Finally, attention and peripheral awareness can be either extrospective or introspective. Extrospective means that attention or awareness is directed toward objects that come from outside your mind, such as sights, smells, or bodily sensations. Introspective means the objects in consciousness are internal, thoughts, feelings, states, and activities of mind. Even though attention and awareness can be either extrospective or introspective, only peripheral awareness can observe the overall state of mind. For example, whether it is happy, peaceful, or agitated, as well as the activities of the mind, for example, whether attention is moving or not, and whether attention is occupied with thinking, remembering, or listening. The condition in which the mind stands back to observe its own state and activities is called metacognitive introspective awareness. Attention, on the other hand, can't observe activities of the mind because its movements and abstracting of information from awareness are activities of the mind. In other words, we can't attend to attention. When attention is focused on remembering, for example, you can't also use attention to know you're remembering, but you can be aware that you're remembering. Also, because attention works by isolating objects, it cannot observe overall states of the mind. If you do turn your attention introspectively, it takes a snapshot from peripheral awareness of your mental state right before you looked. Say someone asks, how do you feel? When you look inside, attention tries to transform awareness of your overall mental state into a specific conceptual thought, like, I am happy. Now that we've seen how different yet interdependent attention and peripheral awareness are, the importance of having both is obvious. We are responding to something in almost every waking moment, whether it comes from the environment or from within our own mind. Those responses include not just our words and actions, but the thoughts and emotions we experience as well. Although it may not seem like it, there is always more than one way we can respond, which means there's a continuous process of decision-making going on as well. The quality of these moment-to-moment -moment decisions depends on the quality of the information made available by both attention and awareness. Everything we think, feel, say, or do from one moment to the next, who we are and how we behave, all ultimately depends on the interactions between attention and awareness. Mindfulness is the optimum interaction between the two, so cultivating mindfulness can change everything we think 
feel, say, and do for the better. It can completely transform who we are. Comparison of Peripheral Awareness and Attention Peripheral Awareness Holistic, Relational, Contextual Attention Isolates and Analyzes Peripheral Awareness Filters all incoming information Attention Selects information from awareness Peripheral Awareness Acts as a watchful alert system Attention Hones in on objects Peripheral awareness. Less processing, quicker response. Attention. More processing, slower response. Peripheral awareness. Less personal and more objective. Attention. More self-centered. Peripheral awareness. Can be introspective and extrospective. Attention. Can be introspective or extrospective. Cultivating mindfulness. Why aren't we naturally more mindful? Why does mindfulness have to be cultivated? There are two main reasons. First, most of us have never really learned to use peripheral awareness effectively. Second, we don't have enough conscious power to sustain mindfulness, especially at the times when we need it most. The first of these two problems I describe as awareness deficit disorder. This means a chronic lack of awareness due to overusing attention. Most people overuse attention because it's under direct conscious control and peripheral awareness isn't. Awareness arises automatically in response to external or internal stimuli, so it's easy to neglect. Consistently neglecting peripheral awareness in favor of attention eventually stunts the faculty of awareness. In meditation, where other distractions are minimized, we can learn to use peripheral awareness effectively and become skilled at using attention and awareness together. However, skill at using attention and awareness is only one part of mindfulness training. Developing raw mental power is the other part that often gets overlooked. Without this increase in power... You won't get very far in cultivating mindfulness, and you will still find yourself losing mindfulness when you need it most, especially off the cushion. For example, if your partner had a bad day at work and complains about the food you made, it takes mindfulness to maintain an objective awareness that recognizes the real cause of the complaint. But when strong emotions take hold... All your energy pours into hyper-focused attention as you go into fight-or-flight mode. Your awareness fails, and attention hones in on the criticism as a personal attack. Sustained mindfulness requires a consciousness that's more powerful than normal. Think of consciousness as a limited power source. Both attention and awareness draw their energy from this shared source. With only a limited amount of energy available for both, there will always be a trade-off between the two. When attention focuses intensely on an object, the field of conscious awareness begins to contract, and peripheral awareness of the background fades. Intensify that focus enough, and the context and guidance provided by peripheral awareness disappears completely. In this state, awareness can no longer ensure that attention is directed to where it's most necessary and beneficial. This is like wearing blinders or having tunnel vision. We simply don't have enough conscious power to continue to be aware of our surroundings while focusing so intently on the object. This is always a problem in situations where attention drains our conscious capacity, such as during an argument, dealing with an urgent problem, or when falling in love. There are other ways we can lose mindfulness, but they all come down to not having enough conscious power to sustain an optimal interaction between attention and awareness. It takes considerable conscious power to attend to many different objects, so we lose awareness. Thus, we lose mindfulness whenever our attention shifts rapidly back and forth between different objects, such as when multitasking. Emotional stress causes the same thing to happen. We have so many worries and concerns competing for attention that we lose perspective. And, of course, dullness also robs us of the conscious power necessary for mindfulness. On the other hand, when we're in a relaxed state, 
awareness tends to open and the intensity of attention dissipates. Relax even more and attention increasingly fades. More often than not, dullness sets in. Because attention and awareness draw from the same limited capacity for consciousness, when one grows brighter, the other becomes dimmer, resulting in suboptimal performance and loss of mindfulness. Proper training in mindfulness changes this equation, providing more conscious power for optimal interaction and no more trade-offs. The goal, therefore, is to increase the total power of consciousness available for both attention and awareness. The result is peripheral awareness that is clearer, and attention that gets used more appropriately, purposefully, in the present moment, and without becoming bogged down in judgment and projection. Increasing the Power of Mindfulness Increasing the power of consciousness isn't a mysterious process. It's a lot like weight training. You simply do exercises where you practice sustaining close attention and strong peripheral awareness at the same time. This is the only way to make consciousness more powerful. The more vivid you can make your attention while sustaining awareness, the more power you will gain. You will learn a number of different exercises as you move through the stages. In the higher stages of meditation, attention and awareness actually merge together to become one fully integrated system. More about that in the chapter on Stage 8. Like strengthening a muscle, developing powerful mindfulness involves enhancing a natural capacity we all have. Just reflect for a moment on how your alertness and clarity of mind change throughout the day. Sometimes we feel quite sharp energetic and lucid. A life-threatening situation is an exceptional example of this. Time slows down. We become finely attuned to every little detail. Every color, shape, sound, and sensation is vivid. Sometimes we have the feeling of being an outside observer, just watching the events unfold. Athletes refer to this kind of hyper-conscious state as being in the zone. This is one extreme. On the other end of the spectrum, there are times during the day when we feel sluggish. A lack of mental energy leads to dullness and then to drowsiness. In these kinds of states, we miss much of what's happening around us and often misinterpret what we are able to perceive. Severe fatigue or alcohol can cause extreme dullness. Deep sleep is the ultimate state of dullness. These varying experiences show the range of the conscious capabilities of our mind. Compare your normal level of consciousness with that of an athlete in the zone or with a person in an emergency. You'll realize that daily life consists mostly of different degrees of dullness and mindlessness. As you progress through each stage in this practice, you move steadily away from dullness toward enhanced states of consciousness that support increased mindfulness. Having more conscious power means the quality of both attention and peripheral awareness improves. This transforms the interaction between them in a number of important ways. Peripheral awareness doesn't fade when attention is very focused. Peripheral awareness does a better job of providing context and makes you more sensitive to how objects relate to each other and to the whole. Peripheral awareness processes information more thoroughly, making it better at selecting appropriate objects for attention to focus on. Attention is always directed toward the most important objects. Attention becomes clearer, more intense, and can analyze things more effectively. Because peripheral awareness is more powerful, attention doesn't get stuck in subjectivity and projection. Perception is more objective and has more of the seeing things as they are quality of awareness. How Mindfulness Progresses Through the Ten Stages Throughout the stages of meditation, you systematically train your attention and peripheral awareness in order to develop mindfulness. This is a matter of both skill development and increasing the total power of consciousness. As you progress, I will introduce new techniques and guidance in each stage to help you more fully develop both skill in mindfulness and power of consciousness. This training starts in Stage 3. 
You practice focusing more and more closely on the meditation object while sustaining extrospective awareness. In stages four through six, as the clarity and stability of attention improve dramatically, the emphasis will be on developing strong introspective awareness. At stage five, you specifically aim to increase the power of consciousness by trying to detect very subtle sensations without losing awareness. In stage six, you further increase conscious power by dramatically expanding the scope of your intention to include the entire body while still trying to detect very subtle sensations. By the end of stage six, your attention is extremely stable and you have perfected metacognitive introspective awareness, the ability to continuously observe the state and activity of the mind. In stage seven, you practice narrowing the scope way down, honing in on the constantly changing details of sensations, bringing the power of consciousness to its fullest development by stage eight. The Benefits of Mindfulness When you have cultivated mindfulness, life becomes richer, more vivid, more satisfying, and you don't take everything that happens so personally. Attention plays a more appropriate role within the greater context of a broad and powerful awareness. You're fully present, happier, and at ease, because you're not so easily caught up in the stories and melodramas the mind likes to concoct. Your powers of attention are used more appropriately and effectively to examine the world. You become more objective and clear-headed and develop an enhanced awareness of the whole. When all these factors are ripe, you're ready for profound insight into the true nature of reality. These are the extraordinary benefits of mindfulness. Summary The two main objectives of meditation practice are developing stable attention, cultivating powerful mindfulness that optimizes the interaction between attention and awareness. A famous analogy in Zen compares the mind to a pool of water. This is a helpful way to think about the training and goals of meditation. If the water is agitated, churned up by wind and currents, it doesn't provide a clear reflection, nor can we see to the bottom. But as the water calms, the debris that made the pool muddy begins to settle, and the water itself becomes clear. A calm pool also reflects the sky and clouds perfectly. In the same way, if the mind is agitated, Disturbed by the concerns of daily life, it doesn't accurately reflect experience. Instead, we are caught up in projections and lack perspective. The inner workings of the mind remain murky as well, full of mental debris that clutter our thinking. Developing stable attention is the key to making the water calm, settled, and pure. Mindfulness is like the sunlight that illuminates the surface as well as the depths. Don't forget, however, that the path is as important as the goal. The stages outlined in this book may bring you to a state of peace and insight, but they are also an exciting journey of discovery into the nature of the mind. Relish in this beautiful and sometimes challenging journey. The goal isn't just getting to a calm, quiet pool, but learning about the makeup of the water itself as it goes from choppy to still from cloudy to crystal clear. Stage 1. Establishing a Practice 1. The goal for Stage 1 is to develop a regular meditation practice. Put all your effort into forming and holding a conscious intention to sit down and meditate for a set period every day and to practice diligently for the duration of the sit. When your intentions are clear and strong, the appropriate actions naturally follow, and you'll find yourself regularly sitting down to meditate. If this doesn't happen, rather than chastising yourself and trying to force yourself to practice, work on strengthening your motivation and intentions instead. Practice Goals for Stage 1 There are two goals for Stage 1. First, you will learn how to prepare for practice and to use a simple method to enter meditation gradually. Second, and more important, 
is to establish a consistent daily practice where you meditate to the best of your ability throughout every session. To succeed, you'll need to recognize the obstacles that stand in your way and create solutions. Mastering this stage provides you with the strong foundation you need to progress rapidly through the ten stages. How to begin your practice The basic practice used in this book is quite simple. Direct your attention toward a well-defined meditation object. Whenever your attention slips, redirect it back to that object. Repeat this as often as needed. Rather than jump right in, though, you'll start with two preliminary practices to help prepare your body and mind for a smooth transition to the meditation object. Six-Point Preparation for Meditation I recommend the following six-point preparation to new students. You should prepare for meditation just as you would for other activities, by thinking and planning beforehand. Memorize these six points and go through them as soon as you sit down. You can even review them in your head while on the way to your meditation spot. They are motivation, goals, expectations, diligence, distractions, and posture. 1. Fire up your motivation. After you sit down, the first thing to do is to remind yourself why you've chosen to meditate. Perhaps it's to have a little more peace of mind and improve your mental skills. Or it could be to achieve awakening. Or maybe it's just because you know you'll feel better for the rest of the day if you meditate than if you don't. Don't judge your reasons as being good or bad. Just acknowledge and accept them as they are. Having a clear sense of purpose will fire up your motivation and help you deal with any feelings of restlessness or resistance. 2. Set reasonable goals. Goals give direction, and it's important they be realistic so you're not disappointed. Ask yourself what you hope to accomplish in this particular session. Think about the problems you've been working on in recent sits and decide how you can best apply yourself to the practice today. Then choose a goal for this sit that's reasonable given your recent progress. At first, your goals can be simple, such as not giving up and daydreaming, or remaining patient when your mind wanders or you get drowsy. Understanding the stages and which one you're at is a powerful tool for setting realistic goals, so periodically revisit the overview. 3. Beware of expectations. You should set goals and practice diligently to achieve them, but be careful of ambitious expectations about where you should be. You can easily set yourself up for disappointment. Resolve to hold the goals you've set very lightly, to find enjoyment in every meditation, no matter what happens, and to savor any achievement. Simply sitting down to practice is an accomplishment. There will be sessions where it's easy to focus. This is the fruit of your previous practice, but don't expect to notice obvious progress each time you sit. There will be plateaus where nothing seems to change for days or weeks. Today you may have less stability of attention or mindfulness than you did weeks or even months ago. That's normal, so stay relaxed. Make your effort diligent yet joyful. Don't get caught up in expectations. And always remember, there is no such thing as a bad meditation. 4. Commit to diligence. Diligence means engaging wholeheartedly in the practice rather than spending your time on the cushion, planning, or daydreaming. You will be tempted to think about things that are more interesting or important than the meditation object. Problems to be solved, projects to plan, and fantasies to entertain. So commit not to indulge in these tempting distractions. Also, judging the quality of your practice can lead to doubt, giving rise to procrastination and resistance. Remind yourself that whenever resistance arises, the best way to overcome it is by simply continuing to practice. Resolve to practice diligently for the entire session regardless of how your meditation goes. 5. Review Potential Distractions 
It's important to know your state of mind before you begin to meditate. Perform a quick inventory of the things in your life that could come up as distractions, such as a problem at work or an argument with a friend. Check to see if your mind is occupied by any worries about the future, regrets about the past, doubts, or other annoyances. It will help to review the five hindrances described in the second interlude. Acknowledge these thoughts and emotions, whatever they are, and resolve to set them aside if they arise. You may not be wholly successful, but just setting the intention will make them easier to handle. 6. Adjust your posture. Before you begin, review your posture and get comfortable. Here's a checklist. Adjust any supports you use to help you sit comfortably. Your head, neck, and back should be aligned, leaning neither forward nor backward nor to the side. Your shoulders should be even, and your hands level with each other so your muscles are balanced. Your lips should be closed, your teeth slightly apart, and your tongue against the roof of your mouth, with the tip against the back of your upper teeth. Start with your eyes closed and angled slightly downward, as though you were reading a book. This creates the least tension in your forehead and face. If you prefer, leave your eyes slightly open, with your gaze directed at the floor in front of you. Your eyes will move during meditation, but when you notice they've shifted, return them to where they were. With your lips closed, breathe through your nose in a natural way. It shouldn't feel controlled or forced. Relax and enjoy yourself. Scan your body for any tension and let it go. All the activity of meditation is in the mind, so the body should be like a lump of soft clay, solid and stable, but completely pliant. This helps keep physical distractions to a minimum. For more on how to sit, refer to the right posture later in this chapter. Sometimes new students say, I seem to spend a lot of time just doing the preparation for practice. Is that a problem? When I ask how the rest of their meditation went afterward, that usually answers the question. By the time you go through the six points, your mind will be well settled. The preparation also helps establish a consistent practice, free from resistance and the deliberate wasting of time. And it doesn't matter how long you spend on the preparation, because it, too, is a form of meditation, in which you still intentionally direct and sustain attention. If your mind wanders, bring it back using the same techniques we describe in the next section on breath meditation. After doing the preparation every day for a while, it will go much more quickly. Preparation for Meditation Motivation Review your purpose for meditation. Be honest. Don't judge your reasons. Be aware and accept them. Example I want more peace of mind. Goals Decide what you hope to work out in this session. Set a reasonable goal for where you are in the stages. Keep it simple. Keep it small. Example, not to get annoyed when my mind wanders. Expectations Bring to mind the dangers of expectations and be gentle with yourself. Find enjoyment in every meditation, no matter what happens. There is no such thing as a bad meditation. Diligence Resolve to practice diligently for the entire session. Recall that the best way to overcome resistance is by simply continuing to practice without judging yourself. Distractions Perform a quick inventory of things in your life that might come up to distract you. Acknowledge these thoughts and emotions and resolve to set them aside if they do arise. You may not be wholly successful, but at least you have planted a seed, the intention not to let them dominate your mind. Posture Review your posture and get comfortable. Attend to your supports, your head, neck, back, shoulders, lips, eyes, and breath. Relax and enjoy yourself. All the activity of meditation is in the mind, so the proper state for the body is like a lump of soft clay, solid and stable, but completely pliant. This will keep physical distractions to a minimum. The Meditation Object 
A meditation object is something you intentionally choose to be the focus of your attention during meditation. Although you can choose just about anything, the breath is ideal for cultivating attention and mindfulness. First, the breath is always with you. Second, it allows you to be a completely passive observer. You don't need to do anything, such as repeat a mantra, generate a visualization, or rely on any special item like a candle, icon, or casina. You can meditate on the breath at any opportunity, wherever you are, every day, even up to your dying breath. The breath also changes over time, becoming fainter as concentration deepens. This makes it suitable for developing powerful attention, since the details you focus on become ever more subtle as sensations grow less distinct. Likewise, the fact that sensations change continuously, moment by moment, is conducive to insight into the nature of impermanence. Yet the breath also constantly repeats itself over and over in the same pattern, making it suitable as a fixed, that is, relatively unchanging, meditation object for entering states of meditative absorption. Because of these different qualities, the breath is used as the basis for the practice of tranquility and insight. Shamanta vipassana dry insight practices, sukha vipassana, and meditative absorptions, jhana. Whenever we refer to the breath as the meditation object, we actually mean the sensations produced by breathing, not some visualization or idea of the breath going in and out. When I direct you to observe the breath in the chest or abdomen, I mean the sensations of movement, pressure, and touch occurring there, as you breathe in and out. When I say the breath at the nose, I mean the sensations of temperature, pressure, and air moving on the skin anywhere around the tip of the nose, the rim, inside the nostrils, or on the upper lip just below the nostrils. Throughout the ten stages, your meditation object will most often be the breath sensations at the nose, but not always. Some suggest using the sensations of rising and falling at the abdomen instead. Beginners often find the large movements of the abdomen easier to follow at first. But when the breath becomes very shallow, the coarser sensitivity of the abdomen can make it harder to detect the breath sensations. I recommend the nose because the nerve endings there are much more sensitive. Choose whatever area around the nostrils works best for you. Even though the breath has many benefits, the methods presented in the ten stages can also be used with a visualized object, a mantra, or in loving-kindness practices. All the same principles can be employed in conjunction with the noting technique of the Mahasi-style Vipassana method, the breath concentration and body-scanning techniques of the Uba Kin Goenka Vipassana method, or the uniquely systematic Vipassana of Shinzen Yang. In each of these, you face the same problems of mind-wandering, distraction, and dullness, which the techniques here are designed to address. That said, not every meditation object leads to the final stages as surely as do the sensations of the breath. A Gradual Four-Step Transition to the Meditation Object In this practice, you transition gently from the free-ranging attention of daily life to focusing on the breath at the nose. The transition is spread over four steps. In each, you define a specific domain or space in which you can allow your attention to range freely. Any object in the space can serve as the focus of your attention at any moment, meaning your focus just moves as it will. As you proceed from step to step, you further restrict the space in which attention is free to move, until you're finally focused on the sensations of the breath at the nose. But as you make this transition with attention, remember to always maintain peripheral awareness. Every step in the transition provides a good opportunity to learn to distinguish between attention and awareness. Treat this as a serious practice, not just as a nice way to start a meditation. Use it each time you sit down to meditate, especially if you're a beginner. As you move through these four steps, always remember to relax your body, calm your mind, and deliberately evoke feelings of contentment. 
It's like gradually settling into a spa. Continually notice any pleasant sensations, contributing to a sense of relaxation, well-being, and overall happiness. As you will learn, relaxation and happiness play an important role in the process of training the mind. Step 1. Focus on the present. First, close your eyes and spend a few moments becoming fully present. Take in everything presented to the senses. With your eyes closed, you'll find the two main sensory stimuli are sounds and sensations originating on or in the body. Open your peripheral awareness fully. Next, allow your attention to tune into and range freely among any of the sounds, bodily sensations, smells, or thoughts you may experience. Within this holistic panorama, the one limitation you place on movements of attention is to remain in the present, here and now. Staying present is extremely important. While noises and bodily sensations all occur in the here and now, thoughts about them, beyond just noticing and recognizing them, take you away from the present. So let your attention go to any sensations that attract it, but don't analyze or think about them. Observe bodily sensations objectively, not identifying with them as mine. Let your attention move as it will, drawn by the moment-to-moment -moment arising and passing away of sensory objects within your field of conscious awareness. If you find a particular sensation to be pleasant, take a moment to enjoy it. Let that pleasure condition your mind toward a state of happiness in the present. Try to distinguish clearly between the subjective quality of pleasure and the sense object that triggered it, savoring the pleasure, not the sense object. If your mind reacts to something unpleasant, distinguish between that reaction and the object that produced it. Then let go of the reaction. You'll also be aware of all kinds of other mental activities, memories, thoughts about the future or things happening elsewhere, and so on. Expect this kind of activity to go on in your mind. Being fully present means being aware of it, but not engaging in its content. Disregard any thought that has nothing to do with the present moment. Even thoughts about the present should be approached cautiously, because they can quickly drag you away from the here and now. On the other hand, some thoughts, such as how to make your posture more comfortable, can help you settle into the present. In general, mindfully observing thoughts is tricky, so it's better to focus on sounds, smells, and physical sensations to avoid being hooked by thoughts. A helpful phrase to remember when dealing with distractions of any kind is, let it come, let it be, let it go. Don't try to suppress it, just let it come into peripheral awareness. Don't engage the distraction or focus attention on it, simply disregard it and let it be in the background, then let it go away by itself. This is a passive process. There is nothing to do but allow these objects to arise and pass away on their own, moment by moment. When you find your attention has been captured by a thought, just come back to the present. Step 2. Focus on bodily sensations. Once you've become fully present with every kind of sensory stimulus, limit your attention to bodily sensations. These include all physical sensations arising on or in the body, such as touch, pressure, warmth, coolness, movement, tingling, deep visceral sensations like a rumbling in your stomach, and so forth. With your attention limited to bodily sensations, let everything else slip into the background of peripheral awareness. Nothing should be suppressed or excluded from your field of conscious awareness. Just let sounds, smells, and thoughts keep circulating in the background, but don't focus on them. Let them come, let them be, and let them go in peripheral awareness while you restrict all movements of attention to bodily sensations. Whenever you notice your attention going to a sound or thought, bring it back to the body. As you pay more attention to your body, release any tension you find and make final adjustments to your posture. 
Again, notice any pleasant sensations, distinguishing between the sensation as sensation and your mind's reaction to it, and spend a few moments enjoying the pleasure. These pleasant sensations might include feelings of air moving over the skin, warmth or coolness, and the softness or supportive firmness of the meditation cushion. You may experience pleasant sensations deeper in your muscles and joints as you relax, or warm feelings in your chest and abdomen. There may simply be an overall pleasant sense of stillness and peace. Whatever the sensations, enjoy and explore them freely. For a beginner, it can be hard to relax at first because your mind is agitated and your body is unaccustomed to staying still for long. When you start feeling restless or your sense of contentment fades, then thoughts, memories, and emotions will begin to stir. Don't get annoyed or try to suppress them. Instead, return to step one, broadening your awareness until you become fully present with everything happening in the moment again. In particular, seek out the pleasurable aspects of the present and try to reestablish and reinforce feelings of contentment and happiness. Repeat this process of backing off and starting over as often as needed until the mind can rest easily with your attention focused only on bodily sensations. There is no need to hurry on to the next step. If you never get past step two during your entire meditation session, that's perfectly fine. However, sometimes focusing in more can also help you settle down so don't hesitate to try moving to the next step. You can always return to this one if narrowing your focus doesn't work. Step 3. Focus on bodily sensations related to the breath. As you sit quietly observing the body, your attention will naturally gravitate toward the sensations of movement produced by breathing, since little else changes while sitting quietly. As you tune in, Start paying attention to all the different kinds of breath-related sensations. You will notice them especially around your nose, face, chest, and abdomen. You may find sensations of movement caused by the breath in your upper arms and shoulders or elsewhere. Take your time to become familiar with all these breath-related sensations. In particular, savor any pleasant qualities associated with them, you may notice the mind becomes mildly invigorated during the in-breath, while the out-breath feels more relaxing and soothing. Without suppressing anything else in your field of conscious awareness, restrict your attention to these breath-related sensations. Once you settle in, start focusing more directly on the sensations of the breath in specific areas. Closely observe the rise and fall of the abdomen, then the expansion and contraction of the chest and the sensations produced by air moving in and out of the nostrils. Allow your mind to move freely among the abdomen, chest, nose, and anywhere else where you feel breath-related sensations. It's important to breathe naturally. Be a passive observer, noticing any sensations that happen to be present. You don't have to exaggerate the breath to make sensations easier to notice. If you want to perceive them more clearly, try imagining that you're looking at the place where the sensations are occurring. Let your eyes rest in a position that serves your imagination, but don't actually try to direct your eyes to the tip of your nose or your abdomen. That will just create discomfort. Your eyes will naturally tend to rest as though they were looking at a point a few inches in front of your face. Nor should you visualize the area in your mind. Take note of, savor, and even purposely induce feelings of peace and happiness, especially as your attention becomes more stable and you experience more inner calm. Step 4. Focus on sensations of the breath at the nose. Now direct your attention to the sensations produced by the air moving in and out of your nostrils. Locate where those sensations are clearest, just inside the nostrils at the tip of the nose, on the upper lip, or wherever else. The area may be as small as a pencil eraser or up to two inches across. Also, the location of sensations may not be quite the same for the in-and-out breaths. Keep your attention on the area where the breath sensations are clearest. 
Don't try to follow the air as it moves into the body or out of your nose. Just observe the sensations from the air passing over the spot where you're focusing your attention. Remember, the meditation object is the sensations of the breath, not the breath itself. Without intentionally suppressing anything from awareness, keep watching the sensations of the in and out breath. If your attention wanders, gently bring it back. And that's it. From this point on, the sensations of the breath at the tip of the nose will be your primary meditation object. Cultivating stable attention will continue all the way through stage six. Developing exclusive attention is the final event in the process and won't happen before stage six, so don't even concern yourself with it in the early stages. For now, your aim is just to tame the constant movements of attention, while at the same time trying to maintain peripheral awareness of things in the background. In other words, you want to develop stable attention with mindfulness. Counting as a method to stabilize attention. Counting your breaths at the start of a sit really helps stabilize your attention. If you're a novice, you should use this method all the time. Once you have moved through the four steps and attention is restricted to the breath at the nose, start silently counting each breath. Your goal will be to follow the sensations continuously for ten consecutive breaths. When your attention slips or you lose track of the count, which will happen frequently at first, just start over again at one. For now, consider your attention continuous if you've missed neither an inhale nor an exhale nor lost count of your breaths. However, don't expect perfection. For a beginner, you're doing well if you're aware of most of the in-and-out breath. You can set higher standards for yourself as you become more skilled. But in the beginning, high standards are unreasonable and will only discourage you. Also, you won't be able to focus exclusively, single-pointedly, on the breath. In fact, trying to do so will only cause your mind to wander more. So expect to be aware of many other things as you're watching the breath. Finally, you're not trying for nonverbal or non-conceptual observation at this point. You can talk to yourself and think about the breath as much as you like while observing it, as long as you don't completely lose awareness of the actual sensations or lose track of the count. Interestingly, what you consider the start and end of a breath cycle matters. We automatically tend to regard the beginning as the inhale and the pause after the exhale as the end. However, if you're thinking about the breath in that way, then that pause becomes the perfect opportunity for your thoughts to wander off, since the mind naturally tends to shift focus when it has completed a task. Instead, try this. Consider the beginning of the out-breath as the start of the cycle. That way the pause occurs in the middle of your cycle and is less likely to trip you up. This may seem like a small detail, but it often makes a difference. Another approach is to silently say the number during the pause at the end of the out-breath. This fills the gap and helps keep the mind on task. If you have started over many times without successfully reaching ten, change the goal to five. Before long, ten breaths will be easy. Once you've succeeded in counting to five or ten, keep observing the breath sensations, but stop counting. Counting quickly becomes automatic, and you can still forget the breath and have your mind wander while continuing to count. Therefore, counting beyond ten breaths has little value. The rule is never more than ten, never less than five. However, if your mind is particularly agitated or wanders again soon after you bring it back, do another ten count when you return to the breath. Also, if your mind wanders for a long time, several minutes or more, once you become aware of it, don't immediately return to the breath at the nose. Rather, go back to step two and briefly focus on bodily sensations. Then to step three, and focus on breath sensations in general, and then start counting breaths at the nose. Even if you use a meditation object other than the breath, counting is still a wonderful way to transition from daily activities into a more focused meditative state. 
just as with Pavlov's dogs, the mind becomes conditioned over time to counting as a sign to start meditating, and it will automatically calm down. Regardless of whether you're a beginner or an advanced meditator, I strongly recommend using counting as part of your regular practice. Counting will give you valuable information on the state of your mind and the distractions you're most likely to face. When you master stage 10, you will have effortless concentration before reaching the 10th breath. Summary of the Basic Practice Sit down, close your eyes, and go through the six-point preparation for meditation. Motivation, goals, expectations, diligence, distractions, and posture. Then do the four-step transition, gradually restricting the natural movements of your attention as you move from one step to the next. The transition needs to be gentle and gradual. Emphasize relaxation, peacefulness, and pleasure, rather than willpower and effort. When you reach step four and you're focusing on the breath at the nose, stabilize your attention by counting five or ten breaths without interruption. When you're finished counting, keep attending to the sensations of the breath at the nose. The time it takes to work through this entire sequence varies from person to person and from one session to the next. For a novice, just moving through the four-step transition may take most or all of the session. As you improve, you will proceed more quickly. Eventually you will move through the six points and from the free-ranging attention of daily life to a stable focus on the meditation object in a matter of minutes or seconds. Establishing a Practice now that you understand how to begin your practice, we'll focus on the primary goal of Stage 1, establishing a regular daily practice. This may seem obvious, perhaps trivial, but few meditators, even those professing years of experience, maintain a truly consistent practice regimen. Yet to truly reap the many benefits of meditation, you must master this first stage by overcoming the obstacles and taking the necessary steps. Obstacles to Establishing a Practice There are four major obstacles to overcome at this stage. Not having enough time to meditate, procrastinating instead of sitting down to practice, reluctance and resistance to actually doing the practice, and doubt about your abilities. Time Finding time to practice is your initial big challenge. When you first decide to take up meditation, you're naturally eager. Maybe you found inspiration from a book or a lecture. Perhaps you attended a meditation class or have a friend who meditates. At first, sheer enthusiasm helps you find time to practice. Yet, as your early excitement fades, you soon begin to feel the pressure of other demands. We will discuss some practical solutions for overcoming this obstacle, but the most effective antidote is actually quite simple. As you would do with anything else you're committed to, you must make the time to meditate. I don't know anyone who has established a meditation practice in his or her spare time. And besides, for most of us, spare time is rare. If you don't set a regular schedule, you most likely won't meditate. Make your practice a priority. Procrastination Procrastination is one of the classic problems in meditation. Modern life tends to be busy, full of deadlines, and stressful. And maybe you started meditating to manage your stress better, only to find that practicing is just another demand on your overextended time and energy. When this happens, it's easy to say, I'll meditate after I take care of such and such, or I'll have more time to meditate tomorrow. This is why you must make practice a priority. Otherwise, you will always find something more important to do first. Also, once you've been meditating regularly for a while, the after-effects will make you more at ease and relaxed. Ironically, you will feel like you have more time, not less. Reluctance and Resistance The reason many turn to meditation is the promise of greater mindfulness and inner peace. However, when you sit down 
and discover how wild and uncontrollable your mind can be. You may easily get frustrated and conclude that meditation is all work and little reward. This is where reluctance and resistance to practice usually appear. Whereas procrastination keeps us from sitting down, reluctance and resistance lead us to spend our time on the cushion daydreaming, fantasizing, or making plans, rather than actually meditating. In other words, you'll do almost anything to avoid what you now think is a boring, difficult, and unsatisfying task. The keys to overcoming reluctance and resistance are inspiration and motivation. When you first start practicing, you'll need to get your inspiration from somewhere else. However, once you start making progress, your own success provides motivation. Self-doubt We tend to stick with activities we are naturally good at and avoid the ones we struggle with. When you discover you can't control your unruly mind, you may begin doubting your abilities. Maybe I'm different in some way or just lack self-discipline. Or you might believe you aren't smart or spiritual enough for meditation. It's easy to think some inherent obstacle is holding you back, especially if you start comparing your experiences with what other people seem to be achieving. Yet the real obstacle is self-doubt, which is powerful and can rob you of your enthusiasm and determination to establish a regular practice. Without a regular practice, it will take a long time before you see any real improvement, which will only create more doubt. At the root of self-doubt is the classic hindrance of doubt explained in the second interlude. There you'll also find the explanation for how to deal with doubt. But the basic antidote is simple. Trust and perseverance, which requires inspiration and motivation. Creating Solutions the most effective way to overcome both procrastination and reluctance and resistance to practicing is to just do it. Nothing works as quickly or effectively as diligence. The simple act of consistently sitting down and placing your attention on the meditation object day after day is the essential first step from which everything else in the ten stages flows. Then, once seated, you must train yourself gently and without self-judgment, to actually meditate rather than engage in some more entertaining mental activity. Notice that I said, train yourself, not force or discipline yourself. Force, guilt, and willpower won't produce a sustainable practice, not least because of the negative emotions they stir up. Training yourself means working on your motivation and intentions until the simple acts of sitting down and meditating follow naturally. Then you repeat those activities every day until they turn into habits. Once you start practicing regularly, you will be surprised by how quickly meditation becomes easier and more gratifying. Diligence helps start you on your way. But the real solution to these obstacles is learning to enjoy your practice. One simple, powerful way to do that is to intentionally savor all feelings of physical comfort and deliberately cultivate the pleasure that can be found in quietness. Take satisfaction in the fact that you have actually sat down to meditate. That is an accomplishment in itself. Too often, people approach meditation as though they were taking medicine. It tastes bad, but they grin and bear it because it's supposed to be good for them. Instead, make meditation into a pleasurable activity. If you're at ease and happy, you will be more successful than if you're tense and straining. The more you succeed in seeking out the pleasant aspects of meditation, the more motivated you'll be and the more you will look forward to practicing. Everything else will fall into place. Doubt will disappear. You'll be inspired to meditate and can find plenty of time for it. Once you taste the joy and pleasure of practice, procrastination and resistance vanish. You'll look forward to your time on the cushion and guard it as something precious. As you progress to the higher stages, you won't just deliberately cultivate joy. It will eventually become your default state of mind. The Practical Steps 
Along with just doing it and learning to savor your meditations, there are some practical steps to establishing a regular practice. These include choosing a suitable time and place, finding the best posture for you, cultivating the right attitude, and generating strong motivation. Setting a time and place. Ideally, you should meditate at the same time every day. You learn to associate that time with meditation and are less likely to procrastinate because you don't have to decide when to meditate. Choose a period that doesn't conflict with other activities and obligations. You may have to make some adjustments to your daily schedule. If the same time is simply impossible, pick a place in your normal routine, for example, before breakfast or after your regular exercise, that will be the same each day. Having a fixed period, whether set by the clock or your daily routine, is the best way to become consistent. Beginning meditators often forget to take their mental energy and clarity into account when picking a regular time to practice. Choose when you tend to be least agitated or tired. Everyone has their own natural rhythms, but generally the best time is early morning, or at least before 1 p.m. Most people prefer the period shortly after waking up in the morning, but before breakfast, since it's best to avoid meditating right after a meal. Next best is late afternoon or early evening. Early to mid-afternoon is often the hardest. The easiest way to make time for practice is by getting up a little earlier. You will feel refreshed and alert, and family and friends will be less likely to disturb you. Also, your mind won't be agitated by the stress and activity of daily life. Of course, getting up earlier only works if you go to bed earlier. No matter what time of day you choose, you'll have to make adjustments in other parts of your life to keep your commitment to practicing. It's an inescapable fact that the time you spend meditating is time you could have used for something else. If you don't make meditation a priority over some other activities, it just won't happen. Begin with shorter meditations. I suggest 15 or 20 minutes each day for the first week or two. Then increase the length of your sessions in five-minute increments weekly or every few days until you reach 45 minutes. Use a meditation timer rather than looking at a clock and train yourself not to look at the timer. Just listen for the bell. Some people find it easier to do two shorter meditations of 20 to 30 minutes each day. This is fine at first but I strongly recommend at least one daily 45-minute sit as a minimum. This will provide a solid basis for your practice. As you advance through the stages and gain more skill, your meditations will become more interesting and enjoyable. You will eventually have no problem extending 45 minutes into an hour and practicing more than once a day if you choose. It's always best to work up gradually rather than do too much at first and become discouraged. Once you have chosen a schedule, treat meditation like any other time-related commitment, such as work or school. Spend the designated period meditating and do nothing else. Make sure others know you will be unavailable at that time of day. To start with, you may encounter some resistance from your family or anyone not used to you being unavailable, but they will learn to adjust and may even decide to join you in practicing especially when they start to notice the results of your practice. Most importantly, remind yourself that meditation time is your time, which you have set aside for yourself, a time free from the demands of the world. Considering how much meditation will improve your relationships with others, you shouldn't regard it as selfish. This personal time will ultimately benefit everyone you come in contact with. Also, if possible, practice with someone else. His or her commitment will reinforce yours and vice versa. However, if you have clearly established your intention but your practice partner hasn't, it's better to end the practice arrangement. Meditation groups provide especially strong support but usually don't meet every day. Finally, creating a regular place for meditation is just as important as setting a regular time. Choose a comfortable space where you won't be disturbed. It should be quiet and secluded enough to feel like your special meditation spot. 
The ideal situation is to have a place just for meditating. However, if that's not possible, it can also be a space you use for other things when you're done. But it should be a place where you can keep your meditation cushions, a shawl, or anything else you might use. Design and decorate it in ways that inspire you and remind you of why you're meditating and what you hope to gain. Some people like to set up an altar as well. It doesn't matter if it's religious or not. Its purpose is to inspire and motivate you in your practice. The Right Posture Any comfortable position works for meditation, as long as it's not so comfy that you fall asleep. There are four traditional meditation postures, sitting, standing, walking, and lying down. They all work, and none is more correct than the others. Here we'll focus on some pointers to help you find a good sitting position. You can meditate sitting in a chair, on a meditation bench, or on the floor. Full lotus position, legs crossed with your feet on top of your knees, provides a very stable position and helps keep you alert, but it's not necessary for success. Also, if you weren't flexible enough to sit in full lotus easily, it can cause serious injury. The half-lotus position, with legs crossed and only one foot on top of the opposite knee, is likewise very stable. Yet it, too, is not easy for many adult Westerners. The most popular meditation posture is probably sitting on the floor on a zafu, a Japanese-style round cushion, legs crossed, with ankles slightly tucked under the opposite thigh or knee. Alternatively, both knees and lower legs can be flat on the floor, one in front of the other the so-called Burmese style. Low Japanese-style meditation benches called seiza are often used. If sitting on the floor proves difficult, then sit on a regular straight-backed chair. Experiment with different postures before deciding which you prefer. Also, there are many ways to fine-tune any position using pads and pillows, lumbar supports, meditation belts, or straps, height adjustments, and so on. Regardless of the position you choose, it's important there be as little physical strain or pain as possible, especially during longer sits. Expect some aches and pains merely from staying still, but try to minimize pain in general and don't aggravate pre-existing injuries. Regard the discomforts that remain as part of your practice. By observing them, you'll learn how your body and mind interact. And be patient. As your practice develops, it will get easier to sit. Eventually, you will be able to sit for hours without any discomfort. You'll even get up feeling quite good without any stiffness or numbness. Remain as still as you can during sitting meditation, despite any discomfort. This can be challenging for a beginner, but always wait as long as you can before moving. Then don't stop meditating when you change position but rather move slowly and deliberately with full attention to the sensations in your body as you shift. You will likely discover that although whatever caused you to move in the first place has disappeared, another irritating sensation, possibly more intense, soon takes its place. You simply can't overcome all physical discomfort by adjusting your posture. The Right Attitude To succeed... We need to approach the practice in a relaxed manner, free from judgment and expectations. Although we may start out this way, we can quickly slip into a critical, striving attitude when faced with problems such as mind-wandering, sleepiness, and impatience. This attitude becomes the greatest impediment to our continued progress. When words like struggle or difficult come to mind, or if you feel like you're trying really hard but not making any progress— you'll know it's time to examine your attitude. Meditation is a series of simple tasks, easy to perform, that only need to be repeated until they bear fruit. So where is the sense of difficulty and exertion coming from? We usually describe a task as difficult because we're dissatisfied with our performance, which means we've started judging. Your expectations haven't been met, and maybe you're starting to doubt whether you'll ever succeed, which can sap your motivation. You're not actually struggling with meditating. You're struggling with unrealistic expectations and an idealized image of what you think should 
be happening. As a result, it feels like you're forcing yourself to do something you think you aren't very good at. If you believe those feelings, the ego self naturally wants to avoid blame. If you can convince yourself that you've been trying really hard, then the ego self doesn't feel guilty for not meeting its own self-imposed expectations. You can blame the teacher, the method, or concoct a story about how meditation isn't right for you. The real issue isn't that meditation takes too much effort or that something is innately wrong with you. It's your judgment and expectations. So let go of expectations and generate an attitude of faith, trust, and confidence. Faith in the method, trust that the results will come with continued practice, and confidence in your own ability. Joyful effort and diligence are the right attitude. Rather than striving, focus on the positive, pleasant elements of each session, joyfully repeating the same simple tasks as many times as needed to achieve the goal. This is precisely what diligence means. With spiritual practice in general, and meditation in particular, small measures repeated consistently produce huge results. The only place for great effort in meditation is in adjusting your schedule to actually spend more time practicing. Realize there are no failures in meditation except for actually failing to do the practice. As fellow teacher Stephanie Nash is fond of saying, a good meditation is one you did. The only bad meditation is one you didn't do. Take her wise advice to heart. Staying Motivated You wouldn't be hearing this right now if you weren't somehow inspired to explore meditation. Keep yourself inspired and find new sources of encouragement. Make a point of frequently reminding yourself why you decided to meditate and what the benefits are. Reflect on the admirable qualities of experienced meditators you know. Read books, go to lectures, and listen to recorded talks. Think about how you and everyone around you will benefit from your practice. Do all you can to stay motivated, just as you would if beginning an exercise program or learning to play an instrument. Also, support and inspire others, and let them support and inspire you. Practice with friends who share your interest in meditation and set aside one day each week to get together for sitting, study, and discussion. Look into local meditation and dharma groups or start your own. As the Buddha once told his disciple Ananda, noble friends and companions are the whole of the holy life. When you feel you're ready to try more intensive practice, attend an organized retreat. Conclusion you have mastered stage one when you never miss a daily practice session, except when absolutely unavoidable, and when you rarely, if ever, procrastinate on the cushion by thinking and planning or doing something besides meditating. This stage is the most difficult to master, but it can be done in a few weeks. By following the basic instructions and cultivating the right attitude, you will develop joyful effort and diligence and establish a regular daily practice. The time and effort put into mastering this stage will pay off far beyond anything you can imagine. Here, monks, a monk goes to the forest, to the foot of a tree, or to an empty place, sits down, folds his legs crosswise, keeps his body erect, and brings mindful awareness to the fore. With mindfulness he breathes in. With mindfulness, he breathes out. Anapanasati Sutta Second Interlude The Hindrances and Problems All the mental skills needed in meditation are innate abilities we can selectively choose to cultivate. It's no different from acquiring any new skill, whether learning a science, a musical instrument, or how to throw a frisbee. We are actually just training ourselves in a way that favors certain inherent abilities over others. Think of meditation as mental training that exercises certain mental muscles so they respond more easily and better serve your needs. Just as the mental capacities we develop and use in meditation are completely natural and normal, so too are those activities of mind that can hinder 
or even defeat our practice. Traditional meditation literature identifies five specific hindrances to overcome before we can make real progress, and understanding them will prove invaluable. In daily life, these so-called hindrances actually serve necessary and useful purposes. Once you're familiar with them and how they work, it becomes obvious that neither suppression nor self-punishment will help you surmount such established and often helpful conditioning. On the other hand, positive reinforcements of other natural tendencies of the mind that oppose these hindrances works very well. Remember, everybody faces these challenges. They're not unique to you, and they're not personal shortcomings. More importantly, and very fortunately, these hindrances are well understood, and there are effective methods for resolving each and every one of them. The Five Hindrances We can trace almost every problem in meditation to one or more of five innate and universal psychological predispositions, known as the five hindrances, worldly desire, aversion, laziness and lethargy, agitation due to worry and remorse, and doubt. They are called hindrances because they hinder efforts at meditating and create all kinds of problems in daily life as well. Therefore, as countless meditation manuals recognize, learning about them at the start is crucial. Even though these innate predispositions cause problems, we have them precisely because they were useful to our species as we evolved. The first step toward working with the hindrances skillfully is to understand the purposes they ordinarily serve. Second, you will cultivate five meditation factors— Directed attention, sustained attention, meditative joy, pleasure, happiness, and unification of mind. Each of these acts as an antidote to one or more of the hindrances and contributes to a key goal of meditation, purifying the mind of these powerful facets of our biological programming and of their negative influences. We discuss the five meditation factors in depth later in the book. Make no mistake. Overcoming these hindrances won't deprive you of the ability to survive and care for yourself. In fact, it's just the opposite. We have evolved other abilities, such as intelligence and cooperation, which fulfill the same needs more effectively and with fewer problems. As you stop relying on this once useful but now outdated programming, you will be more fully awake, better able to make clear-headed decisions, and take the appropriate actions. You will also come to realize that these hindrances are the basis for the stories and melodramas the mind concocts. Examples of stories rooted in worldly desire include, I need a beautiful house, and I want a successful career so I can be happy. Examples of stories rooted in aversion include, I hate rude people. It's not fair that they always get what they want. I don't want to be sick today, or I can't take this place anymore. Examples of stories arising from laziness and lethargy include, I'm too tired to help you right now, and it's too late, or a waste of time to try to finish that project. Examples of stories tied to the agitation due to worry and remorse include, what if I get caught, I'm ashamed of behaving that way, and I'm afraid. There are also self-defeating stories steeped in doubt, such as, I can't meditate, I'm too clumsy to play, and I'm not good enough, smart enough, fast enough, and so on. These are the stories that largely define our lives. But through meditation, we can question and eventually move beyond the narratives that hold us back. Familiarize yourself with the hindrances and their antidotes and learn to recognize them, not only in meditation, but in daily life as well. Your effort will pay off. 1. Worldly Desire Worldly desire, sometimes called sense desire, is when we pursue, delight in, and cling to the pleasures of material existence. This also means desiring to avoid their opposites. These desires include gaining material objects and preventing their loss, 
having pleasurable experiences and avoiding pain, achieving fame, power, and influence while avoiding infamy and impotence, and attaining the love and admiration of others while avoiding hatred and blame. In Buddhism, these are sometimes referred to as the eight worldly dharmas. Here's an easy formula to help you remember them. Gain loss, pleasure, pain, fame, obscurity, and praise, blame. This kind of desire is so fundamental a part of our biological programming that you may have never asked yourself why it exists or questioned the effects it has and whether you'd be better off without it. Worldly desire evolved because in the natural world we have to strive for the resources we need to survive and reproduce, and that takes effort and motivation. We are programmed from birth to take pleasure in desire and pursue the very things and experiences that help us stay healthy, get a mate, and provide for our offspring. And we are social animals, so we take pleasure in and crave acceptance, status, and power, because they are important to our survival and reproduction as well. The innate predisposition to desire whatever brings pleasure has made humans very successful. Yet when it comes to the effects of desire on your life, consider that the world has changed since these desires first evolved. Sex, food, especially high-calorie, fatty, sugary, and salty foods, and labor-saving devices are far more available today. Unrestrained desire leads not only to overconsumption and health and relationship difficulties, but many other issues that get revealed through meditation as well. That said, meditation doesn't involve repressing worldly desires. It gives us direct, experiential insight into the many ways the desire leads to pain and anxiety. This insight frees us from being ruled by desire, so we can cultivate its opposite instead, non-grasping and equanimity. Our new motivations will come from a place of generosity, loving-kindness, and shared joy. We will discuss these positive qualities in later chapters. Worldly desire is so deeply embedded in us that you may have trouble imagining how we could live without it. However, as intelligent beings, we no longer need to be driven by compulsive desire in order to take care of ourselves. We can act effectively from a foundation of reason and equanimity. Furthermore, generosity, loving-kindness, and sympathetic joy will only serve to enhance the survival of social beings like ourselves. Nor does eliminating desire lessen our experience of pleasure and happiness. Free from craving and filled with love, we become more fully present for positive experiences of every kind. The practices in this book will make you more aware of desire and give you many opportunities to practice abandoning it. Unification of mind is the meditation factor that specifically opposes and is opposed by the hindrance of worldly desire. As the mind becomes unified, worldly desire weakens and eventually disappears, not only during meditation, but from daily life as well. Experienced firsthand, this is an extraordinary transformation. You don't grow stoic, indifferent to pleasure, or lose your motivation, but rather are filled with joy, calm, and contentment. A unified and blissful mind, in other words, has no reason to chase worldly desires. You will live a more dynamic life, not constrained by craving, and you will be open to many more possibilities. 2. Aversion Aversion, sometimes called ill will, is a negative mental state involving resistance. Its most extreme form is hatred, with the intent to harm or destroy. But any compulsion to get rid of or avoid unpleasantness, no matter how subtle, is aversion. Dissatisfaction and resentment, most forms of criticism, and even self-accusation, impatience, and boredom, are forms of aversion. As with the other hindrances, aversion has been helpful for human survival. In the same way that we're programmed to take pleasure in and desire anything that supports our continued existence, we're programmed to experience displeasure and aversion 
toward what is potentially harmful. Aversion motivates us to avoid or eliminate what is unpleasant. Aversion hinders meditation in several ways. For instance, thoughts about someone we don't like, a dreaded future obligation, or regrets about the past easily become distractions during meditation. Judgment and impatience about our practice undermine our motivation and encourage doubt. In the later stages, subtle, unconscious traces of aversion can keep mental and physical pliancy from developing and prevent the meditation factor of pleasure, happiness, from arising. Just as aversion opposes mental happiness and physical pleasure, the meditation factor of pleasure, happiness, opposes aversion. Pleasure, happiness, counters aversion by making negative states of mind impossible to hold on to, although they can return full force afterward. Simply put, there's little, if any, room for negativity in a mind filled with bliss. This is one of the reasons it's crucial to always seek out pleasurable feelings and encourage positive mental states during practice. You will learn to recognize aversion, replacing it with equanimity, acceptance, and patience. As these become your new predispositions, anger, cold-heartedness, and harmfulness are replaced by loving-kindness, compassion, and harmlessness. You'll be astonished at the profound transformation as aversion disappears from your daily life. 3. Laziness and Lethargy Laziness mostly appears as procrastination. Its counterpart, lethargy, is a tendency toward inactivity, rest, and ultimately sleep. Both involve a lack of energy. Each causes different problems, but together they form a powerful hindrance. When we lack motivation, laziness and lethargy arise and keep us from making enough effort. Laziness is being resistant to doing some particular activity. Laziness is usually thought of as something negative, but it serves a purpose— it keeps us from spending time and energy on unnecessary, unproductive, or unpleasant activities. That time and energy can then be used for activities that contribute to happiness, survival, and reproductive success. Laziness also motivates us to use our skills and intelligence to come up with easier ways of doing things. Laziness arises when the cost of an activity seems to outweigh the benefits. Lethargy arises when there appears to be nothing interesting, exciting, or potentially rewarding going on. This also serves a purpose. Our body and mind need time to rest and recuperate. Rest is a better use of time than engaging in unproductive activities. Like laziness, lethargy is an evolutionary adaptation for conserving time and energy. The essence of lethargy is a progressive, involuntary loss of mental energy. The longer it continues, the harder it is to halt this downward slide. There are two antidotes for laziness and lethargy. The first is to motivate yourself by thinking about future rewards. This means weighing the costs against the benefits in a rational and intelligent way, rather than just trusting your emotions. For instance, whenever you have trouble bringing yourself to meditate, you can recall all the benefits that will come if you keep practicing. So, to deal with laziness, you need to muster enough motivation to actually begin the task you want to complete. Dealing with lethargy means having enough motivation to complete the task, rather than quitting or falling asleep. The second antidote is to just do it. This means that you plunge in, despite resistance, and then engage with the task fully. This works well against laziness because the power of laziness lies in procrastination. Before we start an activity, we can question its value and suggest alternatives that seem more appealing. Laziness makes it hard to start a task. But once we start, it's easier to continue. If we get interrupted, though, laziness can return and make restarting difficult. In any case, since laziness often fades when we begin a task, just doing the task is the antidote. Engaging fully with a task also works against lethargy by re-energizing the mind. But how effective this is depends on how quickly we recognize the onset of lethargy. 
The meditation factor of directed attention opposes laziness and lethargy, and vice versa. This hindrance impedes directed attention because we cannot easily direct a dull, tired, and unmotivated mind. In meditation, just doing it means you keep directing attention to the meditation object, countering procrastination and any loss of mental energy. Eventually, directed attention becomes powerful and automatic enough to completely overcome laziness and lethargy. 4. Agitation due to worry and remorse We feel this kind of agitation when we're conflicted about the past or concerned about the future. This agitation can take the form of remorse for past unwise, unwholesome, or immoral activities— or for something we neglected to do. We may also have agitation due to remorse when fretting about the possible consequences. For example, you may feel remorse about an affair, either because of the pain your spouse would feel if he or she found out, or because of your own guilty conscience. Another form of this agitation to take is worry. Yes, we worry about the consequences of unwholesome actions, but we also worry about neutral actions. For instance, you may worry about whether or not you locked the back door. Even wholesome activities can cause anxiety. Perhaps you drove your friend to the hospital because she had the flu, but now you worry that you may have caught it. And once you start worrying, it often leads to more agitation as you wonder about how you might prevent or cope with the consequences of your imaginary scenarios. We also worry about very unlikely things, such as being caught in a terrorist attack. We can create endless combinations of worry and remorse for ourselves, all of which make us more agitated. Our predisposition to agitation due to worry and remorse helps spur us to correct things when possible, to protect ourselves when confronted by unavoidable consequences, and to prepare as best we can for an uncertain future. The mental discomfort also helps discourage us from creating similar situations in the future. However, if we can't put our agitated energy to good use, it makes us stressed because of our unresolved impulses to act. It also makes it harder to focus on anything else. Even when we consciously set aside or unconsciously repress worry and remorse, the mind remains agitated, affecting our body and emotions. Most of us are quite aware of the adverse effects of such stress. Yet in meditation, we discover directly how even negative actions from the distant past and long-forgotten worries can still produce agitation. They're like seeds buried in the unconscious furrows of the mind. Only when we become quiet enough can they emerge fully into the light of consciousness. Our past shapes our current perceptions and behaviors, and unresolved issues can stand in the way of peace of mind, joy, and happiness in the present. The best antidote to this kind of agitation is to take up the practice of virtue. When we behave virtuously, we don't create further causes for remorse or worry. But what is virtue? I don't mean morality in the sense of adhering to an external standard demanded by a deity or other authority, nor do I mean ethics as in following a system of rules that prescribe the best way to act. Both moral principles and ethical codes can be followed blindly without necessarily having to resolve your own bad mental habits. Rather, virtue is the practice of inner purification, which results in good behavior. If you think of the mind as an engine, the practice of virtue allows for the smoothest, most powerful performance. Likewise, every action that has an unskillful intent, even the most subtle, is like a small bit of grit reducing the mind's performance. As a virtuous person, you'll enjoy a peace of mind that enables you to reach the highest stages of meditation. Of course, there are many other benefits to being virtuous, but the practice of virtue is intrinsically rewarding. While training in virtue helps prevent misconduct in the future, the other remedy is doing whatever's possible to resolve any existing sources of worry or remorse by taking positive action. After you've done what you can, you must forgive yourself 
and seek forgiveness of others for what can't be resolved. Then let go once and for all of these events and any judgments about them. A deep purification of the mind happens in meditation, and a large part of that purification involves putting to rest concerns about past misconduct, actual or perceived. Agitation due to worry and remorse is a specific state of mind. The meditation factor of meditative joy is also a state of mind. Since the two are opposites, they cannot exist together. The continued presence of this agitation interferes with the arising of meditative joy. Similarly, as the mind becomes more joyful with continued practice, agitation due to worry and remorse dies down. Joy overcomes worry because it produces confidence, optimism, and the certainty one can handle whatever challenges life may present. Likewise, joy overcomes remorse because a joyful person sincerely regrets any harm he or she has caused in the past and is eager to set things right. 5. Doubt Doubt is healthy and valuable when it motivates us to question, investigate, and try things for ourselves. It keeps us from blindly accepting what others say or what seems true, and from being misled and taken advantage of. As a survival strategy, it keeps us from wasting our time and resources. Doubt begins as an unconscious mental process that focuses on negative results and negative possible outcomes. Once the mind decides a situation should be examined more closely, the emotion of doubt becomes part of conscious experience. If the feeling of doubt is strong enough, it compels us either to reevaluate an activity or to abandon it altogether. The purpose of doubt is simply to challenge the strength of our motivation, inviting us to test our current activities and intentions with reason and logic. Doubt becomes a hindrance if, Instead of re-evaluating the situation rationally, we respond only to the emotional uncertainty it creates. Too often, that keeps us from making the effort needed to validate something through our own experience. We can never succeed at any difficult task if we simply abandon whatever makes us uncertain. Doubt in this form is more like a perverse faith in failure that saps our will and undermines our intentions. For example, if you doubt your ability to succeed in meditation, your motivation will fade and you won't sit down to practice. The remedy for doubt is to use our reasoning abilities to envision the possibility of long-term success, countering the short-term emotional pressure of this hindrance. Once we've overcome the paralyzing effects of doubt, we can move forward with stronger motivation and, through action, achieve certainty. The ultimate remedy for doubt is the trust and confidence that come from success, and success depends on persistent effort. Although doubt is often projected onto other people and things, it often takes the form of self-doubt, a lack of confidence in our own abilities. Of the many forms doubt takes, self-doubt is so pervasive that it's worth addressing specifically and providing a few more assurances and antidotes. If you doubt your ability to concentrate, just remember that even though some people are calmer by nature than others, very few have such active minds that they cannot meditate. Even serious cases of attention deficit disorder don't prevent people from achieving the highest goals of meditation. If your mind is really more active than average, the first three stages will be the most challenging. But rest assured, not only can you master them, but the stages after will come much more easily. For some, self-doubt is about self-esteem, specifically about comparing yourself to others you believe are brighter or more capable. In fact, intellectual ability isn't that important for success at meditation. Meditation is about attention and awareness. If you can listen to this book and follow the instructions, you have more than enough intelligence to learn to meditate. For that matter, even if you don't understand some of what you hear here, by just following the basic instructions for each stage, you will succeed. Some doubt they have the necessary self-discipline, 
But if you can exercise regularly or go to work or school, you can establish a practice. The key factor isn't discipline, but rather motivation and habits. If you find yourself questioning whether you have enough discipline to meditate, instead, re-examine your motivation. Without motivation, discipline won't help much. Making meditation a habit is also critical. Because we're in the habit of going to work, even when reluctant, we do it anyway, and often without giving any particular thought to the consequences. Habit is powerful. In Stage 1, we discussed ways to create the conditions for your practice to become a habit. Doubt obviously stands in the way of persistence. Conversely, the meditation factor of sustained attention, achieved through consistent effort, is what overcomes doubt. That is, as you keep applying yourself, you'll learn that you're capable of sustaining attention and achieving other positive results. Success leads to trust in the practice and in yourself. Once you realize that, you'll completely overcome doubt. The Five Hindrances Hindrance Worldly Desire Explanation Pursuit of pleasures related to our material existence and the desire to avoid their opposites, gain, loss, pleasure, pain, fame, obscurity, praise, blame. Opposing Meditation Factor Unification of Mind A unified and blissful mind has no reason to chase worldly desires. Hindrance Aversion Explanation A negative mental state involving judgment, rejection, and denial includes hatred, anger, resentment, dissatisfaction, criticism, impatience, self-accusation, and boredom. Opposing Meditation Factor Pleasure, Happiness There's little room for negativity in a mind filled with bliss. Hindrance Laziness and Lethargy Laziness appears when the cost of an activity seems to outweigh the benefits. Lethargy manifests as a lack of energy, procrastination, and low motivation. Opposing Meditation Factor Directed Attention in meditation, just do it means directing attention to the meditation object to counter procrastination and loss of mental energy. Hindrance Agitation due to remorse and worry Explanation Remorse for unwise, unwholesome, immoral, or illegal activities. Worry about consequences for past actions or about things you imagine might happen to you. Worry and remorse make it hard to focus mental resources on anything else. Opposing Meditation Factor Meditative Joy Joy overcomes worry because it produces confidence and optimism. Joy overcomes remorse because a joyful person regrets past harms and is eager to set things right. Hindrance Doubt Explanation a biased, unconscious mental process focused on negative possible outcomes. The kind of uncertainty that makes us hesitate and keeps us from making the effort needed to validate something through our own experience. Self-doubt saps our will and undermines intentions. Opposing Meditation Factor Sustained Attention This is achieved through consistent effort. Success leads to trust and doubt disappears. The Seven Problems The classical five hindrances give a general description of the psychological obstacles to meditation. Different combinations of these hindrances lead to specific challenges I call the seven problems. You will face them all as you progress through the stages, and in each stage we provide the details about specific problems and how to overcome them. Use the list as an easy reference guide linking specific problems to their hindrances. This will help you quickly grasp what problem stems from what hindrance so you can apply the appropriate antidote. 1. Procrastination and Resistance to Practicing The hindrances of laziness and doubt contribute to procrastination and resistance to practicing. If we are not convinced meditating is worth the time and trouble, laziness manifests as resistance. 
This is where doubt enters in. You may begin to doubt your own abilities, the teacher, or the method. Any of these can strengthen procrastination and undermine your motivation and determination. 2. Distractions, Forgetting, and Mind-Wandering The hindrances of worldly desire, aversion, agitation, and doubt can all manifest as distractions that cause forgetting, then mind-wandering. Thoughts about the worldly dharmas, wealth, pleasure, fame, and praise are far more engaging for a novice than the sensations of the breath. Even trivial desires, like wanting to check your email, are distracting enough to cause you to forget the breath. Aversion to bodily pain, noises, or other distractions can disturb your meditation, as can feelings of impatience, boredom, or dissatisfaction with your progress. The emotional charge of feelings like anger and resentment makes you want to mull them over, rehashing conflicts and planning responses. Worry and remorse likewise produce distracting thoughts about the past or future that take you away from the present. Thoughts related to doubt easily become distractions as well. 3. Impatience Impatience is rooted in several of the same hindrances as distraction and mind-wandering, aversion, worldly desire, and doubt. The difference is that impatience manifests as a disruptive emotion rather than as a distracting thought or memory. 4. Monkey Mind Agitation due to worry and remorse often causes monkey mind. It can also be caused by anger and aversion, the anticipation of fulfilling a strong desire, or even the restlessness that comes with impatience. In fact, monkey mind can stem from any of the hindrances, except laziness and lethargy. 5. Self-doubt The hindrance of doubt is at the root of self-doubt, as discussed before. 6. Dullness, drowsiness, and falling asleep The hindrance of laziness and lethargy create dullness and drowsiness, but it's mostly due to lethargy. Lethargy is a decrease in mental energy that manifests as a comfortable, pleasant dullness of perception, or as heavy drowsiness. As mental activity dies down, mental energy falls, as do interest, awareness, and responsiveness. 7. Physical Discomfort Worldly desire and aversion are what make physical discomfort into a problem. An itch, for example, is simply stimulation of the skin. But it turns into suffering when aversion and the desire for the itch to go away arise. The Seven Problems and Their Antidotes Problem Procrastination and Resistance to Practicing Antidote Frequently recall the benefits of practice, constantly refresh and renew your motivation, and just do it. See Stage 1 Problem Distractions, forgetting, and mind-wandering. Antidote. Each part of the problem is addressed sequentially. In Stage 2, work with mind-wandering. In Stage 3, work on overcoming forgetting. In Stages 4 through 6, work on overcoming all distractions. Problem. Impatience. Antidote. Rather than identifying with impatience, learn to observe it objectively. Cultivate joy, peace, contentment, and equanimity. See Stage 2. Problem. Monkey Mind. Antidote. An agitated, overly energized mind is in constant motion and can't stay focused on anything. The antidote is to get grounded in the body. See Stage 2. Problem. Self-doubt. Antidote. Do everything you can to keep your motivation strong. Don't compare yourself to others. Make meditation a habit. Problem. Dullness, drowsiness, and sleepiness. Antidote. Decreased mental energy leads to dullness, then drowsiness, and sleep. Counter strong dullness by energizing the mind using techniques described in stages 3 and 4. In Stage 5, work on overcoming subtle dullness. Problem. 
physical discomfort. Antidote. Find the most comfortable position possible. Refer to stage one. Use physical discomfort as part of the practice to develop the insight that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Refer to stages three and four. In conclusion. The five hindrances are more than just obstacles to meditation. They are the same obstacles that thwart a happy, productive existence. By practicing meditation and overcoming them, we accomplish something of inestimable value, which has far-reaching benefits for every other part of our lives as well. When you achieve stage 10, these hindrances are completely overcome, absent from both meditation and daily life. And as long as you can regularly reach shamatha in your practice, or if you achieve sufficient insight, they will not return. Stage 2 Interrupted Attention and Overcoming Mind Wandering 2. The goal for Stage 2 is to shorten the periods of mind wandering and extend the periods of sustained attention to the meditation object. Willpower can't prevent the mind from forgetting the breath, nor can you force yourself to become aware that the mind is wandering. Instead, just hold the intention to appreciate the aha moment that recognizes mind wandering, while gently but firmly redirecting attention back to the breath. Then intend to engage with the breath as fully as possible without losing peripheral awareness. In time, the simple actions flowing from these three intentions will become mental habits. Periods of mind wandering will become shorter, periods of attention to the breath will grow longer, and you'll have achieved your goal. Practice Goals for Stage 2 Stage 1 was preparatory, teaching you how to establish a practice and getting you seated and attentive to the sensations of the breath at the tip of the nose. Stage 2 marks the beginning of the process of training the mind as you try to stay focused on the breath. It takes work to calm the mind, but you will work smart, not hard, using finesse, patience, and positive reinforcement. Keeping your attention on the breath may seem like a simple task, but you'll quickly discover how challenging it can be. Most novice meditators are surprised by how unruly the mind is. You may feel like you're trying to tame a wild animal, or even that meditation is making your mind more agitated. In reality, you're just becoming aware of what's always been going on in the mind. Recognizing this is an important first step. There are two primary goals for Stage 2, shortening the periods of mind wandering and sustaining attention on the breath for longer periods. You will address mind-wandering with positive reinforcement, learning to truly appreciate the moment you wake up to the fact that attention strayed. You achieve longer intervals of sustained attention by learning to actively engage with the breath. The obstacles at this stage are forgetting, mind-wandering, monkey mind, and impatience. Although we'll discuss forgetting at this stage, dealing with it as an obstacle won't be addressed until stage three. When you start this stage, your meditations mostly consist of interrupted continuity of mind-wandering. That is, most of your time is taken up by mind-wandering, interrupted by brief periods of attention to breath. By the end of this stage, you'll experience the opposite. Most of your time will go to attending to the breath, and you'll only have brief periods of mind-wandering or interrupted continuity of attention. You've mastered this stage when episodes of mind-wandering are brief, while your attention to the breath lasts much longer. The Problems of Forgetting and Mind-Wandering The combined problems of forgetting and mind-wandering will dominate your meditation sessions in Stage 2. Forgetting means we forget the meditation object, as well as our intention to focus on the breath. Mind-wandering is what happens after we've forgotten what we were doing. The mind will wander from thought to thought, often for a long time, before we wake up to what is happening. At the root of these problems are the various types of spontaneous movements of attention 
described in the overview. We place our attention on the breath, but the mind produces distractions. Alternating attention scans these distractions for something more interesting, important, exciting, intense, or novel. Interest and importance are judged according to the perceived ability to increase pleasure or decrease pain, cause happiness or unhappiness, or improve or threaten your physical well-being. When something captures attention, the breath is abandoned, and forgetting happens. When attention tires of one distraction, it moves to another, usually through chains of association. This kind of mind-wandering is the main obstacle you'll work on at this stage. Why does attention move this way? It's a matter of evolution. Selection pressures have favored spontaneously moving attention more strongly than stable attention. Constantly moving attention keeps us on the lookout for whatever will help us to survive and reproduce. Even if you're a spiritual seeker, intent on discovering the ultimate meaning of life, if your attention didn't wander at times, your house might burn down around you. So, while forgetting and mind-wandering might be obstacles in meditation, they're a normal and necessary part of everyday life, letting us use our limited conscious resources more efficiently. The mind of an adept meditator still moves spontaneously in daily life, allocating consciousness where it's needed, but not getting captured unnecessarily. Still, Stable attention is useful for survival, so we all have that inherent capacity as well. In other words, evolution is not selected against stable attention, even though we're not as strongly predisposed to use it. When we meditate, we're training and strengthening this inborn but less used capacity. By cultivating stable attention, meditation calms the wandering mind and creates inner peace. When attention is accompanied by greater awareness, we have strong mindfulness, meaning we can refocus and stabilize our attention wherever and whenever it's needed. Awakening from Mind-Wandering A critical moment occurs during mind-wandering when you suddenly realize you're no longer observing the breath. You abruptly wake up to the fact that you weren't doing what you had intended. It's like suddenly remembering a phone call you forgot to make or an unmailed check. The thought just pops into your head, as if from nowhere. Even though you were preoccupied with something else, some unconscious part of your mind made you consciously aware that you were supposed to be attending to the breath. Our natural tendency is to quickly return to the breath, often forcefully and with self-judgment. This reaction is typical of our approach to everyday tasks. We rush to get back on track. During meditation, however, if you return to the breath as soon as you realize you've lost it, you'll miss a key opportunity for training the mind. Awakening to the present is an important opportunity to understand and appreciate how your mind works. You've just had a minor epiphany, an aha moment of realizing there's a disconnect between what you're doing thinking about something else, and what you intended to do. Watch the breath. But this wasn't something you did, nor can you voluntarily make it happen. The process that discovered this disconnect isn't under your conscious control. It happens unconsciously. But when the findings become conscious, you have an aha moment of introspective awareness. The way to overcome mind-wandering is by training this unconscious process to make the discovery and bring it into consciousness sooner and more often. Yet how do you train something that happens unconsciously? Simply take a moment to enjoy and appreciate waking up from mind-wandering. Savor the sense of being more fully conscious and present. Cherish your epiphany and encourage yourself to have more of them. Conscious intention and affirmation powerfully influence our unconscious processes. By valuing this moment, you're training the mind through positive reinforcement to wake up more quickly in the future. Also, avoid becoming annoyed or self-critical about mind-wandering. It doesn't matter that your mind wandered. What's important is that you realized it. To become annoyed or self-critical in the aha moment will slow down your progress. You can't scold the mind into changing, 
especially when dealing with entrenched mental patterns like forgetting and mind-wandering. Even worse, the negative feedback will get associated with the most recent event, the spontaneous arising of introspective awareness, and you'll end up discouraging the very process that stops mind-wandering. It's like telling your unconscious you don't want to have the mind-wandering interrupted. If negative emotions do arise, simply notice them and let them come, let them be, and let them go. It's like training a pet. Consistent, immediate, positive reinforcements of behaviors we want will be far more effective than punishing behaviors we don't. As you keep repeating this technique, introspective awareness will eventually intervene before you completely forget the meditation object, the goal of stage three. Over time, introspective awareness will grow so strong that it's always present, and you'll never lose the meditation object as your focus of attention, the goal of stage four. In fact, moving through all ten stages depends on positively reinforcing cultivating and strengthening introspective awareness. Thus, beginning at this stage, always appreciate it whenever it arises, and make satisfaction and pleasure a cornerstone of your whole practice. Directing and Redirecting Attention Purposely directing and redirecting your attention is an important part of meditation training. You want to continuously cultivate your ability to intentionally direct attention to any object you choose, regardless of its intrinsic interest. You do this by redirecting attention over and over again, back to the meditation object whenever it wanders. This is how directed attention leads to stable attention. If you're reluctant to let go of an object you find particularly engaging, evoke discipline and diligence. Discipline doesn't mean forcing the mind to do something it can't, but rather a firm, intentional resolve to let go of an object that's captured your attention and return to the breath. Being diligent means doing this consistently and promptly. Like a muscle, the more you exercise this faculty, the stronger it grows. In other words, your conscious intention to redirect attention, repeated often enough, will gradually train your unconscious to do it automatically and almost instantly. Then, intentional movements of attention will replace spontaneous movements, and other things don't capture your attention. By stage four, redirecting attention to the meditation object will become completely automatic. Sustaining Attention on the Meditation Object once you've redirected attention, you want to increase the periods of sustained attention to the meditation object. A technique that helps is called following the breath. This is a series of tasks, like a game, to help you actively engage with, take interest in, and fully investigate the breath, countering the natural tendency for attention to shift. To begin, try identifying the exact moment the in-breath starts and the exact moment it ends. Likewise, try noticing the exact moment the out-breath begins and ends. You will find the beginning of the in-breath easy to identify because of the sharp impact of cool, incoming air on the skin. The start of the out-breath will probably be obvious as well, though less distinct since outgoing air is warmer. By contrast, the exact ends of the in- and out-breaths are less obvious. You will also notice brief pauses between the in- and out-breaths, and between the out- and in-breaths. If you find it hard to perceive the ends of the in- and out-breaths clearly, it helps to identify the pauses first, then work backward. Once you've found the pauses with some certainty, as well as the start and end of each part of the breath cycle, try observing all these points with equal clarity. These tasks engage the mind by giving it a challenge. At first, the sensations seem to come and go so quickly and are so subtle that it's truly a challenge. Yet with practice, these tasks will stabilize your attention on the meditation object. For now, don't worry about observing the breath in a non-verbal, non-discursive, or non-conceptual way. Instead, do anything that helps you follow the breath and clearly identify the various points in the cycle. Silently talk to yourself and think about the breath as much as you want. 
If it's helpful, you can note beginning, end, beginning, end. If you're visually inclined, create a mental image such as a circle expanding and contracting with the breath. Understand, you're not trying to imagine what the breath looks like. Rather, you're using an image to help you follow the sensations. The image should be driven by the sensations, not superimposed on them. If you're more kinesthetically inclined, imagine some type of motion corresponding to the breath cycle, such as your body expanding and contracting. As your perception grows sharper and you can clearly identify all the points in the breath cycle, it becomes less challenging and your interest fades. Remember, willpower is not very effective for anything in meditation, including sustaining attention, so the mind must find further challenges to stay actively engaged. The next challenge is to observe as many different sensations as possible during the course of each in and out breath, and to discern the pauses as clearly as possible. Quick Review of Stage 2 Practice The instructions for this stage are simple. You sit down, finish the preparation for practice, make the gradual transition to the sensations of the breath at the tip of the nose, and count ten breaths. Hold the intention to follow and sustain attention on the breath sensations at the nose. Very soon, however, you will find yourself forgetting the breath and mind-wandering, sometimes for seconds and sometimes for many minutes. Eventually, you'll abruptly wake up to the fact that even though you intended to watch the breath, you've been thinking about something else. Feel happy and pleased about this aha moment of introspective awareness. Then gently direct attention back to the breath. To engage more fully with the meditation object, practice following the breath. As long as you appreciate the moment of waking up to mind-wandering, diligently return attention to the object, and fully engage with it, you're on the right track. If you sit through the entire session without getting discouraged, and if you keep returning to the breath when your mind wanders, consider your meditation a total success. You'll probably be surprised at how quickly your powers of perception sharpen up. This is the first change you'll experience as your mind starts growing stronger. Later, as you become more mindful, you'll no longer need the mental words, images, and games, and, in fact, they become obstacles. So let them fall away naturally when they're no longer useful. This may not happen completely until well into stage four or even the start of stage five. In the meantime, don't hesitate to use these techniques as long as they help. Focusing on the Meditation Object Without Losing Peripheral Awareness Stages 1 through 4 aim at gaining more stability of attention. Beginning meditators often try to stabilize attention by focusing intensely on the breath and pushing everything else out of awareness. Don't do this. Don't try to limit peripheral awareness. Instead, to cultivate mindfulness, do just the opposite. Allow sounds, sensations, thoughts, and feelings to continue in the background. Be careful of the tendency to become so closely focused on the breath that peripheral awareness collapses. If that happens, you'll forget the breath more easily. But if you maintain peripheral awareness, you'll eventually learn to notice potential distractions when they arise, and attention is less likely to be captured. If one of these background distractions does momentarily capture attention, simply let it be while redirecting attention back to the meditation object. The approach is always the same. Let it come, let it be, and let it go. Learn to accept these distractions, recognizing that they will go away by themselves, only to be replaced by others. Stay on task while staying relaxed. Just enjoy the process. The meditation object will not always be at the center of attention. In stages one through three, you train the mind so that by stage four, the meditation object is never completely lost from attention. But at this stage, it doesn't matter if the breath is at the center of attention or somewhere in the background. Always feel satisfied with any stretch of time where the meditation object remains in the field of conscious awareness. 
During these early stages, your awareness will include a whole range of other objects, such as sounds, thoughts, feelings, and bodily sensations. Expect your attention to alternate between these and the breath. They are all distractions competing for your attention, so don't be surprised when one captures your attention. The meditation object will either slip into the background or drop out of awareness completely. In either case, once you realize this has happened, simply return the focus of your attention to the meditation object. You are not in control of your mind. Mind wandering happens constantly. It's so much a part of our normal experience that we rarely notice, leading us to believe we are the masters of our own minds, in constant control. Meditation shatters that myth pretty quickly. Even the simplest instruction, like keep your attention focused on the breath, reveals how the mind, in a sense, has a mind of its own. Believing we should be in control of the mind only creates problems for our practice. Once we discover how little control we really have, we may even decide something is wrong with the mind, that it's not working the way it should. When we objectify the mind like this, we turn it into a dysfunctional thing. If, on the other hand, we identify the mind with ourself, you may think of yourself as having failed because you can't prevent the mind from wandering. Either view casts mind wandering in an unfavorable light and makes us feel frustrated. Rather than pass judgment, let your meditation practice illuminate what's really going on. There is no self in control of the mind, and therefore nobody to blame. The mind is a collective of mental processes operating either through consensus or through a very temporary dominance of one process over the others. One part of your mind might wear a big hat marked I for a short period, but it has no inherent ability to keep that up for long. Inevitably, some other mental process with a different agenda and different conditioning takes over and becomes the I. If the controlling part of the mind pushes too hard or grows weaker for some reason, then another part of the mind takes control. In short, there is no you who's the boss of your mind. Ultimately, meditation means training a complex, multi-part system the mind, to work cooperatively, coherently, and consistently through a shared consensus toward common goals. If you can embrace that fact and let go of the notions of I, me, and my mind, your practice will go much more smoothly. Calming the Monkey Mind Monkey Mind describes an especially agitated state where attention jumps rapidly from one thing to the next, like an excited monkey. This is quite different from mind-wandering, which happens at a slower pace. With Monkey Mind, you'll notice attention doesn't stay anywhere for more than a few seconds, moving from the breath to sounds to sensations to thoughts to memories, then maybe back to the breath again. This, too is different from mind-wandering, where you can get lost for long periods in a single thought or chain of thoughts. While monkey mind may also keep returning to a troublesome issue, it will only stay there for a moment before it goes back to wildly swinging from thought to sensation to image. This constant movement of the mind makes you feel restless and must be dealt with differently than ordinary mind-wandering. The antidote that calms monkey mind is to become grounded in the body. This means expanding the space in which you allow attention to move, to include the entire body, and, if needed, the other senses as well. In other words, return to step one or two of the gradual four-step transition to the meditation object described in stage one. The agitation of monkey mind is due to thoughts and emotions— so, body awareness works by shifting attention and awareness away from the contents and activities of the mind. Some grounding techniques include scanning the sensations of the body part by part, attending to any strong bodily sensation, evoking whole body awareness, or becoming aware of other sensations, like sounds. The basic rule for training the mind in meditation is to always intentionally select the locus of attention— that is, you must intentionally choose the area 
that is, breath sensations, bodily sensations, thoughts, or some combination, you want attention restricted to. Every practice for achieving stable attention is based on this principle. With monkey mind, attention is constantly moving, so you finesse the situation by intentionally expanding this area. You let the mind keep moving, but only within the boundaries that you've intentionally set. Instead of trying to hold the monkey still, you give it a larger cage to move in. Overcoming Impatience and Cultivating Joy It's inevitable that fairly soon you'll get impatient and think, this isn't working, there must be an easier way, or I could be doing something better with my time. These thoughts and feelings arise because something you wanted, hoped for, or expected hasn't happened. For instance, you may have thought that after a period of diligent practice, you'd be at stage three. Instead, you find your attention isn't very stable, and there's still a lot of mind-wandering going on. Disappointment that meditation isn't meeting your expectations gets combined with worldly desire for some alternative form of gratification. Unfulfilled expectations and waning enthusiasm bring boredom, which amplifies any aversion you feel toward physical or mental discomfort. As the mind focuses on these negative results, doubts may arise. The end result is the insidious and pervasive emotional state of impatience. We tend to identify with it, thinking, I am impatient, which helps sustain it, undermines our motivation, and triggers other unhelpful thoughts like, I'm just too impatient to meditate today. However, these thoughts and feelings are actually caused by something else going on behind the scenes. That is, impatience is really the result of deeper, unconscious conflicts occurring in the mind. Remember that the mind is not a single thing, but rather a collective of many different mental processes. Each has its own purpose and goals, but all try to serve the happiness and well-being of the whole. When you're dissatisfied with your practice, it creates doubt and uncertainty, causing different parts of the mind to urge you toward other sources of gratification. Once these mental processes are no longer unified around the intention to meditate, internal conflict develops. One part of the mind may want to meditate, while others want to ponder, plan, or fantasize. These different minds share the same goal, personal satisfaction and happiness. But, because your expectations have been disappointed, they disagree on how best to achieve that happiness. A mind in conflict and disharmony prevents us from establishing a relaxed, alert, and peaceful meditative state. If you keep trying to meditate with this divided and therefore less effective mind, it just leads to more disappointment and doubt ultimately making you even more impatient. You have set up a disharmony, dissatisfaction, impatience, feedback loop. The less harmony among the different parts of the mind, the more dissatisfaction and impatience you'll feel. And the more impatience, the greater the disharmony as different minds keep pressing harder for alternatives to meditation. And on it goes. Usually, we try to resolve the internal conflict in one of two unskillful ways. We give in and do something else, or we try to force the mind to comply. But when one part of the mind tries to force itself on other parts, this only creates a struggle that feels like an exercise of willpower, and willpower can never succeed in overcoming this kind of internal resistance. As one part of the mind tries harder and harder to rule the roost, the struggle only increases, feeding the disharmony, dissatisfaction, impatience cycle. The best way to avoid or resolve impatience is to enjoy your practice. While this isn't always easy, a good start is to consistently focus on the positive rather than the negative aspects of your meditation. Notice when the body is relaxed and comfortable, or when the mind is focused and alert. Seek out and acknowledge these rewarding aspects— no matter how unimportant they seem. Savor a fleeting sensation of physical pleasure, the satisfaction of following a whole breath cycle, or the sense of accomplishment that comes with just sitting down and making the effort to meditate. As these pleasurable feelings grow stronger, relish and encourage them so they grow stronger still. Also, 
Remember that impatience is only an emotion. Don't identify with it by thinking, I am impatient. Regard it as just one more feeling that arises and passes away, thinking to yourself, impatience is arising. Seek out the positive qualities of your present moment experience. Follow the sensations of the breath as best you can, and simply observe impatience when it arises without getting caught up in it. And count not getting caught up in impatience as another success. Use the same strategy when you face the problems of forgetting or mind-wandering. Focus on the only event that's really important, which is that you woke up to whatever was going on. Then return to following the breath, accepting whatever happens and feeling happy with every success, which will lead to more satisfaction and further success. Always recall that success comes through repetition with a relaxed attitude, rather than from effortful striving. By making meditation satisfying and enjoyable, the part of the mind that wants to meditate can get the other parts to stop resisting and join in. Mental processes come into harmony. As the mind becomes more unified, there's less internal conflict. Attention grows more stable, and feelings of pleasure and happiness increase. As they increase, the different mental processes come into greater and greater harmony until the mind enters a state of joy, creating a harmony-joy feedback loop, the opposite of the disharmony-dissatisfaction-impatience loop. Bringing the different parts of the mind into harmony is crucial for achieving one of the major goals of meditation, unification of mind. Therefore, in each stage, cultivate peace, contentment, happiness, and joy at every opportunity. Also, create these feelings in every wholesome way you can in daily life, and bring this joy to your practice. A Formula for Success in Meditation Here's a formula you should commit to memory to make joy and relaxation a natural part of your practice. Relax and look for the joy. Observe. Let it come, let it be, and let it go. Recite it every time you sit, especially when you catch yourself thinking meditation is difficult. Relax means let go of any mental or physical tension as soon as you become aware of it. Look for the joy means notice the pleasant aspects of the practice in every moment. Negative thoughts and feelings are inevitable, but you don't need to get caught up in them and let them color your practice. Even when you have pain somewhere, there will always be a pleasant feeling elsewhere. Likewise, feelings of peace, satisfaction, and happiness are often present. Hold them in awareness so they become a regular part of your conscious experience. Observe means be aware of what's happening in the moment without reacting, rejecting, or clinging to anything. Whether attention is stable or scattered, if restlessness arises or dullness sets in, if the mind is clear and calm, or if some distracting thoughts keep surfacing, just observe what is, and don't judge. Let it come, let it be, and let it go, was described in stage one and means exactly what it says. No matter what thoughts or feeling arise, don't suppress or struggle against them or let them take you away from the practice. They'll disappear on their own in time. Conclusion Consider every obstacle an opportunity to learn about the mind. If you practice diligently every day, it won't be long before you have strengthened introspective awareness until periods of mind-wandering become fairly brief. You can quickly but gently direct attention back to the meditation object, and you can sustain attention on the meditation object for longer periods of time. If you don't notice your attention improving much during a single session, trust that it will in the next few days and weeks of practice. If you simply follow these instructions, it will occur on its own, as surely as night follows day. You have mastered this stage when you can consistently maintain your focus on the meditation object for minutes, while mind-wandering lasts only seconds. Stage 3. Extended Continuity of Attention and Overcoming Forgetting 3. The goal for stage three is to overcome forgetting and falling asleep. 
set your intention to invoke introspective attention frequently, before you've forgotten the breath or fallen asleep, and make corrections as soon as you notice distractions or dullness. Also, intend to sustain peripheral awareness while engaging with the breath as fully as possible. These three intentions and the actions they produce are simply elaborations of those from stage two. Once they become habits, you'll rarely forget the breath. Practice Goals for Stage 3 You begin Stage 3 with longer periods of sustained attention to the breath. The mind still wanders sometimes, but not for as long. Just keep practicing what you learned in Stage 2, and mind wandering will eventually stop completely. The main goal for this stage is to overcome forgetting. To do this, you'll use the techniques of following the breath and connecting to actively engage with the meditation object and extend periods of uninterrupted attention, and you'll cultivate introspective awareness through the practices of labeling and checking in. These techniques allow you to catch distractions before they lead to forgetting. You will also learn to deal with the pain and drowsiness that often arise at this stage. You have mastered stage three when you no longer forget the breath. This is also the first milestone achievement, continuous attention to the meditation object. How Forgetting Happens Our field of conscious awareness contains much more than just the meditation object. It also includes an awareness of bodily sensations and things in our surroundings, as well as a constant stream of thoughts and feelings. Any of these is a potential distraction. But an actual distraction is one that competes with the meditation object for your attention. When attention alternates between the breath and a sound, thought, feeling, or bodily sensation, flickering even briefly between the two, it's a distraction. There are typically several such distractions in your field of conscious awareness at any one time. You might not notice these movements of attention because they're so rapid. Nevertheless, this alternating attention creates a scattering of attention to distractions. These are the distractions that potentially cause forgetting. There are two distinct types of distractions, subtle and gross. The difference between the two is the amount of time attention is on the distraction versus the breath. When less time is spent on the distraction and the meditation object remains the primary focus of attention, it's called a subtle distraction. These subtle distractions, along with peripheral awareness, are what make up the background of conscious experience. However, if one of these distractions takes center stage, occupying your attention for most of the time and causing the meditation object to slip into the background, it becomes a gross distraction. As you follow the breath, attention alternates between the breath and a constantly changing variety of subtle distractions in the background. Sooner or later, a subtle distraction comes along that's engaging enough to displace the meditation object as your primary focus of attention. At that moment, the subtle distraction becomes a gross distraction, and the meditation object slips into the background. At first, your attention will alternate between the gross distraction and the meditation object. Yet, because the distraction is more compelling than the breath, your attention becomes increasingly focused on it. Eventually, attention stops returning to the meditation object altogether. Even without any attention, the breath may linger in peripheral awareness for a little while. But the longer the gross distraction occupies your attention, the more the breath fades, until you forget it entirely. Forgetting often happens gradually. But if the distracting thought or sensation is highly charged, attention can get captured quickly and intensely, and the meditation object disappears at once from consciousness. Still, whether it happens quickly or slowly, the result is the same. You forget about the breath, and you also forget what you were doing. Then, once attention tires of that distraction, it moves on to something else. Mind-wandering begins. Overcoming Forgetting You overcome forgetting by catching distractions before they cause you to forget. 
To do this, you first need to extend the periods of attention to the breath so you can look introspectively at the mind and see what's happening. Extended periods of stable attention are achieved using the technique of following the breath from stage two. However, in this stage, you'll look at the breath sensations in much greater detail and will learn the related technique of connecting. The other key to overcoming forgetting is cultivating introspective awareness. This allows you to see the distractions that are about to make you forget the breath. The practices of labeling and checking in will develop this ability. Think of the untrained mind as a turbulent sea. Attention to the breath is like an anchor, making the raft we float on steady enough to stand on and look out from. When we can't hold our attention for more than a few breaths, our anchor isn't secure and the raft is shaky. Before we know it, we get swept away by a wave. Yet if we can hold our focus longer, making the raft more stable, we can see an approaching wave and maneuver in a way that lessens or avoids its impact. This analogy is helpful for understanding how extended periods of attention, along with introspective awareness, allow us to correct for distractions before they cause forgetting. Sustaining Attention Through Following and Connecting Following and connecting are tools you'll use over many stages to develop greater vividness, clarity, and stability of attention. At this stage, you use them to sustain attention on the meditation object for longer periods without losing peripheral awareness. Both methods give the mind a series of simple tasks to perform or games to play that make following the breath more interesting. This helps counter the tendency for attention to abandon the breath for something else. Following and connecting should always be done in a relaxed manner, rather than with driven intensity. Following As you progress through the stages, you will follow the breath with ever closer attention in pursuit of ever more detail. In stage two, this meant identifying the beginning and end of both the in and out breaths, as well as the pauses separating the two. Your first goal in stage three, if you haven't reached it already, is to discern each of these with equal clarity. When you try to perceive all parts of the breath equally, it may feel like you're somehow forcing the breath to make some parts stand out more clearly. Indeed, the breath will change as a result of your observation. When you consciously intend to discern certain features more clearly, unconscious mental processes try to help by exaggerating the breath. This is perfectly all right, as long as you don't do it intentionally. This is a subtle but important point. If you didn't deliberately and consciously alter your breath, don't fall into the common trap of taking ownership of something you didn't do. When the breath changes due to unconscious processes, even though it suits our conscious purposes, you didn't do it, so don't interfere. Just notice that it has changed, and keep observing everything passively and objectively, letting the breath continue as is. The sensations may also grow weaker, or even disappear from one nostril, or alternate between nostrils. This, too, is completely normal, and you don't need to do anything but notice it. Once you can perceive all major points in the breath cycle clearly and vividly, you need a bigger challenge. Next, you'll practice recognizing the individual sensations that make up each in and out breath. First, carefully observe the sensations between the beginning and end of the in-breath until you can recognize three or four distinct sensations every time. Continue to observe the rest of the breath cycle just as clearly as before. When you can consistently recognize several sensations with every in-breath, do the same with the out-breath. Your intention will be to follow the breath with vividness and clarity, and to be aware of very fine details. If you miss the mark, don't worry. You always have the next breath to work with. With practice, the number of sensations you recognize will increase. It's possible to consistently identify between four and maybe a dozen or more sensations with each in-breath, and a somewhat smaller number for each out-breath. The sensations are subtler. 
However, that doesn't mean you'll necessarily observe that many. The actual number of sensations you can perceive isn't that important. What matters is that your perception grows sharper and that you stay interested in and attentive to the breath. As you progress, you may, if necessary, keep increasing the level of detail so the mind stays actively engaged. Even as you engage more closely with the breath, it's very important to also maintain extrospective awareness. This may not be easy. When you focus closely, the mind naturally tends to drop awareness of bodily sensations and external stimuli. Don't let this happen, because you'll become more vulnerable to both forgetting and drowsiness. Furthermore, emphasizing both attention and peripheral awareness at the same time increases the total power of consciousness. More conscious power is the key to making progress in later stages. Finally, when you allow for the full range and content of awareness, there's great potential for insight, even at these early stages. You're not only observing the breath, but watching and learning from the activity of your mind as a whole. Connecting Once you can clearly discern and easily follow the sensations of the breath, we may need a new challenge to engage your attention. This is why we introduce connecting here, even though it's a more advanced technique. Connecting is an extension of following that involves making comparisons and associations. As you follow the entire breath cycle, begin connecting by observing the two pauses closely and notice which is longer and which is shorter. Next, compare the in and out breaths to each other. Are they the same lengths or is one longer than the other? When you can compare the lengths clearly, expand the task to include relative changes over time. Are the in and out breaths longer or shorter than they were earlier? If the in-breath was longer than the out-breath, or vice versa, is that still the case? Are the pauses between the in- and out-breaths longer or shorter than they were? Is the longer of the two pauses still the same as before? Once you reach stages four and five, your introspective awareness will have improved enough that you can start connecting the details of the breath cycle to your state of mind. When you find the mind agitated, and there are more distractions, ask yourself, is the breath longer or shorter, deeper or shallower, finer or coarser than when the mind is calm? What about the length or depth of the breath during a spell of drowsiness? Do states of agitation, distraction, concentration, and dullness affect the out-breath more or in a different way than they do the in-breath? Do they affect the pause before the in-breath more or less than they affect the pause before the out-breath? In making these kinds of comparisons, you're not just investigating the breath to sharpen and stabilize your attention. You're also learning another way to detect and become more fully aware of subtle and changing states of mind. You'll continue using following and connecting in stages four and five, so don't set your expectations too high right now. You may even find connecting isn't particularly useful at this stage. We describe it here only because there are some who will benefit from using it sooner. Following and Connecting in Silence In Stage 2, I said it can be helpful to use mental self-talk when following the breath. By now you've noticed that a lot of the mental activity takes the form of inner dialogue. Like a sports commentator discussing the plays in a game, mental talk becomes a way to follow the movement of attention and gauge the quality of awareness. Yet you may have also noticed that self-talk can cause problems. It's slippery, like quicksilver, flowing from investigating the breath to some other associated topic, then on to another. Suddenly you've gone down the rabbit hole of mind-wandering. Therefore, even though occasional self-talk is fine, it's best at this stage to start cutting back on verbal commentary and to appreciate the peaceful silence surrounding the breath. You'll discover you can still follow what's happening, and that you're able to think about the meditation object non-verbally. Cultivating Introspective Awareness Through Labeling and Checking In So far, you've worked on developing extrospective awareness, and you want to sustain that. Now it's time to start cultivating introspective awareness as well. 
With introspective awareness, you are aware of what's happening in your mind as you continue to focus attention closely on the breath. You will train and strengthen your capacity for introspective awareness through the practices of labeling and checking in. Labeling Up to now, you've relied on spontaneous introspective awareness, or what we've called the aha moment, to alert you to forgetting and mind-wandering. When you positively reinforce these spontaneous realizations, awareness learns to catch mind-wandering faster and faster, so that now your mind only wanders for a few seconds. However, your awareness probably isn't strong enough for you to recall what distraction was occupying your attention before your aha moment. You have enough conscious power to wake up, but not enough to know what was going on in the mind. It's like when someone suddenly asks you what you're thinking about, but you just can't remember. To strengthen introspective awareness, use labeling to practice identifying the distraction in the very moment you realize you're no longer on the breath. For example, if you catch yourself thinking about your next meal or something that happened yesterday, give the distraction a neutral label, such as thinking, planning, or remembering. Simple, neutral labels are less likely to cause further distractions by getting you caught up in the labeling. If there was a series of thoughts, only label the most recent one. Also, always avoid analyzing distractions, which only creates more distraction. Once you've labeled the distraction, gently direct your attention back to the breath. Often the last thing you were thinking about when you woke up from mind-wandering wasn't what initially took you away from the breath. However, as mind-wandering happens less often, the distraction you identify and label in that moment will be the same one that caused you to forget. Eventually, the practice of labeling will strengthen your introspective awareness enough so you can consistently identify which distractions are most likely to steal your attention in the first place. Introspective awareness will eventually be strong enough to alert you to a distraction before forgetting happens. Checking in the second part of cultivating introspective awareness involves checking in using introspective attention. Instead of waiting for introspective awareness to arise spontaneously, as you've done until now, you intentionally turn your attention inward to see what's happening in the mind. Doing this check-in requires longer periods of stable attention. That's why following and connecting are so important at this stage. These techniques give you more stable attention, making it easier to momentarily shift attention and see what's happening in the mind. Yes, checking in disrupts your focus on the breath, but when you pause to reflect on everything happening in your mind, attention needs to shift. At this stage, this is not only completely okay, it's actually the key to cultivating introspective awareness. What you're really doing is training and strengthening introspective awareness by using attention, making awareness of the mind's activity a habit. Remember from the first interlude that peripheral awareness filters through an enormous amount of information and selects what's relevant for attention. But attention also trains peripheral awareness to know which things are important. For example, if you take an interest in sports cars, after a while, every sports car catches your eye. In this case, if you take attentive interest in what's happening in your mind, in particular whether or not gross distractions are present, you're training awareness to alert you to their presence. Checking in not only strengthens introspective awareness, but also allows you to correct for gross distraction before it causes forgetting. It's like you're intentionally shifting your attention to take a snapshot of the mind's current activity to see if some distraction is about to make you forget. When you notice a gross distraction, tighten up attention on the breath to prevent forgetting. It may also help to take a moment to label the distraction before returning to the breath. Always check in very gently and briefly, turning your attention inward to evaluate how much scattering was just occurring. Is gross distraction present? If so, you know you are about to forget the breath. When you recognize a gross distraction before it completely captures your attention, return your attention to the breath and sharpen up your focus. That will keep you from forgetting. 
Sometimes just identifying a gross distraction as a gross distraction is enough to make it dissipate. If it doesn't, engage with the breath as fully as you can, until it does. If it keeps returning, just keep repeating this simple process. Train yourself to check in regularly with introspective attention. To start, try every half-dozen breaths or so, but don't start counting them. Checking in should become a habit. Each time you check in with attention, you strengthen the power and consistency of introspective awareness. Also, the more often checking in leads to discovering gross distraction and tightening up your focus, the less often you will forget the breath. Putting the Practices Together Each practice, by itself, strengthens introspective awareness, but they also work together to overcome forgetting. The labeling of distractions trains awareness to know which distractions to watch out for in the future when you're checking in. You could say labeling teaches introspective awareness to recognize the faces of your abductors, those dangerous distractions that steal your attention and cause you to forget. When checking in, you can also use labeling. If you check in and notice that a distracting thought, memory, or emotion was about to take you away, you can give it a simple label and re-engage with the breath until the distraction fades. But remember, you aren't trying to eliminate distractions entirely from awareness. As long as they stay in the background, let them come, let them be, and let them go. If you practice diligently, by the time you reach stage four, you'll have completely stable attention— and be able to keep watch over the entire horizon of the mind with introspective awareness. Pain and Discomfort As we start sitting longer, pain and other unpleasant sensations, such as numbness, tingling, and itching, appear. Our bodies aren't used to staying still. When we're fairly stationary in daily life, we still move and fidget. Even when sleeping, we constantly change positions to stay comfortable. The good news is it gets easier to sit still over time. The better news is that eventually you won't have any physical discomfort at all. In fact, sitting still becomes so deliciously pleasant that it takes an act of will to move. But getting accustomed to true stillness takes time and practice. Therefore, always make yourself as comfortable as possible— and adjust your posture to minimize discomfort. When unpleasant sensations arise, ignore them as long as you can. Resist the urge to move for relief. When the discomfort becomes too much to ignore, turn your attention toward the pain and make it the focus of your attention. Remember, when training the mind, you always want to intentionally choose the focus of your intention— so, whenever a distraction grows too strong to ignore, whether it's pain in the body or the sound of a jackhammer outside the window, you purposely make it into your meditation object. Observe the unpleasant sensation without moving for as long as you can. If it disappears or decreases enough to be ignored, return to the sensations of the breath. If, instead, the urge to move becomes irresistible, decide in advance when you'll move for example, at the end of the next out-breath, exactly what movement you'll make, for example, move your leg or raise your hand to scratch the itch, and then be very observant as you perform that movement. After you move, the discomfort often returns quickly or reappears elsewhere. When you see this keeps happening, you'll become less concerned with moving because you realize there's no point. It becomes easier to stay with the pain and investigate it longer. We'll discuss meditating with pain and discomfort more in Stage 4, when they're even more distracting. For now, just remember that by meditating on these harmless sources of pain, we gain insight into the nature of desire and aversion by watching how resistance and impatience create suffering. As you progress, you will discover a profound truth. In life, as in meditation, physical pain is unavoidable but suffering of every kind is entirely optional. Dullness and Drowsiness Once you start to have longer periods of stable attention, you will face the problem of drowsiness and falling asleep. 
Why does dullness arise right when our concentration starts to improve? The first reason is that when we meditate, we intentionally turn the mind inward. But we've been conditioned our entire life to associate turning inward with going to sleep. The second is that as we succeed in taming the mind and calming its normal state of relative agitation, the overall energy level drops. There is a famous Buddhist simile of training a young elephant by tethering it to a stake. At first the elephant lunges in every direction, trying to escape. When it realizes it can't, it lies down and goes to sleep. In the same way, as we tether the mind to the meditation object, we restrain its natural tendency to seek stimulation, and it falls asleep. As with the elephant, the untrained mind needs stimulation to stay awake. Dullness in meditation comes in many different degrees, ranging from strong dullness, such as drowsiness, to subtler forms, like feeling a bit spaced out. Drowsiness often makes an appearance at this stage. As with distraction, dullness is another form of scattered attention. But while distraction scatters attention to other objects of awareness, dullness scatters attention to a void in which nothing is perceived at all. The dullness and drowsiness we are concerned with here are due specifically to meditation practice and need to be clearly distinguished from dullness due to other causes. Obviously, if you're fatigued by mental or physical stress, illness, or lack of sleep, you'll be sleepy during meditation. So regard a good night's rest as an important part of your practice. When you meditate also makes a difference. Most people get drowsy after eating or strenuous physical activity. And the early part of the afternoon or late evening can be sleepy times as well. If you're well rested and have taken all these other factors into account but still find yourself getting drowsy, you'll know it's dullness related to meditation. Working with Drowsiness In meditation, drowsiness usually leads to brief moments of sleep. Within a few seconds of falling asleep, postural muscles relax, and your head nods or your body starts to fall. Then you wake up with a sudden jerk as muscle reflexes pull you upright, the so-called Zen lurch. Of course, if you're lying down or sitting in a comfortable chair, you might sleep for a long time. This is why you shouldn't meditate in these positions, unless arthritis or some other health condition absolutely requires it. If you've just jerked awake, within a short time you'll probably feel dullness setting in again, like a heavy cloak. When this happens, you have a great opportunity to investigate how dullness develops and turns into drowsiness. If you closely observe what happens, you'll notice that coming out of drowsiness is distinctly unpleasant. You would probably prefer to stay there. However, by resisting the urge and returning to the practice, you'll usually experience a comfortable state where you can still follow the breath, though without the same intensity or vividness or clarity as before. This is called subtle dullness. It eventually leads to strong dullness, in which attention still clings to the breath, but the focus is weak and diffuse, and the sensations vaguely perceived. The drowsiness that precedes falling asleep feels like trying to see through dense fog, the breath often becomes distorted, transformed by dreamlike imagery, and nonsensical thoughts start drifting through the mind. Eventually, you do fall asleep. Working with subtle dullness as it arises can be quite productive, but struggling against strong dullness that's already present doesn't work well. So, if you're drowsy or have already dozed off during a session, you must first rouse the mind out of dullness. Then you can work with dullness as it starts to return. Here are a few antidotes, roughly in order of strength, from mild to strongest, for rousing the mind from dullness. Take three or four deep breaths, filling the lungs as much as possible, and hold for a moment. Then exhale as forcefully and completely as possible through tightly pursed lips. Tense all the muscles in your body until you begin to tremble slightly. Then relax. Repeat several times. Meditate while standing up. Do walking meditation. 
Worst case scenario, get up, splash cold water on your face, then go back to practicing. These work because they stimulate you, not only physically, but mentally as well, by increasing the flow of external stimuli into your mind. In general, always do whatever is necessary to re-energize yourself back to a state of alert awareness. When drowsiness returns quite soon after you've roused yourself, it's called sinking, which feels like being caught in mental quicksand. Sinking is a sure sign that you didn't re-energize the mind enough. Keep using stronger antidotes until the drowsiness doesn't return for at least several minutes, but try not to do more than necessary, or you'll create a state of agitation. Now that you have roused your mind, keep it alert and energized by making sure your extraspective awareness doesn't collapse. Recall that dullness results from turning the mind too far inward and losing energy from lack of stimulation. If you find that focusing on the breath is causing extraspective awareness to fade, you can correct this by expanding awareness to include bodily sensations, sounds, and so forth, while not losing attention on the breath. However, you can also let the breath become secondary to a state of expanded, all-encompassing awareness for a little while. When you feel alert again, bring the focus of attention back to the sensations at the tip of the nose. You're looking for a balance between being too inward and too outward directed. Another way to keep the mind energized is through intention. Holding a strong, conscious intention to clearly perceive the breath sensations while also sustaining peripheral awareness will keep the mind energized. The intention should be set before the sensations actually appear. This keeps you attentive. But don't project too far ahead. For instance, set your intention at the pause before the out-breath to observe the very beginning of the out-breath. At the beginning of the out-breath, set the intention to observe sensations near the middle, and at the middle, set your intention to discern the end of the out-breath. Do the same for the in-breath. This close-up investigation takes practice. However, it energizes the mind and keeps you engaged enough so you don't as easily slip into drowsiness. Remember, it's always best to recognize and correct for dullness before it gets too strong. Introspective attention and eventually introspective awareness are what alert you to dullness before you get drowsy and fall asleep. So each time you check in for gross distractions, look for dullness as well. Also, keep in mind that your intention isn't just to get rid of sleepiness, but to learn about the nature of dullness. Therefore, Follow the breath, and when dullness arises, consider it an opportunity to learn and practice. In time, through effort and training, dullness will naturally disappear. Conclusion You have mastered stage three when forgetting and mind-wandering no longer occur, and the breath stays continually in conscious awareness. This is a whole new pattern of behavior for your mind. The mind still roams but it's tethered to the meditation object, never getting too far away. The unconscious mental processes that sustain attention never entirely let go of the meditation object. Because attention no longer shifts automatically to objects of desire and aversion, you can purposely hold your attention on an emotionally neutral object like the breath for extended periods of time. The ability to continuously sustain attention on the meditation object is remarkable, so take satisfaction in your accomplishment. You can now do something that most people can't, something you may not have thought you were even capable of. Congratulations. You have reached the first milestone achievement and the real beginning of skilled meditation. Third Interlude How Mindfulness Works the practice of mindfulness leads to both psychological healing and profound spiritual insights. To understand how, we first need to look at the role of the mind in the formation of personality. Who we are today was shaped by our past. The imprints of past experiences exert a powerful influence on our emotional reactions and behavior in the present. Usually, we're not even aware of their effect. Think about how much of daily life actually consists of mindless, automatic behaviors driven by unconscious conditioning. 
Of course, these are intermingled with intentional actions. If an automatic response isn't immediately available, we have to consciously decide what to do or say. But even these conscious choices are strongly influenced by conditioned mental states, feelings, and what are sometimes called intuitions, deeply held views about people, ourselves, the world, moral values, and the very nature of reality. All this conditioning serves as a powerful but completely unconscious influence guiding conscious decision-making processes in unseen ways. Unconscious conditioning is like a collection of invisible programs. These programs were set in motion, often long ago, by conscious experiences. Our reactions to those experiences, our thoughts, emotions, speech, and actions, may have been appropriate at the time. The problem is they've become programmed patterns, submerged in the unconscious, that don't change. They lie dormant until they're triggered by something in the present. When that happens, we often get so focused on the triggering event and our own emotions that these unconscious programs don't take in any new information about the current situation. That's why they don't change. The practice of mindfulness works because it provides new information to these programs. But how much reprogramming happens depends on our degree of mindfulness. In other words, mindfulness has different levels of application. At its most basic level, mindfulness is simply about moderating behavior. The magic of mindfulness, its power to transform you as a person, only starts working when we move beyond the first level. At the second level, by maintaining more powerful mindfulness for longer periods in daily life, we become less reactive and more intentionally present. The third level entails reprogramming the deep conditioning that has shaped our personality and only occurs in meditation. The fourth level is the radical reconditioning of the innate tendencies that create all our suffering and only occurs through insight experience. Level 1. Moderating Behavior Over and over, specific situations in daily life happen to trigger our programmed patterns of behavior. For example, if your partner, or even a stranger, says something that pushes one of your buttons, you may become angry or annoyed. Without mindfulness, we react emotionally, instead of responding rationally and intentionally. Often, we just create more problems for ourselves. At the very least, we end up in a bad mood and become less effective at whatever we're doing. But if we can stay mindful, we'll also be calmer and not react as quickly or be so distracted by our own emotions. This allows us to be more attentive to our feelings and aware of the situation and the potential consequences of our actions so we can regulate our behavior in positive ways. Just being aware that our suffering has more to do with our emotional reactions than with what triggered them can help us let go of those negative emotions more easily. Mindfully acknowledging our emotions and taking responsibility for our reactions lets us recognize more options, choose wiser responses, and take control of our behavior. Awareness in the present moment allows us to slow down and change our behavior, but it doesn't make any permanent changes. The next time we're in a similar situation, we'll behave in the same automatic, reactive way. Unless, of course, we're mindful once again. Level 2. Becoming less reactive and more responsive. Everyone would like to make smarter choices. However, healthier responses to life situations are only one of the benefits of attention and awareness working together. The true magic of mindfulness is something completely different, producing extraordinary spiritual and psychological transformations. That's why therapists now use mindfulness training to help treat all kinds of emotional and behavioral problems, such as stress, anger, phobias, compulsive behaviors, eating disorders, addiction, and depression. The magic of mindfulness allows these people to overcome the psychological root of their problems. Thus, people who have cultivated mindfulness are more attuned and less reactive. They have greater self-control and self-awareness, better communication skills and relationships, clearer thinking and intentions, 
and more resilience to change. How does this magic work? When attention isn't so totally captured by the intensity of the moment that awareness fades, we are able to observe ourselves more closely and consistently. Attention and awareness provide the unconscious mind with new, real-time information that is directly relevant to what's happening right now. Unconscious processes are informed that the reactions they're producing aren't appropriate in the current situation, harming more than helping. With this new information, reprogramming can happen at the deepest levels of the unconscious, and the longer we can be mindful in a particular situation, the more new information becomes available, and the more mindfulness can work its magic. However, the magic of mindfulness doesn't end with the event itself. Consciousness can continue to pick up on and communicate the consequences of the event and their effects on our mental state long afterward. So the duration of mindfulness is important, as is consistency. The more consistently we can apply mindfulness to similar situations in the future, the more its magic can change our conditioning. Whenever some event triggers one of our invisible programs, we have the chance to apply mindfulness to the situation so our unconscious conditioning can get reprogrammed. Anytime we're truly mindful of our reactions and their consequences, it can alter the way we will react in the future. Every time we experience a similar situation, our emotional reactions will get weaker and be easier to let go of. We can respond mindfully to the actual situation rather than reacting mindlessly. As we grow less reactive, we are empowered to respond more objectively and conscientiously. Eventually, those skillful qualities become our new conditioning. But what if our emotions and past conditioning are so powerful in the moment that we can't change how we feel and act? That's all right. As long as we stay mindful enough, we give our unconscious processes new information, and we will be more successful in the future. With repeated effort, we will become less reactive, maybe without even realizing it. Even if we lose mindfulness completely in the heat of the moment, we can still use it afterward to reflect on what happened, our reactions, and their impact on ourself and others. By recalling the events vividly, examining them honestly and non-judgmentally, it will begin the process of reprogramming, which in turn makes it easier to stay mindful in the future. This is quite different from what usually happens. Because it's always painful to revisit a situation that made us uncomfortable, we typically like to put it out of our minds. Or, if we can't, we try to justify what we did and place the blame elsewhere. This keeps vital new information from reaching our unconscious mental processes. Mindfully examining our actions also means that we look objectively at our feelings about how we acted. We may see that we feel guilty, for example, and acknowledge that feeling guilty is an unpleasant consequence of our actions. But we shouldn't become submerged in that emotion. If you do find yourself getting caught up in self-reproach, you're just reacting from and reinforcing more unwholesome programming. Of course, it's much harder to stay mindful when it matters most, in difficult situations. That's why we need to intentionally practice mindfulness in everyday life, especially when it's easy, like when you're driving a car or eating a meal. Then you'll build up the skill and the mental muscle to stay mindful in the face of greater challenges. Level 3. Reprogramming Deep Conditioning In daily life, even if we're mindful every moment, unskillful conditioning can only get reprogrammed when something triggers it. So, while it's essential to practice in daily life, mindfulness in formal meditation is even more effective, because we don't have to wait for something to trigger an unconscious program to practice with. Instead, when our minds grow stable and quiet, all kinds of deep memories, thoughts, and emotions that drive our unconscious programs can come to the surface. Then they can be purified by the illuminating power of mindfulness. The reprogramming that occurs in meditation also transforms the way we think, feel, and act in more radical and broadly effective ways. 
That's because the unconscious conditioning that emerges is of a more fundamental nature, driving a wide range of reactive behaviors that would otherwise require many different triggering events. Conditioning of such a fundamental nature usually remains deeply hidden, but can surface in the stillness of meditation. Therefore, the application of mindfulness and meditation can rapidly accomplish much more than ever could be by the piecemeal process of confronting conditioning in daily life. To really understand and appreciate this deep purification of mind, it helps to consider how past experiences shape and condition our lives in the present. Recall that every experience leaves an imprint in our minds. The more emotionally powerful the experience, the stronger the imprint. Most of us have a large backlog of imprints from emotionally charged or traumatic events that don't fit in with the person we've become. These unresolved pieces of our personal history remain deeply buried in the psyche. Often they are too painful or involve too much internal conflict for us to confront and resolve head-on. The events themselves may have been forgotten, but the unconscious conditioning they left behind influences our behavior in ways we often don't recognize. Some of our conditioned reactions may help us, but many don't, and even helpful conditioning can appear at inappropriate times or in inappropriate ways. Consider, for example, the psychological challenges many war veterans face on return to civilian life when previously useful combat training gets in the way of readjusting to the everyday world. This is because whenever our past conditioning is triggered, it creates strong emotions that drive us to behave in specific ways. Each person's conditioned behavior, the way he or she typically acts and reacts, is absolutely unique. In fact, what we call personality is precisely this set of behaviors. And while having personality is a wonderful thing, most people have personality traits that aren't particularly useful. Some traits are simply harmful. But with mindfulness, we can purify that deep conditioning and change our personality for the better. This purification occurs mainly in Stage 4, but also at Stage 7. Level 4. Mindfulness, Insight, and the End of Suffering Unquestionably, the most valuable effect of mindfulness is its ability to radically reprogram our deepest misconceptions about the nature of reality and about who and what we are. Our gut intuition tells us we are separate selves in a world of other people and objects, and that our individual suffering and happiness depend on external circumstances. This may seem like common sense, but it's a misperception that comes from our innate programming and which is continually reinforced by cultural conditioning. As we practice mindfulness, however, we accumulate more and more evidence that things are very different from what we believed. In particular, the thoughts and feelings and memories we associate with a sense of self are seen more objectively revealing themselves to be constantly changing, impersonal, and often contradictory processes occurring in different parts of the mind. These are insight experiences. When mindfulness allows them to sink in on an experiential level, it profoundly reprograms our intuitive view of reality, transforming a person in a wonderful way. If we believe we're separate selves who need certain external things to be happy, we'll spontaneously act out of that territorial feeling, causing harm to ourselves and others. As paradoxical as it may seem, the craving to avoid suffering and pursue pleasure is the actual cause of suffering. But when we let go of our self-centeredness, we automatically act more objectively for the good of everybody in each situation then we will have discovered the true source of happiness and the end of suffering. This is how mindfulness overcomes sorrow and grief and brings release from all the suffering. You may be understandably skeptical about what I'm saying. You may even doubt that such a transformation is desirable. That's all right. Use the illuminating power of mindfulness to explore these very questions. Are you... Your thoughts are you, your feelings. 
Keep asking these questions. As your meditation improves, you will find out for yourself. A Metaphor for the Levels of Mindfulness Here is a metaphor to help you remember the different levels at which mindfulness works. Say you regularly walk in the countryside, along a narrow trail with a thorn bush growing alongside it. As you start practicing mindfulness, you become present enough in daily life to recognize your options and moderate your behavior, so you're able to dodge the thorn bush, keeping your face from getting scratched or having a thorn rip a hole in your shirt. This is the first level of mindfulness. Yet the thorn bush will still be there, and if you aren't mindful tomorrow, you'll get snagged then. In other words, nothing changes in the long term. There is no magic involved in this kind of mindfulness. The magic only starts when mindfulness begins to work at the second level. When you're mindful enough in daily life, and for long enough and often enough, then consciousness can communicate the actual context and consequences of your conditioned reactions to their unconscious sources. This produces real change. It's like trimming the branches of the thorn bush hanging across your path. However, it can take a lot of trimming to clear the path, and new branches are always growing to replace them. This thorn bush has many trunks that grow from a single root. The special magic of the third level of mindfulness, the kind that happens on the cushion, is like cutting off an entire trunk at the root. When it's gone, all its branches and thorns go with it, not just the ones that happen to grow into your immediate path. And every time you purify an aspect of your deep conditioning in meditation, another major trunk is removed. Yet if the tree's root still survives, new trunks can grow back. Unless you remain vigilant, you may find that the path once again becomes overgrown. Only the fourth level of mindfulness, the insight of awakening, will finally destroy the root, meaning the thorn bush never grows back. Stage 4. Continuous Attention and Overcoming Gross Distraction and Strong Dullness 4. The goal for Stage 4 is to overcome gross distraction and strong dullness. Set and hold the intention to be vigilant so that introspective awareness becomes continuous, and notice and immediately correct for strong dullness and gross distraction. Eventually, noticing and correcting become completely automatic. Practice Goals for Stage 4 You begin this stage with a clear sense that your attention is much more stable and continuous, and compared to previous stages, it certainly is. However, your attention still alternates, shifting almost imperceptibly fast to a sound, thought, or feeling, then returning to the breath. The meditation object always remains in attention, but not exclusively. The primary goal at this stage is to overcome the scattering of attention caused by gross distraction and strong dullness. To accomplish this, you need to develop continuous introspective awareness, allowing you to detect these problems, correct them, and return your full attention to the meditation object. While you want to completely overcome the coarser forms of distraction and dullness, you will learn to tolerate and even make use of subtle distractions and subtle dullness. They will help you navigate another important challenge of this stage, learning to identify and sustain a balance between an over-energized, easily distracted mind and a dull, lethargic mind. As your mind grows calmer and more stable in this stage, you will experience a deep purification. Stored unconscious residues from the past well up to the surface and are released. The result is a profound healing. You don't have to do anything to help things along. This purification is a natural process of the mind. Simply allow it to unfold organically. Review of Gross and Subtle Distraction by now you have grown quite familiar with the inner landscape of the mind and are accustomed to how it constantly shifts and changes. 
Physical sensations, thoughts, memories, and emotions continue to arise and pass away in your peripheral awareness. As attention alternates rapidly between the meditation object and these other stimuli, it makes them stand out from the background so they are more prominent than other objects in peripheral awareness. As long as the meditation object remains your primary focus, they are only subtle distractions. But often, one of these competing objects can become your primary focus. When this happens, the sensations of the breath seem to fade. They continue as an object of alternating attention, but are perceived much less clearly. This is gross distraction, the first major obstacle to overcome in this stage. Occasionally, when a particularly strong distraction becomes the center of attention, the breath will slip completely into the background to become an object in peripheral awareness. Strictly speaking, the breath is no longer an object of attention when this happens. But as long as it has not disappeared entirely from consciousness, it is different from the forgetting characteristic of stage three. Learning to Overcome Gross Distraction there is a common misconception that stilling the mind means getting rid of thoughts and blocking out all distractions. Often students try to suppress these by focusing more intensely on the meditation object. This may seem like a reasonable strategy, yet brute force never works for long in meditation. You simply can't force the mind to do something it doesn't want to do. Also, since you have increased your mindfulness throughout the preceding stages, you are more conscious than ever of all the background mental activity, which also makes suppression impossible. Not only will suppressing distractions prove unsuccessful, trying to force exclusive attention on the breath would actually be a big mistake at this stage. Hyper-focused tunnel vision directed at something out there, in this case, the sensations of the breath, is exactly the kind of attention that accompanies the fight-or-flight response. This type of focus is usually accompanied by feelings of tension and anxiety, which would make your meditations agitating, frustrating, and difficult. Also, you may completely lose peripheral awareness, making you even more vulnerable to distractions and dullness. The lesson is, don't try to strong-arm your mind into a state of calm. Relax. Let it happen on its own. At this point in your practice, stilling the mind means reducing the constant movement of attention between the breath and gross distractions. The key to doing this is directing and sustaining attention. However, to succeed, you'll also need strong peripheral awareness so you can notice potential distractions before they actually capture your attention. For example... When you're carrying a full cup of hot tea through a crowded room, you want to sustain your attention on the cup while remaining aware of everything else around you. That way you can avoid a collision. Similarly, keep your primary focus on the breath and simply allow all other sensations and mental events in your peripheral awareness to just be there. Let them come. Let them be. Let them go. There are two steps to learning to overcome gross distractions. The first involves dealing with gross distraction that is already present. Simply continue the practice you learned in Stage 3 to prevent forgetting. Recognize when a gross distraction is present, let go of it, and re-engage with the breath. The second step is a refinement of the first that prevents gross distraction from occurring in the first place. Recognize when a subtle distraction has the potential to become a gross distraction before it happens. Then tighten up your focus on the breath so the subtle distraction doesn't draw you away. Finally, engage with the breath more completely to keep it and all other distractions at bay. In both steps, you use introspective awareness to detect distractions. Then you work with directed attention to make the breath your primary focus, and with sustained attention, to keep it the primary focus of attention. Let's take a closer look at this process. Cultivating Continuous Introspective Awareness 
The role of introspective awareness in these early stages is to help you catch problems so you can apply the appropriate antidote. As you progress, you constantly refine your introspective awareness to recognize increasingly subtle problems. In Stage 2, you relied on spontaneous introspective awareness to recognize mind-wandering. You positively reinforced this aha moment, then gently returned to the breath. In Stage 3, you intentionally used introspective attention by checking in to look for gross distraction and take corrective action before forgetting happened. Using attention this way also trained and strengthened introspective awareness. In Stage 4, you will develop continuous introspective awareness to observe and evaluate all distractions. But there are two drawbacks with using introspective attention to monitor the mind. The first I mentioned in Stage 3. When checking in, you have to disrupt your focus on the breath. That worked then, but it doesn't now, since you're trying to cultivate continuous attention. The other problem concerns what attention sees when turned inward. The object of your introspective attention actually comes from the contents of introspective awareness in the previous moment. Introspective attention can only produce a conceptual snapshot of what was just happening, a kind of delay or echo, whereas introspective awareness is capable of continuously monitoring the mind. This is a rather subtle point. Take some time to think about it, since it has important consequences. Your new goal is to monitor the mind and detect distractions more efficiently, so that you don't interrupt attention. You achieve this by developing an intentional, vigilant, and continuous introspective awareness that alerts you to gross distractions while you remain focused on the breath. In other words, you want your attention to the breath to be a stable anchor as you keep watch over the entire ocean of the mind with introspective awareness. What does this vigilant introspective awareness feel like? Well, you're already somewhat familiar with it. In Stage 3, when you return to the breath after a moment of introspective attention, you may have noticed that the quality of your awareness seemed sharper and clearer for a while. During that time, introspective awareness and attention were more balanced. If you didn't notice, try it now. Take a minute to focus on your breath and stabilize your attention. Then, introspectively, check in on the state of your mind. After a moment, return your attention to the breath. Notice how introspective awareness continues while attention remains on the breath. This is precisely the kind of introspective awareness you need to make stronger and extend until it's always there. Cultivating introspective awareness requires a shift of emphasis. Up to now, you have worked to keep a balance between attention focused on the breath and peripheral awareness of everything else, primarily everything in extrospective awareness. However, now that you have established this balance, you want to start emphasizing the introspective part of peripheral awareness. It's like standing back a bit from the meditation object, just enough to keep the breath at the center of your attention while you take in everything else happening in the mind. You want to strengthen introspective awareness, making it continuous, like a vigilant sentry who alerts you that gross distraction is present or could potentially arise. As you look beyond the meditation object, don't just look at the content of peripheral awareness. Become aware of the activities of the mind itself, movements of attention, the way thoughts, feelings, and other mental objects arise and pass away in peripheral awareness, and any changes in the clarity or vividness of perception. By using the breath as an anchor while you mindfully observe the mind, your watching the mind while the mind watches the breath. This is metacognitive introspective awareness and will come to full fruition by stage eight. Learning to sustain introspective awareness is extremely important for accomplishing the overall goals of meditation. It doesn't just make attention more stable. 
You could do that by simply bringing your attention back to the breath over and over. Rather, by anchoring your attention on the breath while maintaining introspective awareness, what you're doing is cultivating mindfulness. Mindfully observing mental processes also provides a more efficient, useful, and satisfying way to achieve stable attention. It's more efficient because you gain a better understanding of how the mind behaves, and therefore you can work more effectively. It's more useful because you will need this type of introspective awareness for the practices in the upcoming stages. And finally, it's more satisfying because your time isn't spent just plugging away, hoping for some future achievement. Instead, you're constantly engaged in a fascinating and transformative learning process. Directing and Redirecting Attention Whenever you find your mind drawn into gross distraction, just let go and return to the breath. Do this in a gentle, unhurried, and even loving way. Maybe take a moment to appreciate the part of your mind that realizes you have wandered off track. Our natural tendency is to abruptly yank ourselves back to the breath. However, that will actually slow you down in the long run, so let go gently and easily instead. Any annoyance or self-judgment you may feel is just something you have to let go of. By affirming your successes, you will make quicker progress. A happy mind is a more focused mind. Don't worry if a gross distraction persists as a subtle distraction once you have returned to the breath. By just letting it be, it will usually dissipate on its own. Yet letting go and redirecting attention are only the first steps to completely overcoming gross distractions. You must also learn to tighten up your focus on the meditation object before a subtle distraction becomes a gross distraction. However, not all subtle distractions pose the same challenge to stable attention. There are two types that are especially troublesome so you should learn to recognize them. First are the noticeably attractive, subtle distractions. These draw your attention away because they hold some special allure or interest. For instance, you may be hungry and find yourself thinking about your next meal, or you may have a problem at work that keeps nagging at you. The second type of distraction doesn't exert the same kind of pull. Instead, your distraction ends up being diverted because of the manner in which the distraction arises. It sneaks in gradually, eventually displacing your focus. Once again, you need to rely on vigilant and continuous introspective awareness to distinguish these more troublesome, subtle distractions from the rest. When you notice them, you can ward them off by sharpening up your attention to the breath. Persistent Distractions pain, insights, and emotions. Sometimes a strong and persistent distraction just won't allow you to let it come, let it be, and let it go. At this stage, there are three kinds of subtle distractions that often become persistent gross distractions, pain and physical discomfort, interesting, attractive, and seemingly important insights, and emotionally charged memories, thoughts, and visionary experiences. Having to grapple with these overwhelmingly powerful distractions can undo all the satisfaction you felt at finally being able to pay continuous attention to the breath. You may feel impatient or skeptical about the benefits of meditation or your ability to practice. However, you don't need to worry or judge yourself. At this stage, the arising of strong and persistent distractions is actually a sign of progress. You're coming into contact with primal drives, untapped capacities, hidden archetypes, and powerful emotions arising from deeper parts of the mind. Just remember that whether you're dealing with pain, brilliant insights, or powerful emotions, the goal is always the same. To overcome distractions with the right antidote, Re-engage with the breath until attention becomes stable, and cultivate ever stronger introspective awareness. Let's examine these powerful distractions and the methods for dealing with them. Pain and discomfort as a distraction. 
Every meditator must learn to deal with pain, numbness, itching, and other potentially distracting sensations. In this stage, they become much more noticeable. During stage three, you experienced pain and discomfort because you weren't used to sitting still for long periods. Now, pain becomes a way for the mind to resist practicing. Your mind will tend to magnify ordinary discomfort. It will even create painful sensations that have no physical cause, especially during longer sits or meditation retreats. Such pain often disappears once you make it the focus of your attention, only to show up elsewhere a little later. Regardless of its source, pain must now be confronted as part of your practice. Of course, you don't have to seek out pain. And don't suppress or ignore pain that has a definite physical origin. If you suspect your pain may be due to injury or disease but aren't sure, it's best to consult a physician. You wouldn't want your sitting posture to exacerbate any already existing condition, like an arthritic knee or a twisted ankle. You should make yourself as comfortable as possible to keep the body from interfering with training the mind. Use pillows, pads, or anything else to compensate for sensitive areas. Just remember that even with these adjustments, you will still experience unpleasant sensations. You've already learned the basic strategy for dealing with pain. Ignore unpleasant sensations as long as possible, make them your meditation object if they persist, and move mindfully only when absolutely necessary. However, at this stage... You must examine the pain even more thoroughly and wait even longer before moving. Pain is a dynamic sensation with many subtle qualities. Investigate them. Notice if it is sharp, piercing, burning, aching, dull, etc. Notice if the sensation feels solid and unchanging or if it fluctuates in intensity, area, or location. Investigate whether your pain is one sensation or a composite of several. Search within the sensation for the source of the unpleasantness. How much of the pain you're experiencing is inherent in the sensation, and how much is your mind's reaction to the sensation? This kind of in-depth exploration will help you become as objective as possible when dealing with pain. At first, focusing on pain may only seem to intensify it, Yet after sustained investigation, pain often resolves itself. It does so in three ways. Its intensity may fade entirely. It may continue as a strong sensation, but no longer feels particularly painful. Or it may stay painful, but can be effectively disregarded. The reason pain dissipates is because you have stopped resisting and started to accept its presence. Meditation teacher Shinzen Young puts this into a mathematical formula. The amount of suffering, S, you experience, is equal to the actual pain, P, times the mind's resistance, R, to the pain. So S equals P times R. If you stop resisting completely, then R equals zero. Pain multiplied by zero equals zero the suffering you are experiencing totally dissolves. But if you expect this to happen every time, it won't. This is because the expectation that your pain will disappear leads you back toward resistance and non-acceptance. When pain disappears completely, or continues in a form you can ignore, always return to the sensations of the breath. Repeat the entire process as necessary. Sometimes painful sensations just don't go away. When this happens, stay with the pain as your meditation object. Don't be discouraged. You can train the mind just as effectively using pain as you can with the sensations of the breath. In fact, there are certain advantages to using pain. Because it draws your attention so intensely, you're less likely to experience dullness and distraction. Also, because pain generates many thoughts and emotions, it is easier to maintain strong introspective awareness. In other words, pain is quite useful for developing stable attention and powerful mindfulness. Make good use of it.
Unavoidable physical discomfort is also an opportunity to discover the true nature of pain. You will eventually learn to distinguish between physical discomfort as a sensation and the mind's unnecessary reaction to it, which is suffering. In the words of the Buddha, when the uninstructed worldling experiences a painful feeling, he feels two things, a bodily one and a mental one. When the instructed noble disciple experiences a painful feeling, he feels one thing, a bodily one, and not a mental one. Pain disappears completely in the later stages. The Problem of Discursive Brilliance Seemingly brilliant insights are a much more pleasant kind of gross distraction. For instance, you may find new ways of dealing with personal problems, or you may gain insights into your mind and behavior, or into profound philosophical and metaphysical concepts. These insights can emerge unbidden from the unconscious, appearing in peripheral awareness, and tempting you to take notice. Other times, they suddenly spring onto center stage. These insights are often quite valid and very useful, which is what makes them so seductive as potential distractions. Why do they arise now, at this stage? By this time your attention has grown more stable and your mindfulness more powerful. Therefore your mind is better able to create and link novel ideas together and can better appreciate the significance of those ideas. If you choose to pursue thinking about them, keeping your breath in peripheral awareness, you will be pleasantly surprised by how much your powers of discursive thinking have improved. In fact, your focus will be stronger than ever. You will feel excited and satisfied when you reflect on some brilliant conclusion. But then it becomes difficult to return to the breath, which usually leads you to look for something else to think about, or to get up from the cushion altogether. You may also decide that your newly discovered powers of analysis are the real benefit of meditation. If you keep engaging with these insights and thinking them through, then whenever you sit to meditate, compelling issues will arise. You will have trained your mind to make meditation into a kind of personal psychotherapy or a tool for intellectual or artistic creativity. This quickly becomes an entertaining alternative to the sometimes tedious business of training the mind. Your initial insights may indeed be significant, but as your mind continues to dredge up material, their quality will decline. They may seem profound during meditation, but if you examine them afterward, they often appear trivial. In this way, they are a lot like the brilliant ideas that sometimes happen under the influence of recreational drugs. Whether they are significant or trivial, the point is the same. Discursive brilliance quickly becomes a trap drawing you away from the practice again and again. Overcoming this obstacle is easy. Just avoid falling into the trap. If you have meaningful insights, make a mental note of them and resolve to address them after meditating. Return your focus to the breath. It also helps if you resolve to set aside a time specifically for analytical meditation. Done as a distinct form of practice and on a separate occasion, analytical meditation on the bright ideas and insights that come up is extremely useful. Sometimes a powerful thought keeps returning. When this happens, acknowledge and accept it, then make it your temporary meditation object. However, don't analyze its content. Instead, apply a label to the thought. For example, thinking, thinking, or thought arising. This will help you keep an objective distance. Hold the thought in attention until its intensity subsides. This might take a few minutes and need to be repeated several times during the meditation. Once the intensity subsides, return to the breath. You can use this approach in other situations, too. In general, whenever you can't disregard a powerful distraction... Finesse the situation by intentionally making it your new meditation object. Emotions, memories, and visions as distractions. As the mind grows calm and everyday distractions fall away, 
significant material from the unconscious starts to well up into consciousness. This is a very significant event in the progress of your practice. However, this powerful material doesn't always surface right away, but may instead be preceded by strong feelings of restlessness and impatience. They're like the tip of an iceberg, indicating that much more lies just below the surface. So, if you experience restlessness, don't suppress it. Accept it openly, inviting whatever lies below to come up. If restlessness and impatience persist and are too strong to disregard, you will need to use the technique described later for dealing with other strong emotions. When this material does become conscious, it can take two forms. It may appear as memories, thoughts, or visions, accompanied by strong and often difficult emotions, or it can manifest as just the raw emotions themselves, fear, sadness, anger, etc., unaccompanied by any mental object. Because they are unaccompanied, it may seem like these naked emotions have no cause. In this way, they are similar to the nonspecific or free-floating anxiety for which people seek therapy. Yet this is all perfectly normal in meditation. In fact, as we'll explain, it's another sign you're making progress. This disruptive material comes from past emotional and psychological challenges, and the more of these you've faced, the more you'll encounter. Some may be quite traumatic, such as sexual abuse, the loss of a parent, or childhood bullying. But major challenges aren't the only cause. Lesser trials that easily go unrecognized, like teasing, parental favoritism, or the pains of adolescence, play their part as well. Charged, unconscious material will also arise if you've internalized dysfunctional or conflicting belief systems. For example, you may believe in sexual liberation, but still experience inner conflict because of the sexual mores you were taught as a child. Or, you may have a deeply internalized work ethic that makes you feel guilty when you meditate because you think you aren't being productive. In some cases, you'll be quite clear about what created the strong thoughts or emotions, especially if the cause was traumatic. But you may be unaware of the more commonplace and subtle traumas that reinforced this charged material. However, in many instances, these strange thoughts or distressing images may seem to have little or nothing to do with you or with anything you've ever experienced. Yet remember, nothing in meditation is ever random or meaningless. You may not know where some painful emotion or vision came from, but no matter how bizarre or unpleasant it may seem, you can be sure that something in your history caused it. For instance, you may have picked up or embellished a violent image from a movie that you've long forgotten. Whether you know the cause or not isn't important. You can be sure that everything arising during meditation forms part of your psychic makeup. None of it is unimportant or beside the point. Images arise because they symbolize material your mind isn't comfortable confronting more directly. Learn to fully embrace everything that surfaces. They are hidden parts of your psyche. More importantly, understand and rejoice in the fact that when this material comes to the surface, it's an act of purification and a critical step toward developing shamatha. In the stillness of meditation, the magic of mindfulness integrates this difficult content buried in the unconscious in a healthy and healing way. The strategy for dealing with emotions, thoughts, or images is simply to ignore them for as long as you can. Then, just like with pain, when something becomes too strong to disregard, make it your meditation object. Don't resist, avoid, or reject this potent material. It will only go back into the unconscious and resurface again later. Acknowledging, allowing, and accepting are the antidotes to avoiding, resisting, and rejecting. Acknowledge the validity of whatever comes up, even if you don't know its origin. Allow it to be there without analyzing or judging it, while you keep cultivating the standpoint of an objective observer. Last, accept it as a manifestation of some hidden part of yourself. 
It's important not to get bogged down in examining the content of unconscious material. That's time-consuming and can interrupt your progress. How do you learn to handle this charged material objectively without getting caught up in it? First, maintain a strong, clear awareness of where you are and what you're doing, that in this present moment you're safe, secure, and sitting comfortably in meditation. Then isolate the emotional aspect of the experience. If you're having unpleasant memories, for instance, deal first with the emotions that accompany them. Only then will you be able to view those memories objectively and dispassionately enough to accept the past events they depict and let the memories go. In the same way, if you're dealing with disturbing projections from your imagination, you must confront their emotional component before you can accept and let go of the images. And, of course, you have to directly address those raw emotions that sometimes arise with no apparent cause. In every case, address the emotions first. You want to create some objective distance from these unpleasant emotions. Verbalizations are important for this. If you have the thought, I am angry, replace it with the thought, anger is arising. This kind of rephrasing isn't just useful to avoid getting tangled up in emotions. It's simply more accurate. You're not these feelings. There is no self in emotions. Remember that, like everything else, emotions arise due to specific causes and conditions and pass away when their causes disappear. Do your best to dissociate from these emotions, keeping the role of an objective observer, even though that can be challenging. Dissociating doesn't mean you don't feel the emotions fully or that you try to pour cold water on them. It means you let the emotions come into consciousness and do their dance, without getting absorbed in them. When confronting emotions, always start by investigating the physical sensations that accompany them. As with pain, this is the most effective way of staying objective. Every emotion has its own characteristic sensations and related bodily movements. Scan your own body to discover these for yourself. What are the specific bodily sensations that go with this particular emotion? Where are they located? Are they pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral? Are they changing intensity? Are they expanding and contracting, or solid and fixed? Do they change in quality, or stay the same? Only when you're ready, turn your attention from the physical to the mental aspects of the emotion. Without getting caught up in your subjective experience, try to find a label that accurately describes the emotion. For example, anxiety, guilt, lust, and quality. For example, intense, vague, agitating. Notice what kinds of thoughts the emotion triggers. Is the emotion getting more or less intense or staying fairly constant? Perhaps the emotion is transforming. For example, anxiety can morph into fear and fear into anger and anger into guilt. Again, it's helpful to use verbal labels such as anxiety is arising to remain objective. As you might have guessed, this process can be very tiring. If necessary, take a break from meditation and rest or do something else. As long as you stay objective and don't identify with the emotion, you won't suffer in the process. If you do find yourself suffering, physically or emotionally, you can be sure that you're identifying with some unpleasant emotion. Try to see if you can spot where it's happening. The mind works in subtle ways. You can stay objective toward one emotion while at the same time identifying with another. For instance, when you investigate anger, there may be an undercurrent of fear. Without realizing it, you may remain objective toward the anger but identify with the fear. Practicing introspective awareness will help you handle these subtler, more hidden kinds of emotional identification. While keeping your attention focused on the primary emotion, use introspective awareness to find the background emotion that you're identifying with. Then make the background emotion the new object of attention. Once you have gained some objectivity toward that emotion, 
the suffering will go away. No matter the emotion, your goal is always the same. Acknowledge, allow, and accept. As meditation teacher Joseph Goldstein says, it's not what we are feeling that's important, but how we relate to it that matters. Let the emotion just be until it goes away. Sometimes it will simply disappear. Other times it will remain, but become less intense. When this happens, unless there are associated memories or images that have not yet faded, it's time to return to the meditation object as the primary focus. If you find there are associated memories or images that have not yet faded, simply observe them without engaging or judging them. They may have been present while you were focusing on the emotion, or they may have appeared after the emotion started to subside. Either way, acknowledge their presence and accept them with equanimity. Then, when it's easy to do, return your attention to the breath. The thoughts or images may disappear at once, or remain for a while as subtle distractions. Just keep the breath at the center of your attention. If the emotional intensity associated with these mental objects comes back, repeat the process as many times as needed until the disturbance goes away completely. Handling emotionally charged materials isn't always easy. They can persist for a surprisingly long time. But don't be concerned if at first you don't succeed. You will have many more opportunities. The material will continue to return until you can greet it with full acceptance and equanimity. No matter how many times it resurfaces, acknowledge, allow, and accept it. Once this material finally goes away on its own, it will no longer disturb your meditations. Not only that, it will also stop affecting your daily life in negative ways. In summary, when the mind is quieted through meditation, Charged emotions, thoughts, and visions well up from the unconscious into consciousness. There they become gross distractions. To overcome them, simply make them the object of your attention, acknowledging and accepting them until they fade away on their own. That's it. It's not important to consider why you're having these thoughts or where they come from. That kind of discursive analysis takes you away from the real work of meditation. In fact, there's no need to do anything at all. Whenever you judge, instead of just observing, mindfulness is less effective. By simply allowing material from the unconscious to come up, by mindfully bearing witness and not reacting, you reprogram the mind more deeply than you ever could through intellectual analysis. You're purifying your mind of all the afflictions you've accumulated throughout your entire life. This process is essential for personal growth and spiritual development in general, and for the final stages of this practice in particular. When purification occurs, welcome it, because only by working through our problems can we finally be free of them. Purification of the Mind the emotional purification in stage four can be the equivalent of years of therapy and is crucial for progressing through the ten stages. When we can observe and accept the thoughts, emotions, and images driving unconscious programming, the illuminating power of mindfulness works its magic. Deep, unconscious processes are informed that the circumstances responsible for our conditioning no longer exist, and that the emotional reactions produced are no longer useful. We are not even the same person anymore. This new information reprograms those unconscious processes at a deep level, and the very structure of our personality is transformed and purified. We become less susceptible to destructive emotions and are better able to appreciate and cultivate more skillful qualities of mind. It's not uncommon for meditation to bring up things that might otherwise have stayed repressed for our whole life. The best thing you could ever do for yourself is to confront and work through this material. However, some people have so much trouble with this emotionally charged material that the instructions given here don't work for them. 
If you're acutely disturbed by what comes up, do whatever you can to ground yourself. Take your mind off things through companionship, good food, exercise, or try watching a movie. Having someone to talk to can be very helpful, provided they know how to be a good listener. However, never listen to anyone's advice unless it comes from a meditation teacher with experience in these purifications or a professionally trained counselor. If anyone else starts offering you advice, thank them for their help and gracefully change the subject. If you find you're consistently overwhelmed by the intensity of what comes up in this practice, switch to the loving-kindness meditation. Practice loving-kindness until you can easily generate strong feelings of compassion for yourself and others. Then try resuming Stage 4 practice. If you find the material is still too intense to deal with on your own, seek professional help. Sustaining Attention by Engaging with the Meditation Object Now let's look at how to sustain attention on the breath after having dealt with the kind of powerful, gross distractions we've just discussed. Whenever you return to the breath, you should intensify your focus, but not too much, just enough to keep any other subtle distractions from becoming gross distractions. Intensifying your focus helps keep distractions at bay. When you ignore them for a while, they will fade from awareness. To help you intensify your focus, use the practices of following and connecting, described in Stage 3. In Stage 4, connecting is particularly useful. You observe changes in the breath over time and notice, or connect, how those changes correspond to shifts in your state of mind. Don't focus on the breath too intensely for too long at this stage. If you attempt exclusive, single-pointed attention before you have enough training, you lose introspective awareness, becoming vulnerable to distractions and dullness. Make your attention more intense, but in as relaxed and gentle a way as possible. It helps to aim for a balance between attention and introspective awareness. It's like holding a robin's egg firmly, so you don't drop it, but also gently, so you don't break it. Learning to Overcome Strong Dullness As you become more skilled at dealing with distractions, strong dullness will become your next major obstacle. We gave you some tools in Stage 3 for working with the drowsiness caused by strong dullness. In this stage, your goal is to overcome strong dullness entirely. Dullness occurs when we turn the mind inward, which reduces the constant flow of thoughts and sensations that usually keep the mind energized and alert. Therefore, the overall energy level of the mind drops. With less stimulation, the brain winds down toward sleep, and the mind grows dull. This normally happens when we're fatigued or at bedtime. In meditation... It's not just turning inward that decreases mental energy, but when we focus on the breath too intensely and for too long, we are also excluding the thoughts and sensations that usually keep the mind alert. This is another reason why looking beyond the meditation object with peripheral awareness is so important. When we stay aware of things in the background, we continue to stimulate brain activity and won't sink into dullness. Overcoming Strong Dullness To deal effectively with strong dullness, we need to distinguish between two different kinds of subtle dullness, progressive subtle dullness and stable subtle dullness. As the name implies, progressive subtle dullness eventually leads to strong dullness, and the longer it's present, the more likely strong dullness will arise. Therefore, You'll have to learn to recognize progressive subtle dullness in order to overcome strong dullness. On the other hand, stable subtle dullness doesn't lead to strong dullness. In this stage, tolerating stable subtle dullness keeps the mind from becoming agitated and restless. You'll lose some vividness, clarity, and intensity of perception, but will have a more peaceful and stable state of mind with fewer distractions. 
Only in stage five will you work to overcome all forms of subtle dullness. There are three simple steps for defeating strong dullness. The first step is to recognize its presence and rouse your mind out of it using an appropriate antidote. This can be a challenge. When the dullness is deep enough to the point that you're drowsy, you will have no introspective awareness to alert you to the problem. You only realize there's dullness after you find yourself nodding off, snoring, or dreaming. If this happens, try to wake yourself up completely. And if it's only progressive, subtle dullness you're experiencing, rouse yourself from that as well. With either type of dullness, you must first re-energize the mind. Once you've done that, the second step is to rely on introspective awareness to notice when dullness returns, before it grows too strong. When it returns, apply the appropriate antidote once more. The sooner you notice progressive subtle dullness, the easier it is to counteract. The third step of the process is to repeat steps one and two until the dullness doesn't come back at all. Because subtle dullness impairs your introspective awareness, you will often have trouble recognizing when dullness has returned. Step two. However, with time and practice, you will learn to identify and correct for progressive subtle dullness before it grows too strong. Also, as you learn to recognize the onset more quickly, the antidotes you use won't have to be as strong, and they'll prove more effective. When noticing and correcting becomes automatic, you'll have completely overcome strong dullness. A well-trained mind won't slip into strong dullness, except when extremely fatigued. Eventually, even progressive, subtle dullness will rarely occur. You will still experience stable, subtle dullness until you overcome it in Stage 5. Three Steps for Overcoming Strong Dullness 1. Apply a strong enough antidote to completely awaken the mind whenever strong dullness or progressive, subtle dullness is present. 2. Use introspective awareness to recognize the return of dullness as soon as possible, before subtle dullness becomes strong dullness so you can apply the appropriate antidote. 3. Repeat this process until the dullness doesn't return. The Antidotes for Dullness When you're experiencing strong dullness, use the antidotes described in Stage 3 to rouse yourself. For instance, take a few deep breaths and exhale forcibly through your mouth, creating resistance by pursing your lips. Or try clenching all your muscles, holding them for a few seconds, and suddenly release and relax. Repeat this several times. Another helpful method is to suck in your gut while tightening and releasing the perineum. These are all invigorating and work well if the dullness isn't too strong. For very strong dullness, try walking meditation for a few minutes, or meditate while standing. Standing meditation can be tiring and uncomfortable, but it's quite effective and sometimes necessary. If nothing else works, get up and splash some cold water on your face, then go back to practicing. When the dullness isn't as strong, just expanding your peripheral awareness can sometimes be enough. Enlarge the area of your awareness to encompass all bodily sensations, sounds, smells, and so forth, while keeping your attention on the breath. You can also shift attention away from the breath, making your whole body and environment the meditation object for a while. You can also try meditating with your eyes open. If progressive subtle dullness is caught soon enough, any of these techniques can help you overcome it. If you recognize the presence of progressive subtle dullness early enough, you can raise the energy in the mind just by strengthening your intention to observe the sensations of the breath clearly and in more detail. However, this will only work for very subtle dullness, identified very early on. And remember, if you make your attention too intense for too long, mindfulness will fade. Also, focusing too intensely can make you overly energized and agitated, if this happens, relax the force of your attention to allow a little subtle dullness in, decreasing the energy level of the mind. 
the key to using close attention is to strike a balance. You don't want your focus to be too intense and tight, nor too relaxed and loose. When dullness doesn't return for at least three to five minutes, you can be confident that the antidote was strong enough and that you've lifted yourself out fully. Whenever dullness returns sooner, your antidote wasn't strong enough or applied for long enough. If it returns almost immediately, you're in a state called sinking. You're sinking into dullness so quickly that your efforts to escape aren't enough. This means you need a much stronger antidote. The basic rule is, do whatever's necessary to re-energize the mind to a state of full alertness. During this stage, dullness will often return, no matter how strongly you rouse yourself. So always be vigilant. Don't be surprised or disappointed when it returns. Just keep practicing. And be encouraged. The sooner you catch dullness, the more easily you can rouse the mind, and the closer you are to overcoming strong dullness completely. Be prepared to spend entire sessions working with dullness. Welcome it as an opportunity to investigate the nature of dullness. At some point during your sit, usually after many interventions, dullness may even disappear entirely. When this happens, you'll notice your mind feels light and alert, and with experience you'll be able to recognize when all traces of dullness have disappeared completely. You have achieved the goal for this stage when progressive, subtle dullness rarely arises, and when it does, is quickly noticed and corrected for. The Seduction of Dullness Strong dullness can be a seductive trap. States of dullness lead to dream imagery, archetypal visions, pleasurable sensations, paranormal experiences like channeling, past life recollections, and the overall feeling that something profound is occurring. If you anchor attention on the breath, you can sustain them for a long time without falling asleep. In certain traditions, these states are purposely cultivated. However, when it comes to cultivating attention and awareness, these states are only a hindrance. Remember that visionary experiences, brilliant insights, and any other seemingly profound encounters should all be avoided at this stage. When these experiences arise, simply resolve to let go of them. Strengthen your intention to observe the details of the breath as clearly and vividly as possible. Ignore the visions, bring yourself out of dullness, and carry on meditating. This may not be easy if, in another system of practice, you've used such experiences and found meaning and value in them. If you find some significance in a vision that arises, set it aside and explore it at another time. Conclusion You have mastered Stage 4 when you're free from both gross distractions and strong dullness. Physical sensations, thoughts, memories, and emotions still arise, but they no longer draw attention away. Dullness no longer leads to drowsiness, nor causes perception of the breath sensations to grow dim or take on hypnagogic distortions. By the end of Stage 4, you can direct and sustain your attention at will. This is a unique and powerful ability. The strength of your mindfulness has also reached an important threshold. Attention can precisely examine every part of the breath with little effort. Your perception of the meditation object has become nonverbal and nondiscursive. Also, awareness has grown more powerful and can clearly discern how the breath changes over time. With such strong attention and clear awareness, the words of the Buddha take on new significance. Breathing in a long breath, he knows he breathes in a long breath. Breathing out a long breath, he knows he breathes out a long breath. Breathing in a short breath, he knows he breathes in a short breath. Breathing out a short breath, he knows he breathes out a short breath. Anapanasati Sutta Fourth Interlude The Moments of Consciousness Model the model of conscious experience you learned about in the first interlude introduced the ideas of attention and peripheral awareness. 
While that model was helpful for working through the first four stages, it was incomplete. As you progress in your practice, you'll need more detailed models of the mind to help make sense of your new experiences. Here we present the Moments of Consciousness model. It builds on what you've already learned, recasting many of the concepts already used. This model is drawn from the Theravada Buddhist Abhidhamma and includes some elaborations and expansions by a later Buddhist school known as the Yogacara. This interlude and the next take ideas about the mind from both these sources and explore them using modern terminology and a more science-based framework. Keep in mind that this model is intended to help you understand both your own experiences and the meditation instructions better. Don't bother with trying to decide whether the description is literally true or not. As your meditation skills mature, you'll have plenty of time to decide what you think based on your own experiences. What's more important is that the model is useful for making sense of and working more effectively in your practice. Moments of Consciousness Our everyday conscious experience of the world, the thoughts and sensations that arise and pass away, appear to flow together seamlessly from one moment to the next. However, according to the Moments of Consciousness model, this is an illusion. If we observed closely enough, we would find that experience is actually divided into individual moments of consciousness. These conscious mind moments occur one at a time, in much the same way that a motion picture film is actually divided into separate frames. Because the frames pass so quickly and are so numerous, motion on the film seems fluid. Similarly, these discrete moments of consciousness are so brief and numerous that they seem to form one continuous and uninterrupted stream of consciousness. According to this model, consciousness is a series of discrete events rather than continuous, because we can only be conscious of information coming from one sense organ at a time. Moments of seeing are distinct from moments of hearing, moments of smelling from moments of touch, and so on. Therefore, each is a separate mental event with its own unique content. Moments of visual experience can be interspersed with moments of auditory, tactile, mental, and other sensory experience, but no two can happen at the same time. For example, a moment of visual consciousness must end before you can have a thought, a moment of mental consciousness about what you've just seen. It is only because these different moments replace each other so quickly that seeing, hearing, thinking, and so forth all seem to happen at the same time. The moments of consciousness model posits that within each of these moments, nothing changes. They are truly like freeze frames. Even our experience of watching something move is the result of many separate moments of visual consciousness, one rapidly following the next. Therefore, all conscious experience, without exception, consists of individual, brief moments, each containing a single, static chunk of information. In that sense, we can say that each mind moment provides only a single object of consciousness. Because moments of consciousness coming from different sense organs contain such different information, consciousness is less like a film in which every frame is similar to the last and more like a string of differently colored beads. While this model is quite different from how we usually think about consciousness, it's not just a nice theory someone thought up. The basic premise of distinct moments of consciousness arising and passing away in sequence is based on the actual meditation experiences of advanced practitioners from across a broad range of traditions. It's an experience that the composers of the Abhidhamma who formulated this model either had firsthand or learned about from other advanced meditators. It's also an experience you yourself will have in the later stages. Yet long before you do, this model will help you, just as it has helped other practitioners for over two millennia. Seven Different Types of Moments of Consciousness 
In this model, the different types of moments of consciousness vary according to which of our senses provides the object in a given moment. In all, there are seven kinds of moments. The first five are obvious, since they correspond to the physical senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. The sixth category, maybe less obvious, is called the mind sense, meaning it includes mental objects like thoughts and emotions. Finally, there is a seventh type of consciousness, called binding consciousness, that integrates the information provided by the other senses. Let's take a closer look at these different kinds of moments of consciousness. Of the five physical senses, the last on the list, touch, properly known as somatic sensation, is more complicated and diverse than the first four. It would be accurate to say that the somatosensory category is actually comprised of many different senses. For example, there's the category of skin sensations, which includes not just touch, but also pressure, movement, and vibration. There's a separate category that includes things like temperature, pain, tickle, itch, and some sexual sensations. Then there's what's called proprioception, the sense that informs us about the position, location, and movement of the parts of our body. Sensations of muscle tension, deep visceral sensations, and the physical sensations we associate with emotions each constitute other distinct categories of sense experience. Finally, the sensations of acceleration, rotation, balance, and gravity make up yet another category completely overlooked by the classical five senses. From a physiological perspective, each of these somatosensory categories is actually a unique sense unto itself, served by its own subsystem within the central nervous system. According to the moments of consciousness model, information from no two of these somatic sense categories can occupy the same moment of consciousness either. Just as we can't see an object and hear a sound at the same time, we can't, for example, sense motion, and feel pain at the same time. So there are, in fact, more than five different kinds of physical senses. It's the same situation with the mind sense. It was traditionally treated as a single sense through which we become conscious of mental objects. Yet in reality, memories, emotions, and abstract thoughts, for example, each derive from distinctly different brain processes, and each provides a unique kind of information. Therefore, information from two different mental categories can't share the same moment of consciousness either. You can't solve an algebra problem while at the same time remembering a childhood pet. We have to recognize that both the mind sense and the somatic sense are actually blanket labels encompassing many sense categories, each conveying its own unique kind of information. However, for the sake of simplicity, we will ignore these diverse senses and just refer to six basic categories of moments of consciousness corresponding to the sight, smell, taste, touch, hearing, and mental senses. However, if the contents of one moment are gone before the next arises, how do these distinct kinds of information ever get integrated with each other in conscious experience? How do we ever put it all together so we can understand what's actually happening? The answer is that the content of many separate moments provided by the first six sense categories get briefly stored in a kind of working memory where they are combined and integrated with each other. Then the product of this integration is projected into consciousness as yet another distinct type of mind moment, the combining or binding moment of consciousness. Consider the experience of hearing someone speak. When the contents from visual and auditory moments of consciousness have been combined, binding moments are produced. These binding moments match the sounds we hear to the specific objects we see in our visual field. In other words, our subjective experience is hearing words come from a particular person's mouth. This kind of mental activity also occurs when we watch a movie. Notice how your mind automatically attributes particular voices to specific characters, 
when in fact the sound originates from speakers in the theater walls. The sound may even be coming from behind you. And, of course, the reason ventriloquists can fool us is because binding moments don't always put the information together in an accurate way. Binding moments are integrated perceptions combining information from the other six senses to produce complex representations of what's happening within and around us. They are regarded as a seventh kind of moment of consciousness, distinct from the other six. Therefore, the seven different kinds of moments of consciousness are sight, sound, smell, taste, somatosensory, and mental, plus the binding moment. Moments of Attention and Moments of Peripheral Awareness Recall from the first interlude that all conscious experience gets filtered through either attention or awareness. They form two distinct ways of knowing the world. But how do attention and awareness fit into this more in-depth model? If all conscious experience consists entirely of the seven kinds of mind moments, what place is there for attention and awareness? It's simple. Any moment of consciousness, whether it's a moment of seeing, hearing, thinking, etc., takes the form of either a moment of attention or a moment of peripheral awareness. Consider a moment of seeing. It could be either a moment of seeing as part of attention or a moment of seeing as part of peripheral awareness. These are the two options. If it's a moment of awareness, it will be broad, inclusive, and holistic, regardless of which of the seven categories it belongs to. A moment of attention, on the other hand, will isolate one particular aspect of experience to focus on. If we examine moments of attention and moments of awareness a bit closer, we see two major differences. First, moments of awareness can contain many objects, while moments of attention contain only a few. Second, the content of moments of awareness undergoes relatively little mental processing, while the content of moments of attention is subject to much more in-depth processing. Of course, these two are not so neatly divided experientially, but understanding these differences will help you appreciate how each functions and their different purposes in organizing subjective reality. Consider the first difference, many objects versus only a few, in terms of hearing. Our ears take in everything audible from our environment. Then our brain processes that information and puts it together in two different ways. First, it creates an auditory background that includes more or less all the different sounds our ears have detected. When that's projected into consciousness, it becomes a moment of auditory peripheral awareness. The other way the brain processes that information is to pick out just some part, say one person's voice, from the total sound in our awareness. When projected into consciousness, that isolated sound becomes the content of a moment of auditory attention, so the brain has two modes of information processing. One creates moments of awareness with many objects, while the other creates moments of attention with just a few. These two modes apply to every kind of sensory information, not just hearing. For example, say you're sitting on a cabin deck in the mountains, gazing out at the view. Each moment of visual awareness will include a variety of objects, mountains, trees, birds, and sky, all at the same time. Auditory moments of awareness will include all the various sounds that make up the audible background, birdsong, wind in the trees, a babbling brook, and so forth, again, all at the same time. On the other hand, moments of visual attention might be restricted just to the bird you're watching on a nearby branch. Auditory attention might include only the sounds the birds are making. Even when your attention is divided among several things at once, perhaps you're knitting or whittling a piece of wood while you sit, moments of attention are still limited to a small number of objects. Finally, binding moments of attention and binding moments of awareness take the content from the preceding sensory moments and combine them into a whole. Sitting on the deck, looking out at the mountain, while carving a piece of wood. 
Now, let's consider the second difference. The degree of mental processing in moments of awareness versus moments of attention. Individual moments of awareness provide information about a lot of things at once, but the information has only been minimally processed. The result is our familiar experience of peripheral awareness of many things in the background. However, these moments of awareness do include some simple interpretations of sense data. You may be aware that the sounds you hear are from traffic, or that the things in the background of your visual field are trees. These simple concepts help evaluate and categorize all that information, contributing to our understanding of the present context. Although these preliminary interpretations don't usually lead to any kind of action, some part of this information is frequently referred to attention for more analysis. Other times, say when the sound of traffic suddenly includes screeching tires, the information in peripheral awareness can trigger an automatic action, thought, or emotion, any of which can then become an object of attention. Attention's job, on the other hand, is to isolate specific objects in order to analyze and interpret them in more detail. Moments of attention contain conceptual representations, usually from the mind sense. These may be simple concepts related to our immediate experience, actions, thoughts, or emotions, but more often they're elaborate concepts constructed from those simpler concepts. Let's use another example to help clarify the difference in processing between attention and awareness. Imagine that you've just heard an unusual sound. Peripheral awareness may initially attribute that sound to a footstep on the stairs. That is to say, the actual sound has already been replaced with the concept, someone is walking up the stairs, and peripheral awareness has referred that information to your faculty of attention for further analysis. Notice that it's not the actual sound that becomes the object of attention, but rather the idea of a person walking up the stairs. During the moments of consciousness that follow, attention filters through stored information to interpret the significance of someone coming up the stairs. Once attention arrives at a conclusion, it can then initiate an appropriate response. There is one more subtle difference between moments of awareness and attention worth mentioning. The content of moments of awareness usually comes from the physical senses, while the content of moments of attention usually comes from the mind sense. What had been a sound in awareness, simply attributed to traffic, becomes a concept like traffic noise when made into an object of attention. However, this is only a general rule. There are times when moments of attention hold information coming directly from one of the physical senses. But even when a sensory object does become an object of attention, it is quickly replaced by a more complex, highly processed, conceptual formation. For example, paying attention to a tangible object like breath sensations usually generates many more moments of consciousness from the mind sense than from the sense of touch directly, especially for beginning meditators. Moments of attention that include actual sensory information are actually few and far between, greatly outnumbered by those containing conceptual objects such as breath, air, in, out, and nose. Only if you diligently practice following the breath, observing ever finer details, will you train your mind to produce more moments of attention to actual breath sensations. Likewise, there are instances when moments of peripheral awareness involving the mind sense occur. They involve things like a growing feeling of annoyance or a suspicion that we've forgotten something. Generally, though, People have less peripheral awareness of what's going on in their minds than they do of things in the external environment. This is especially true of the untrained mind. Mindfulness training involves increasing the moments of introspective awareness, moments of peripheral awareness of mental objects, and states and activities of the mind. Non-Perceiving Mind Moments 
Non-perceiving mind moments are another important part of the moments of consciousness model. These are potential rather than actual moments of consciousness. No perception occurs because none of the sense organs provides them with any content. But nevertheless, they are real mental events, replacing perceived moments of consciousness, and they are associated with a feeling of pleasure. Non-perceiving mind moments are interspersed among perceiving moments of consciousness. According to the model, one of the attributes of every moment of consciousness is a kind of life force or vital energy. Non-perceiving mind moments carry much less of this vital energy than do perceiving moments of consciousness. Therefore, the energy level of the mind depends on the ratio of perceiving to non-perceiving moments. The greater the proportion of non-perceiving mind moments in a given period, the more dullness we experience. In daily life, sensory input constantly enters the mind, continuously stimulating and maintaining its energy level. However, as we pointed out in the first interlude, even this ordinary level of consciousness involves a considerable amount of dullness, as shown by our capacity for increased awareness and alertness under certain circumstances, like in an emergency. This means that ordinary conscious experience includes a significant proportion of non-perceiving mind moments. Dullness grows even stronger if that proportion increases. Conscious Intention So far, we have focused mainly on the passive aspect of these moments of consciousness. Perception Yet there is an active component in every moment of consciousness as well. Conscious Intention We intend to observe the meditation object. We intend to to direct attention away from distractions and return to the meditation object. We intend to sustain attention on it. We intend to engage fully with its details. Intention plays an important role in each moment of consciousness. It determines the objects of subsequent moments of consciousness. The stronger our intention to attend to a particular object, the more moments of attention will subsequently be focused on that object. So, if you intend to watch the breath, the next few moments of consciousness are more likely to take the breath as their object. Although intention is part of every perceiving moment, awareness of these intentions is usually subliminal, unless, of course, the intention itself becomes the object of a moment of consciousness. Intention also exerts a powerful influence on how many of the upcoming mind moments will be perceiving rather than non-perceiving. A strong intention to perceive anything results in more perceiving moments, and vice versa. This, in turn, has a strong effect on the activity and energy levels of the mind. In contrast, intention is completely absent from non-perceiving mind moments. Therefore, they are also non-intending mind moments. Just as the intention of perceiving moments leads to more perceiving moments, the lack of intention in non-perceiving moments results in more non-perceiving moments, meaning dullness grows stronger. Applying the Moments of Consciousness Model to Meditation Let's look at what might happen during a single breath cycle in meditation using the moments of consciousness model, starting with the in-breath. The subjective experience is one of fairly continuous attention to the breath sensations, but with subtle distractions such as knee pain or feelings of restlessness standing out from the background of peripheral awareness. What's actually happening, according to the model, is that a large number of separate moments of consciousness are arising and passing away during the course of the in-breath. Most are moments of attention with the changing sensations of the breath as their object, but others have knee pain, thoughts about lunch, or feelings of restlessness as their object. Attention isn't actually moving between the breath and these distractions. Instead, successive moments of attention hold different objects. Interspersed among these moments of attention are moments of peripheral awareness of other bodily sensations, sounds, thoughts, and emotions, creating the background. 
Then, during the out-breath, if the pain in your knee draws your attention, a greater proportion of moments of attention are devoted to knee pain than to the breath. Subsequently, the pain is now a gross distraction, and the breath slips away into the background. Each moment of attention to the pain also carries a subconscious intention for subsequent moments to stay on the pain. Because of your training up to this stage, as you begin the next in-breath, moments of introspective peripheral awareness alert you to the presence of pain as a gross distraction. You counter it with your conscious intention to make the breath the focus again, generating more moments of attention to the breath. Now you're attending more closely to the breath, with a strong intention not to pay attention to your knee. Knee pain fades into the background, and the breath sensations become sharper and clearer once more. Forgetting, Distraction, and Exclusive Attention According to this model, the phenomena of forgetting, gross and subtle distractions, and exclusive focus all exist along a continuum. Where each is located on that continuum depends on only one thing, the proportion of moments of attention in a given period whose object is the sensations of the breath versus some distraction. With forgetting, there are no moments of attention with the breath as the object, only moments with distractions as the object. With gross distractions, there are more moments devoted to the distraction than to the breath. With subtle distractions, there are more moments devoted to the breath than to the distraction. Finally, the exclusive focus of an advanced practitioner lies on the far end of the spectrum, because all content is related to a single, clearly defined theme. Distractions rarely, if ever, become objects of moments of attention. As you can determine... Stable attention simply means that most of your moments of attention are devoted to the meditation object. How many moments of peripheral awareness you have has nothing to do with it. However, the process of developing stable attention required that you work with introspective peripheral awareness to overcome forgetting and gross distractions. In other words, you use mindfulness, the optimal interaction between moments of attention and moments of awareness, to gradually develop stable attention. Mindfulness, Peripheral Awareness, and Attention Mindfulness means that in whatever situation we find ourselves, the balance between moments of attention and moments of awareness is just right. Whenever we lose this balance, we lose mindfulness. The solution to any loss of mindfulness is to increase the total power of consciousness. That means increasing the proportion of actively perceiving versus non-perceiving mind moments. To do this, we have to convert non-perceiving mind moments into perceiving moments of attention and awareness. This increase leads to a more efficient balance between attention and awareness, allowing us to remain mindful in most situations. If consciousness is more powerful, we'll have enough perceiving mind moments to sustain peripheral awareness while keeping attention on whatever task we're doing, even when multitasking. To make this point clear, let's take as an example people with attention deficit disorder, which is basically a form of involuntary multitasking. People with ADD will definitely have a harder time increasing peripheral awareness in the earlier stages, since their attention is so unstable to begin with. But by increasing the total number of perceiving mind moments, they can generate enough moments of awareness to achieve a balance of attention and awareness. By doing so, they're as able as anyone to achieve a high level of mindfulness. But is mindfulness compatible with single-pointedness, the ability to focus on the meditation object to the exclusion of everything else? The answer is yes. Even while moments of attention are focused exclusively on one thing, we can still have enough moments of peripheral awareness intermixed to remain mindful. Again, we need enough conscious power to have the necessary awareness accompanying attention. 
Otherwise, as the number of moments devoted to objects of attention increase, the number of moments of awareness must drop, because we simply won't have enough moments of consciousness available to go around. Up to this point, you've been cultivating moments of peripheral awareness that were mostly extrospective. Now, from stage five onward, you'll practice increasing the moments of introspective awareness, eventually leading to a new level of metacognitive introspective awareness. That is, you will be aware of your state of mind in every moment, even as you focus on the breath. Dullness Dullness is determined by the number of non-perceiving moments mixed in with perceiving moments. As the proportion of non-perceiving moments increases, we experience more subtle dullness. Increase it even more, and we experience strong dullness. When the proportion becomes great enough, we fall asleep. When all perceiving moments have disappeared, we are completely unconscious. Unconsciousness and deep sleep are at one end of a continuum. At the other end, where all your mind moments are actively perceiving moments of consciousness, we experience the ultimate degree of alertness. As we pointed out earlier, ordinary consciousness includes a significant proportion of non-perceiving mind moments. Therefore, the different degrees of alertness of everyday life are actually varying degrees of stable, subtle dullness. That means we are already in subtle dullness even before we sit down to meditate. The only reason the subtle dullness of daily life is stable is because there are enough different stimuli constantly streaming in, producing new moments of consciousness to keep us alert. But when we start meditating, we cut off much of that stimulation by turning away from sensations and thoughts toward a relatively boring meditation object. When the proportion of perceiving moments of consciousness starts falling, the energy level of the mind falls as well. And remember, non-perceiving moments are also non-intending moments, so they don't generate any intent to perceive in subsequent moments. Therefore, even more perceiving moments become non-perceiving and non-intending moments. If there's no intervention, this cycle turns the stable, subtle dullness of daily life into the progressive, subtle dullness of meditation. If this isn't checked, it becomes strong dullness and drowsiness. In Stage 3, you learned to maintain a balance between attention and peripheral awareness so you didn't become too inwardly focused and fall asleep. These moments of extrospective awareness helped keep your mind energized. In Stage 4, you learned to use the power of intention to increase the energy level of the mind enough to overcome progressive, subtle dullness before it became strong dullness. The mind is now able to sustain a state of stable, subtle dullness during meditation, just as it does in daily life. In Stage 5, you will learn ways to reduce the proportion of non-perceiving moments and to increase the proportion of perceiving moments. You will have less subtle dullness, more conscious power, and therefore greater mindfulness. A strong intention to perceive in every moment of consciousness is the real antidote to dullness in meditation. Powerful imagery, visions, and a sense of having experienced something profound often occur with strong dullness. These aren't actually a part of dullness itself. Rather, the large proportion of non-perceiving, non-intending moments creates an opportunity for deep subconscious content to well up into consciousness. With so many mind moments unoccupied by external stimuli or intentional objects, otherwise subconscious material can become the object of perceiving moments. Dreaming happens in the same way. Drumming, chanting, repetitive bodily movements, and other shamanic practices are used to purposely induce the same kind of openness and receptivity. However, in these cases, the practitioner usually has some prior intention for these visionary objects to arise. The Moments of Consciousness model will prove useful for understanding both the problem of subtle dullness and how to overcome it in Stage 5. 
It will also prove useful for the later stages. Remember, this model and the others presented in this book were originally developed by meditators for meditators to help them achieve the ultimate goals of spiritual practice. Stage 5. Overcoming Subtle Dullness and Increasing Mindfulness 5. The goal of Stage 5 is to overcome subtle dullness and increase the power of mindfulness. Set and hold the intention to notice and immediately correct for subtle dullness. Powerful mindfulness will become a habit of the mind. Practice Goals for Stage 5 At the start of Stage 5, attention is much more stable. You're free from gross distraction, but still experience subtle distraction. You've also overcome strong dullness and progressive subtle dullness, but remain in a state of stable subtle dullness. Your goals for this stage are to completely overcome the tendency to slip more deeply into stable subtle dullness and to heighten the power and clarity of consciousness. In other words, you want to develop more powerful mindfulness that includes vivid attention and strong peripheral awareness. To achieve this, you'll learn to recognize when subtle dullness starts to deepen. Then you'll learn to correct it and restore your mind to its previous alertness. Finally, having recognized and corrected for subtle dullness, you'll increase the power of your mindfulness even more. You've mastered Stage 5 when you've completely overcome stable, subtle dullness, and the intensity of mindfulness actually increases as your session progresses. The Danger of Subtle Dullness This new level of stable attention is precisely what makes us more vulnerable to slipping into a deeper state of sustained, subtle dullness. That's because the mental agitation that stimulated the mind and helped keep us awake in the earlier stages has subsided. As subtle dullness deepens, it causes both peripheral awareness and subtle distractions to fade. If we don't recognize this as a sign of subtle dullness, it can easily be mistaken for the strong, exclusive focus of Stage 6. The pleasant feelings that accompany subtle dullness can also be misinterpreted as first signs of the meditative joy of advanced stages. Without guidance, meditators often confuse a deeper state of subtle dullness with having achieved the more lofty states of later stages. We can sustain this type of subtle dullness for very long periods. It's often described in these kinds of terms. My concentration was so deep, an hour seemed like only minutes, or I don't know where I went, but I was just gone and felt so peaceful and happy. When the pleasure of dullness is particularly strong, and our peripheral awareness of thoughts and sensations fades completely, our meditation can even seem to fit the description of a meditative absorption, jhana. We can quickly get attached to such experiences, prizing them as proof of our meditative skills. Yet relative to the practice goals in this book, they are complete dead ends. It's crucial we learn to recognize and overcome subtle dullness to progress in your practice. Therefore, do not skip this stage. Overcoming Subtle Dullness Subtle dullness has three characteristics. 1. The vividness and clarity of the meditation object decline. 2. Both extrospective and introspective peripheral awareness fade 3. There is a comfortable, relaxed, and pleasant feeling. These occur together, though only one or two may be obvious at a time. We need to learn to identify these characteristics in order to know when subtle dullness is growing deeper. The Characteristics of Subtle Dullness Loss of Vividness As subtle dullness deepens, the sensations of the breath are no longer as vivid, and your perception of the fine details aren't as sharp and clear as before. Once you learn to look for this change in perception, it's quite noticeable. 
An increase in the number of subtle distractions also causes a loss of vividness and clarity. This is because distractions are competing with the breath for available moments of attention. It's a simple correlation. If there's an increase in subtle distractions, there will be a decrease in the vividness and clarity of the meditation object. And if there's a decrease in subtle distractions, the meditation object will be more discernible. You may have already noticed this. But if not, make a point of observing what happens to the meditation object when subtle distractions increase and decrease. With the normal ebb and flow of subtle distractions at this stage, you can easily observe these moment-by-moment -moment changes in vividness and clarity. Becoming familiar with how subtle distractions affect the appearance of the breath will help you recognize when dullness is doing the same thing. Although dullness and distractions provide similar changes in perception, when dullness is the cause, vividness and clarity decline more gradually, without as much fluctuation, and, of course, there's no increase in the number of subtle distractions. Vividness and clarity decline because non-perceiving mind moments gradually replace perceiving ones. You must become skilled at recognizing this decline. Just like with strong dullness in stage four, we rely on introspective awareness to alert us to the loss of vividness and clarity so we can increase the intensity of our perception again. Yet this isn't so easy, because it's precisely when subtle dullness deepens that introspective awareness starts to fade. The Fading of Extrospective and Introspective Awareness Initially, your perception of the breath is clear and vivid, and you remain mindfully aware of physical sensations and mental objects in the periphery. But when subtle dullness deepens, your field of conscious awareness shrinks. Sounds and bodily sensations fade from awareness, sometimes becoming imperceptible. Thoughts are fewer and don't occur as often. At the same time, feelings of relaxation and contentment grow, eventually dominating introspective awareness. You will be introspectively aware of a sense of comfort and ease rather than of dullness. This is a tricky situation. Introspective awareness, the very thing you need in order to catch deepening subtle dullness, has itself been affected by subtle dullness. This problem is similar to the one in Stage 3. There you needed introspective awareness to detect gross distractions and drowsiness, but it wasn't developed enough yet to do the job. So instead you used attention to check in looking into the mind for distraction and dullness. In this stage, you will also periodically check in with attention to look for the presence of subtle dullness. The Pleasure of Dullness Having dealt with pain and discomfort in the preceding stage, it's now easier to sit comfortably for longer periods. Also, because you have more stable attention and feel satisfied with your progress, your meditations are often pleasant. You have to learn to distinguish this more wholesome kind of pleasure from the pleasurable feelings of subtle dullness. Pleasantness by itself isn't a reliable sign of subtle dullness. Dullness of any kind is always pleasant, except when we actively resist. Consider things like alcohol, drugs, and forms of mindless entertainment. These all provide a much sought-after kind of pleasurable dullness. We become relaxed and pleasantly numb. Our awareness is hazy at best, and our attention is free-floating. Although this is quite different from dullness in meditation, it clearly shows why the pleasure of dullness is so seductive. Subtle dullness in meditation is actually more like the relaxed state you might experience sitting in a lounge chair, eyes closed, under a beach umbrella on a warm day. Or consider the comfortable state of resting on the couch after a big holiday feast. You're not asleep, or even sleepy. You still seem somewhat aware of what's happening around you. It may even seem like you have a clear mind, but you're actually not very alert. 
This is exactly the kind of deeper, but still stable, subtle dullness that can arise in meditation and be intentionally cultivated if we don't understand what's happening. We can train ourselves to remain in this state for extended periods. As mentioned, such dullness can make us think we've achieved the exclusive focus and blissful states of the later stages. When our practice is this enjoyable... There's a strong temptation to see ourselves as adept meditators. Once again, pleasurable, subtle dullness is a trap and a dead end. You must recognize and avoid that trap. At first, it may be difficult to distinguish between the wholesome pleasure of stable attention and the pleasure of subtle dullness, but in time you will recognize the warm, soft, quiet pleasure of subtle dullness as something quite different from the bright, alert enjoyment of being in the flow of mindfulness. Detecting and Countering the Deepening of Subtle Dullness The signs that dullness is growing deeper include decreasing vividness and clarity, fading peripheral awareness, and seductive pleasure. However, detecting these signs is harder because dullness causes introspective awareness to fade— so how can we recognize them when we're already being affected? One thing that helps is certain kinds of involuntary responses, such as the startle reaction. If some disturbance, an unexpected sound, someone coughing or a door slamming, causes you to jerk or feel inwardly startled, then dullness was probably present. Other examples are when you're surprised to find yourself taking a deep breath, or when you suddenly find yourself correcting for a slumping posture. If you were really mindful, you would have been aware of needing to do these things before they happened automatically. As a general rule, the more mindful you are in the moment, the more difficult it is to be either startled or surprised. Once you've been startled into a state of greater awareness, reflect on and examine the quality of your meditation just before you were startled. This will help you recognize the characteristic signs of subtle dullness. Still, you don't have to wait until you're startled to recognize the deepening of subtle dullness. You should intentionally check in from time to time as well. Compare your present awareness and attention with previous meditation sessions when you felt particularly sharp and alert. You can also compare your awareness and attention with earlier times in the same sitting. It's even helpful to examine your meditation session after it's ended, searching for any signs that subtle dullness may have been present. This will teach you to recognize dullness more easily next time. Finally, another sign that you are sitting in subtle dullness is when you feel sluggish or spacey after practicing. When this happens, recall, as best you can, what you were experiencing during your meditation which will also help you recognize dullness in the future. The best way to detect subtle dullness is by making introspective awareness stronger. The key to doing that is intention. In stages two and three, you intentionally emphasized continuous extrospective awareness. Now you must strengthen your introspective awareness. Hold the intention to remain continuously aware of what's happening in the mind moment by moment. Be aware of which subtle distractions are present and how frequently attention shifts back and forth between them and the breath. Be aware not only of the contents of your mind, thoughts, feelings, underlying intentions, and so forth, but also of the activities of your mind. At the same time, keep cultivating the intention to observe the meditation object continuously with as much intensity and clarity as possible. That means you also need to hold the intention to know how well you're fulfilling this intention, which, of course, requires still more introspective awareness. And if vividness is declining, you want to know why. Is it because subtle dullness is creeping in, or is it due to agitation? In short, stay continuously vigilant about changes in the degree of dullness or alertness of your mind over time. Again, this vigilance is the result of firmly held intentions involving introspective awareness. Intentionally cultivating vigilant introspective awareness doesn't just help you detect subtle dullness. It's an antidote as well. 
Remember, dullness arises when perceiving moments of consciousness become non-perceiving mind moments. A strong intention to perceive actually reverses this process by producing more perceiving moments of consciousness. By just setting the intention to observe the breath clearly and vividly while sustaining introspective awareness, you directly influence the root cause of dullness. Sharpen up your observation of the meditation object when you notice a decrease in the quality of awareness and attention. Use the techniques of following and connecting. Follow the sensations of the breath while intending to perceive the details as clearly and vividly as possible. It's especially important to connect changes in the breath with the degree of alertness or dullness of the mind. When you're more alert, does the breath tend to be deeper or shallower, longer or duller? And how do the pauses change? What about when you're dull? Another way to counter subtle dullness is by expanding the scope of your attention to include the sensations of the body. This works to energize the mind because we automatically use more conscious power to observe sensations in a larger area. You will even find that your scope of attention tends to spontaneously expand at this stage. For instance, you might find yourself observing the sensations of the breath in both the chest and abdomen when you were intending to focus only on the nose. Be forewarned. When the scope of attention spontaneously expands, it can also disguise an increase in dullness. There are two ways this happens. First, if you don't have enough conscious power, an expanded scope of attention will only lead to a fuzzier perception of many objects at once. As a result, you may easily overlook the fuzziness of dullness as it creeps in. When this happens, you're actually in a state of double fuzziness, the fuzziness caused by expanding awareness and the fuzziness caused by dullness. The second way spontaneously expanded attention disguises dullness is that a wider scope includes many objects that can easily be mistaken for extrospective awareness. With this wider scope of attention, you may feel like you have a good balance between attention and awareness. But in reality, awareness is fading, and dullness grows deeper. So whenever you find your scope expanding on its own, be wary. Look inward to see if there's subtle dullness. Also, never rely on the subjective feeling of alertness and clarity. Examine the actual quality of both awareness and attention. To summarize, you want to detect any deepening of subtle dullness as soon as possible, then apply the appropriate antidote. The meditation object should return to being vivid and clear, and your introspective and extrospective awareness should return to how they were before the dullness. Your next task is to increase the energy level of your mind even further. Increasing Mindfulness with Body Scanning The second major goal of this stage is to increase mindfulness. We could develop the skills of mindfulness without increasing the overall power of the mind, but that wouldn't do the job. We'd be left with a less effective mindfulness that's easily lost. You're already using one method that increases the power of mindfulness, holding the intention to maintain bright peripheral awareness while observing the meditation object as clearly and vividly as you did in your best meditations. The body scanning method in the description that follows provides an even more powerful tool for increasing mindfulness. Here is the method, step by step. 1. Shift your attention from the tip of the nose to the surface of your abdomen. Observe the sensations associated with the in-breath and the out-breath. Without losing awareness of the breath as a familiar, repeated, cyclical event, focus as much as you can on just the sensations themselves rather than on the concepts of expansion, contraction, skin, breath, air, and movement. Notice in particular the changing qualities of these sensations as the abdomen rises and falls. 
Continue until your attention is stable and you can clearly recognize the changing sensations. 2. When the perception of the breath at the abdomen is well established, choose an isolated area of the body far from the abdomen, one where you wouldn't expect to feel sensations related to breathing. Shift your attention to this area, while at the same time keeping the sensations of the breath at the abdomen in your peripheral awareness. Consider the foot as an example. Shift the attentions to the front half of one foot. Thoroughly examine all the sensations in that part of the foot without losing awareness of the breath. Investigate the foot sensations to see if any of them change with the in or the out breath. When you first start, you will probably not notice any changes. Repeat this with the back half of the same foot. Then move to the calf and lower leg, again examining all the sensations while looking for any specifically connected to the breath. Repeat this for the other foot and leg. There is no special significance to suggesting the foot as the starting point. You could just as easily choose the top of one ear and then progress over the scalp and face. Where you start and the order you go in doesn't matter. Just start wherever suits you best. Eventually, you want to closely examine the sensations in every single part of the body, first in small, highly focused areas, then in larger ones. Always maintain peripheral awareness of the breath at the abdomen as you search for any breath-related sensations in other parts of the body. You can also apply the traditional and powerful Buddhist meditation on the elements to your observation of bodily sensations. These elements are earth, solidity and resistance, water, cohesion and fluidity, fire, heat and cold, wind, movement and change, and space. For example, when you focus your attention on the sensations of touch and pressure in your foot, you'll notice a combination of the earth and water elements. In terms of the earth element, your foot feels firm, and you can sense its resistance to the pressure from the weight of your leg above and the floor below. The foot has inherent solidity and volume, and a specific shape all its own. At the same time, it's yielding and malleable, yet doesn't come apart, despite being bent or twisted due to how you're sitting. This is the water element of cohesion and fluidity. Likewise, you'll notice different temperature sensations, fire, present everywhere in varying degrees. Your sense of the shape, position, and location of your foot are all manifestations of the space element. Finally, as you observe these sensations over time, you'll notice they constantly change, growing more or less intense, moving, even vibrating. This is the wind element of movement and change. It's the practice of observing the wind element that will help you discover the breath-related sensations in other parts of the body. In fact, in the Indo-Tibetan tradition, these breath-related sensations are called the inner winds. Remember, the element's practice is simply to help you investigate sensations with greater clarity. If you find it helpful, use it. If not, you can skip it. 3. Now, examine the sensations in one whole foot. Remain aware of the breath at the abdomen and keep searching for any foot sensations that change with the breath. Then closely examine the sensations in both feet at once, staying alert for those that change with the breath. Do the same for both legs. Continue to explore your entire body in the same way, first closely examining the sensations in isolated areas, then in increasingly large areas, and even in whole body regions. Working your way through the body, you'll eventually reach areas where you can readily observe changes and sensations that clearly correspond to the breath cycle. These will almost certainly include the upper back, chest, and abdomen, and possibly the lower back, shoulders, and upper arms as well. These breath-related sensations are comparatively gross, produced by changes in pressure and body parts moving against clothing or each other. 
Eventually, however, you'll be able to detect very subtle changes related to the breath in every part of the body. As your sensitivity to these subtle changes increases, you'll have direct experience of and be able to understand the meaning of traditional terms like the flow of prana, the movement of the inner winds, and the circulation of chi. Wherever you find any changing sensations related to the breath, linger and explore them thoroughly. Once these changing breath sensations are distinct and easily recognizable, practice shifting the scope of attention back and forth between larger and smaller areas. Intend to perceive breath-related sensations with the same vividness and clarity for both large and small areas. For example, when you've discovered and investigated breath sensations in the upper arm, expand your scope to include the entire arm and hand, making sure your perception of those sensations remains clear and vivid. This won't just increase your power of mindfulness. It will also give you more direct control over your scope of attention. 4. Because this method involves so much careful scrutiny, your awareness of sensations becomes much sharper and clearer over time. Also, as mentioned, when you expand your scope of attention, you automatically use more conscious power. At some point, you'll realize you've entered a state where perception is much more sensitive, no matter where you direct attention. When this happens, and it may occur long before you've finished scanning the whole body, shift your focus back to the sensations of the breath at the tip of your nose. Notice how much sharper, more vivid, and intense your perception of the breath is, and also how introspectively aware you are of your state of mind. Practice sustaining this heightened perception as long as you can. When it declines noticeably, return to the body scan. Use the body scan when subtle distractions aren't too strong or numerous, and when your perception of the meditation object and peripheral awareness are both fairly clear. You'll find the technique is rather tiring at first because you're pushing your mind to detect very subtle sensations in unfamiliar places. It really is mental work. For this reason, when you're first learning the technique, don't scan the body right after sitting down. Otherwise, your mind will quickly fatigue and you'll spend the rest of your session struggling with dullness. Over time, the body scan will get easier until you can practice it at any point during your meditation without tiring. As your skill improves, you'll find the technique both satisfying and enjoyable. Remember. After this exploration, always return to the breath at the nose, since the purpose of this practice is to develop sustained, clear attention to your usual meditation object. Understanding Stage 5 from the Moments of Consciousness Model The Moments of Consciousness Model gives us a better understanding of the practice at this stage. Think about a digital photograph. The vividness and clarity of the image depend on the number of pixels. Likewise, the vividness and clarity of the meditation object depend on the number of perceiving moments of attention whose content is the meditation object. If perceiving moments decrease and non-perceiving moments increase, the subtle dullness is setting in and the quality of perception declines. Subtle dullness can fool us into thinking that we have achieved exclusive focus on the meditation object. This is because mind moments that would have otherwise gone to distractions instead become non-perceiving mind moments, leaving us only with moments of attention to the breath. However, with true exclusive focus, almost all the perceiving moments of attention are focused on the meditation object without any increase in non-perceiving moments. It's also important to recall that these non-perceiving moments have a pleasantness associated with them. So as the proportion of such moments increases, so does the feeling of gentle pleasure. Finally, because non-perceiving moments carry less vital energy the mind's overall energy level drops. 
Increasing the number of perceiving moments of consciousness through intention is the key to detecting and countering subtle dullness, as well as to increasing the overall power of mindfulness. Whenever we intend to detect subtle dullness, we transform non-perceiving potential moments of consciousness into actual perceiving moments of introspective awareness. And whenever we intend to correct for subtle dullness by making our perception more vivid and intense, we transform non-perceiving moments into perceiving moments of attention. Therefore, these two intentions, the intention to detect dullness and the intention to make perception more vivid and intense, produce even more moments of attention and awareness, and thus greater mindfulness. Each moment of consciousness that carries the intention to make peripheral awareness stronger, or the attention more intense, helps create another such moment of intention in the future. And so on. Eventually, these intentions become self-perpetuating, one leading to the next, leading to the next, meaning the mind automatically detects and corrects for subtle dullness. Finally, body scanning involves the intention to perceive extremely subtle sensations in unfamiliar areas of the body. This recruits still more moments of consciousness, increasing the conscious power of the mind and leading to greater mindfulness. When this intention is applied properly and often enough, Powerful mindfulness turns into a habit both on and off the cushion. Conclusion You've mastered this stage when you're able to consistently sustain a high level of intense and clear perception of both attention and introspective awareness during most or all of your session. Attention will gain intensity, making all the details of the meditation object quite vivid. It will also gain in clarity, so you can experience the actual arising and passing away of individual breath sensations. You will naturally abandon abstract concepts like inhale and exhale, which you were in the habit of using to follow the breath. Even though attention is extremely focused, you remain extrospectively aware. Your introspective awareness detects and automatically corrects for any subtle dullness. Mastering this stage doesn't involve reaching any particular level of mindfulness. Your mindfulness will continue to grow stronger through all the later stages. Rather, it is the ability to consistently sustain and increase your overall mindfulness in each meditation session. Your meditations will steadily improve with each sitting. Fifth Interlude The Mind System in this chapter, you will learn about the Mind System model. It builds on the previous models presented in this book and provides a more complete picture, not just of consciousness, but of the mind as a whole. The Mind System model originally comes from the ancient Yogacara school of Buddhism. For the most part, this chapter simply explains that model using modern ideas from cognitive psychology to make things easier to understand. Occasionally, though, we introduce some new concepts to make our overall picture of the mind that much clearer. Because the mind is complex, any in-depth description of how it works must be complex as well, so there's no avoiding the fact that the mind system model takes some effort and study to understand. Yet it will give you a much deeper grasp of what you've experienced so far in your practice, and will prove particularly helpful in later stages, since it throws light on ideas like metacognitive awareness, unification of mind, and no self. In short, the mind system model is a powerful tool. By taking time to become familiar with it, you will be richly rewarded. The mind as a system. You'll notice we're calling it the mind system instead of the mind. That's because, although we usually talk about the mind as if it were a single entity, it's really made up of many distinct but interconnected processes. This complex system is composed of two main parts, the conscious mind and the unconscious mind. 
The conscious mind is the part of our psyche we experience directly, while the unconscious is the part that, with its many complex, behind-the-scenes activities, we can only know indirectly through inference. The Conscious Mind The models we've presented so far talk about consciousness and the mind as though they were the same. The mind system model, however, recognizes that consciousness is only one part of the mind, a much smaller part, actually, than the unconscious. We can think of the conscious mind as a screen. Projected onto it are the contents of moments of consciousness from the six categories of sensory experience, visual, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, somatosensory, and mental, and binding moments of consciousness. The conscious mind can be described entirely in terms of these seven types of moments of consciousness. In other words, consciousness is visual experience, auditory experience, etc. Our experience of these moments of consciousness is passive. Yet recall from the moments of consciousness model that every moment also has an active component, intention. The intention in a moment of consciousness may be subliminal, remaining in the background, or may itself become an object of attention. These conscious intentions can be precursors to mental, verbal, or physical actions. For example, say that a moment of somatosensory consciousness arises with an unpleasant skin sensation as its object. The accompanying intention might be a spontaneous urge to scratch an itch. Another example is when a moment of visual consciousness arises. If its object is interesting, there will be an intention to stay focused on it. Consciously, we'll experience this as interest in and continued attention to that beautiful flower. Objects such as memories and ideas, perceived via the mind sense, also have intentions associated with them. Say a particular memory from your childhood arises. That moment of consciousness arrives with an intention to pursue a sequence of thoughts associated with the memory. If the intention is strong enough, that's exactly what will happen. Consciously, you'll experience yourself starting to reminisce about your childhood. We often feel like we're engaging in these long trains of thought intentionally. Yet, as you know from your practice, they can be spontaneous and impulsive as well. The intention connected with a mental object, such as a memory, can drag attention through a long sequence of impulsive thoughts. Once again, all moments of consciousness have intentions associated with them, intentions that we may experience consciously as an impulse towards some mental, verbal, or physical action. The unconscious part of the mind system is divided into two major parts, the sensory mind and the discriminating mind. The sensory mind processes information from the five physical senses. It generates moments of sight, sound, smell, and so forth. In contrast, the discriminating mind, the greater part of which is called the thinking, emotional mind, produces moments of consciousness with mental objects, such as thoughts and emotions. It's the part of the mind where reasoning and analysis occur. The sensory and discriminating mind are each composed of many individual sub-minds that function simultaneously and autonomously. Like major divisions within a corporation, each with many departments serving specific purposes, each sub-mind independently performs its own specific task in the service of the mind system as a whole. The Sensory Mind the sensory mind is only concerned with information coming in from the outside by way of the physical senses. Within the sensory mind, there are five sub-minds, each with its own sensory field corresponding to one of the five physical senses. One sub-mind works exclusively on phenomena concerned with vision, another exclusively on phenomena concerned with hearing, and so forth. Each sensory sub-mind has its own specialty, so to speak, called its cognitive domain, 
as well as its own function to perform. The job of each of the sub-minds is to process and interpret raw sensory data as it comes in. First, the sub-minds create sense precepts from that raw information, mental representations of the actual stimulus received by the sense organs. These sense percepts are what we perceive as warmth or blue or a chirp, for example, once they eventually reach consciousness. Next, these sense percepts are recognized, categorized, analyzed, and evaluated in terms of their immediate importance. For instance, consider an external sound that the auditory mind picks up from your surroundings. The auditory mind takes that raw information, processes it, and converts it into a still very raw mental representation of the sound. That sense percept may take the form of a loud, sharp noise. The next step is for the auditory mind to recognize the sense percept, give it a more descriptive but very basic label like hand clap, then categorize and evaluate it as unexpected but not threatening. Remember, this all happens in the unconscious before you have the conscious experience of hearing the sound of a hand clap. Finally, each sub-mind can also store these sense percepts, adding them to a database or inventory that makes it easier to interpret new information in the future. At the end of this process, the unconscious auditory mind projects the hand clap into your peripheral awareness. From there, it can become the object of a moment of attention. Keep in mind that, unlike in this example, most sounds, sights, smells, etc., processed by the sensory minds, remain in a kind of awareness that happens entirely at an unconscious level. The whirring of a fan, sensations of sitting in a chair, or the faint smell of carpet cleaner are examples of things we may not be conscious of, but potentially could be. They don't become conscious because they're filtered out at the level of subconscious awareness. Along with each sense percept, the sensory sub-minds also produce a hedonic feeling of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. This hedonic feeling accompanies the sense percept as part of a moment of consciousness. For example, the somatosensory mind will evaluate a cool breeze on the skin as pleasant, but a mosquito bite as unpleasant. By contrast, breath sensations tend to be neutral. The last important point about sensory minds is that they play an important role in automatic reactions. For instance, if the auditory mind picks up a strange or unexpected sound, your head will immediately turn toward that sound. That's an inborn reflex. But there are many other automatic reactions we learn through practice and repetition, like when a sprinter leaps off the starting block in response to the starter's gun. Whenever a reflex motor response is programmed to a particular stimulus, the sensory sub-mind involved will automatically initiate the response. This means we'll never be conscious of an intention to perform a reflex reaction. It will just happen, and we only become aware of the action once it's already in motion. As you can tell, these sensory sub-minds are all doing a lot of processing outside of consciousness. The final products of this activity are sense percepts, associated hedonic feelings, and automatic responses. When sense percepts and hedonic feelings are projected into consciousness, this information becomes available as input for the discriminating mind. The discriminating mind. The sensory minds don't project every sense percept they generate into consciousness, but those they do become available to the discriminating mind. It assimilates that information, further processing these sense percepts and transforming them into more complex mental representations, in other words, into perceptions. For example, the visual mind will project a collection of sense percepts into a consciousness as, say, an image of a rapidly moving black and red thing or an even more specific image, such as a black and red bird flying by. 
The discriminating mind takes that and creates more elaborate representations of this simple concept by combining it with memories, previous sense percepts, and other stored information, and even things from our imagination. The image of a black and red bird thus becomes transformed into the specific conceptual object, red-winged blackbird. The original sense percepts may have been accompanied by a hedonic feeling of pleasure at the gracefulness of the shape and the combination of black and red. The discriminating mind might then add its own emotional overtones, such as an experience of happiness at seeing and correctly identifying such a beautiful bird. Perceptions based on sense percepts are only one kind of mental object produced by the discriminating mind. It also generates a large variety of other, more purely conceptual representations, such as thoughts and ideas. Emotions such as joy, fear, and anger likewise come from the discriminating mind, which is why we call a major part of it the thinking emotional mind. Finally, it can produce its own hedonic feelings of pleasure and displeasure. Here's an example of how the discriminating mind works. Let's say that earlier in the day, someone called you pushy. After that thought registered in consciousness, it sank into the discriminating mind. Throughout the day, the discriminating mind further digested that information on an unconscious level, perhaps deciding that being called pushy was unpleasant. Later that night, the discriminating mind may project a memory of the incident back into consciousness, along with a feeling of displeasure. When this displeasing memory becomes an object of consciousness, the discriminating mind can process it even more and project new thoughts or emotions about the incident into consciousness. Questions may arise such as, What does pushy mean? Should I feel ashamed or angry about being called pushy, or maybe proud, since pushiness is a kind of assertiveness, or is it really true, and should I try to change? These examples are intended to give you a sense of how the discriminating mind works. However, speaking of it as though it were only one thing is misleading. In reality, the discriminating mind consists of many separate sub-minds, just like the sensory mind. Each sub-mind performs specialized activities and has its own particular function and purpose. This can be anything from performing arithmetic to caring for a baby to deciding when a situation calls for you to get angry. Any or all of these sub-minds can be active at the same time. And although several may be working on the same task, they do so independently of each other. A Closer Look at the Discriminating Mind Let's zoom in and look at these discriminating sub-minds in more detail. There's a continuous stream of information flowing into consciousness. Each sub-mind only takes from consciousness the information relevant to its particular job and ignores the rest. After the selected information has been discriminated and recombined in various ways, the results may be projected back into consciousness. In our earlier example, one particular sub-mind of the discriminating mind projected the final perception of a red-winged blackbird into consciousness. However, in the interim, following the earlier image of a black and red moving object, Many other sub-minds may have projected information into consciousness that contributed to that final perception. As each sub-mind acquires more and more information relevant to its purpose, it organizes that information into its own continuously evolving model of reality. When you were eight, you may have firmly believed in Santa Claus, but at some point you realized Santa doesn't exist. This potentially difficult insight forced specific sub-minds to revise their model of reality. Each sub-mind also evaluates all new information and produces hedonic feelings of pleasure or displeasure in response. For example, the sub-mind responsible for rational thought may feel great pleasure in systematically tearing apart the logical flaws 
in another person's theory. A different submind may produce feelings of displeasure when you run into your ex-spouse. These hedonic feelings in turn trigger craving in the form of desire or aversion. All of this becomes the source of intentions that produce mental, verbal, and physical actions in an attempt to satisfy desire and aversion. In Stage 2, we talked about how different parts of the mind may have different agendas. We experience this as internal conflict over what to do in a given moment. One part of the mind wants to meditate, but other parts would prefer to have a drink, read a book, nap, or engage in a sexual fantasy. These conflicting desires are evidence of different sub-minds functioning independently within the discriminating mind. Each of these sub-minds wants you to be happy but each has a different idea of the best way to do that. When we consider the diverse influences these unconscious minds exert on our everyday actions, it's amazing we manage as well as we do. One of the reasons we usually function without too much trouble is because, in a manner of speaking, not all discriminating sub-minds are created equal. In fact, they're arranged in a hierarchy. At the top are sub-minds in charge of things like personal values, self-image, and weighing consequences. These tend to dominate other sub-minds, such as the erotic sub-mind, or the sub-mind responsible for anger. Some final points about the sensory and discriminating sub-minds. The activities of the sensory and discriminating sub-minds don't just determine what sensations we perceive or what thoughts and emotions arise in consciousness. They also dictate the movements of attention. In the Moments of Consciousness model, we discussed how every perceiving mind moment has an element of intention associated with it. Part of the intention associated with each moment of awareness is for certain things to become objects of attention. This intention may be strong or weak, but when it's strong enough, our attention automatically shifts to the new object. That's why we experience a constant movement of attention as we go through the day. A strong intention for your focus to be drawn to specific objects also explains the coarser kinds of scattered attention when we're meditating. Gross distraction, forgetting the meditation object, and mind-wandering. It's also responsible for the experience of subtle distraction, when attention briefly alternates with other objects, even while we're focusing on the breath. The final point to make about these sub-minds concerns how active they are in a given moment. The level of activity of the sensory sub-minds depends on how much external stimulation is present, for instance, when we're absorbed in a beautiful piece of music, the auditory sub-mind is extremely active. However, when we're in a quiet room, the auditory sub-mind remains fairly idle. And, of course, all the sensory minds become mostly inactive during deep sleep. On the other hand, the discriminating sub-minds remain continuously active, even during deep sleep, or when we're awake but not consciously thinking. We are all familiar with the evidence for this ongoing activity beneath the surface. For example, say you forgot where you left your wallet, or you can't think of a specific word, no matter how hard you try. You give up and go do something else. Then, suddenly, minutes or hours later, the answer pops into your head. Similarly, the solution to a difficult problem often appears seemingly out of nowhere and at the strangest times, sometimes even in dreams. Dreaming itself is evidence of the discriminating sub-minds continuously at work. In fact, a sub-mind with a task to perform will remain active even during deep, dreamless sleep. This explains why we sometimes wake up in the morning with a feeling of anxiety, unease, or some other emotion that seems to have no apparent cause. Functions of the Conscious Mind Here's the picture presented so far. Every sub-mind belongs either to the unconscious sensory or unconscious discriminating mind. 
Each submind performs its own specialized task independently of others and all at the same time. Each can project content into consciousness as well as initiate actions. Obviously, there's enormous potential for conflict and inefficiency, if not total chaos. This is where consciousness fits into the picture. The conscious mind provides an interface that allows these unconscious sub-minds to communicate with each other and work together cooperatively. The conscious mind acts as a universal recipient of information. It can receive information from each and every separate unconscious sub-mind. In fact, all conscious experience is simply an ongoing stream of moments of consciousness whose content has been projected into the conscious mind by unconscious sub-minds. Then, when information enters consciousness, it becomes immediately available to all the other sub-minds. Therefore, the conscious mind also serves as a universal source of information. Because the conscious mind is both a universal recipient and a universal source of information, all the unconscious sub-minds can interact with each other through the conscious mind. As a helpful image, picture the whole mind system as a kind of corporation. It is made up of different departments and their employees, each with distinct roles and responsibilities. These are the unconscious sub-minds. At the top of the corporate structure is the boardroom, or conscious mind. The diligent employees working in their separate departments produce reports, which get sent to the boardroom to be discussed further and perhaps acted on. In other words, the unconscious sub-minds send information up into the conscious mind. The conscious mind is simply a passive space where all the other minds can meet. In this boardroom-of-the-mind metaphor, the conscious mind is where important activities of the mind system get brought up, discussed, and decided on. One, and only one, sub-mind can present its information at a time, and that's what creates single moments of consciousness. The object of consciousness during that moment becomes part of the current agenda and is made simultaneously available to all the other sub-minds for further processing. In subsequent moments, they project the results of their further processing into the consciousness, creating a discussion that leads to conclusions and decisions. Key Point 1. The Conscious Mind and the Mind System the conscious mind doesn't actually do anything. Although an enormous amount of important activity takes place there, the conscious mind can be regarded as a space where things happen. Everything that appears in consciousness, decisions, intentions, actions, and even the sense of self, actually comes from the unconscious mind. Even when these become conscious, what happens with them depends on the activities of the unconscious sub-minds, However, this does not mean the conscious mind is just some incidental byproduct of the unconscious mind that doesn't affect anything. Without the conscious mind, the unconscious sub-minds couldn't work together to perform their many different jobs. Executive Functions, Mind System Interactions, and Intentions Higher Order Cognitive Tasks Things like regulating, organizing, inhibition, planning, and so forth are referred to by psychologists as executive functions. Five kinds of situations require executive function because pre-programmed behavior is not sufficient. Planning and decision-making, correcting errors and troubleshooting, situations that require novel actions or complicated sequences of action, dangerous or complex situations, and situations requiring the inhibition of our usual conditioned and habitual responses in order to take a different course of action. These executive functions are a crucial mind-system activity. They involve many sub-minds interacting through consciousness to coordinate the activities of sub-minds, communicate information between sub-minds, discriminate between conflicting information from different sub-minds, 
decide between conflicting intentions of different subminds, integrate new information into appropriate subminds, and program new patterns of behavior into individual subminds. Before taking in any more technical information, you should be asking yourself, how is all this relevant to my practice? The answer is you've been using executive functions this whole time to train the mind in meditation. For example, when you find yourself resisting a tempting distraction from a particular sub-mind in order to keep your attention on the breath, you're using an inhibitory executive function. This executive function inhibits your automatic impulse to indulge in the distraction. An example of a more active situation is when you intentionally use executive functions to train the mind to automatically correct for dullness or distractions. Over time, consistently using executive functions in this way actually changes the automatic behavior of the mind. That's why, by the time you reach stage six, dullness and gross distraction are no longer problems. Let's be clear. There isn't an executive in charge performing all these functions. There isn't some sub-mind called the executive sub-mind that coordinates, integrates, decides, and so forth. Instead, executive functions are the result of many sub-minds communicating through consciousness to arrive at a working consensus. Return for a moment to the corporation metaphor. The unconscious sub-minds meet in the boardroom of the conscious mind. No one sub-mind acts as the chairperson to call the meeting to order, set the agenda, call for reports, or accept motions that lead to actions. Instead, all the sub-minds must act cooperatively to fill the role of chairperson. They work together to exhibit leadership, coordinate their activities, and reach a consensus. This is only possible because these many sub-minds have simultaneous access to any information present in the conscious mind. The information discussed by the sub-minds can include any sense percepts, hedonic feelings of pleasure or displeasure, and intentions projected by the five sensory sub-minds into consciousness. It can also include the perceptions, concepts, thoughts, and ideas, mental states and emotions, hedonic feelings of pleasure or displeasure, and intentions projected by the discriminating sub-minds. Remember, although this information becomes available in consciousness only one item at a time, all the sub-minds can process it simultaneously. It's like a group of board members all looking at the same PowerPoint slide. Individually, each sub-mind can respond to information in the conscious mind in several different ways. It can modify its own stored information, project new information of its own into consciousness so other sub-minds have access to it, or activate any of its own existing motor response programs. However, it can also participate in executive functions, working jointly with other sub-minds to create novel actions, new motor response programs for other sub-minds, or new motor response programs of its own. When you learn a poem by heart, for example, the performance of one particular sub-mind is repeatedly corrected by many other sub-minds until, eventually, you can recite that poem perfectly, even years later. And when we learn to meditate, the shared collective conscious intentions of other sub-minds cause the somatosensory mind to alter its own behavior to focus on the breath. Collectively, unconscious sub-minds use the information projected into consciousness to interact with each other in solving problems, making decisions, and creating new responses to situations. In other words, this collective interaction of sub-minds and its resulting outcome is the executive function process. Executive functions also have the ability to modify individual sub-minds' existing motor response programs. The result can be a completely new motor program. Say, for instance, that you only know how to drive an automatic transmission, but are in the process of learning to use stick shift. 
you'll have to consciously override your old programming and consciously learn how to step on the clutch, reach for the gear shift, and step on the gas. Each of these physical movements calls the activities of particular sub-minds, visual, somatosensory, discriminating, etc., into consciousness. This, in turn, allows all your sub-minds to work collectively to change the automatic, unconscious behaviors of certain sub-minds in particular. Some programs will be slightly altered, others will be changed entirely, and completely new ones may be created. An extended example of mind-system interactions. Let's continue the example of driving to understand how the independent sub-minds of the unconscious work and the role that consciousness plays. If you're an experienced driver, driving in traffic has become a matter of habit. The visual mind operates constantly, directing the eyes where to look in a programmed pattern of movement. It checks mirrors, looks at the vehicle immediately in front of you, then further ahead, then immediately beside you. Based on this information, the visual mind produces an appropriate motor response. It adjusts the steering, the pressure on the gas or brake, and maybe causes one hand to brush the hair away from your eyes so you can see better. At the same time, the somatosensory mind senses acceleration and deceleration and responds with its own motor responses, fine-tuning the gas, brake, or steering. While doing all this... It can also sense an itch on your cheek and cause your hand to scratch it or detect some discomfort in your hips and shift your weight to redistribute the pressure. Once more, all these events can take place at a completely subconscious level. As you probably know from personal experience, you can drive through city traffic for miles, oblivious to what's happening around you. You're not even able to recall it afterward. Still, during that time, countless different actions were performed well enough to get you where you were going. You might have paid attention to these events as they happened, but more likely, if you were conscious of them at all, it was only in peripheral awareness. Your attention was preoccupied with remembering, analyzing, planning, or a conversation with your passenger. Regardless of where your attention was, many other sub-minds kept working on a non-conscious level. This includes the sub-minds of the discriminating mind. The kinds of information they deal with are different from that of the sensory mind, and the programs they use and the activities they generate can be far more complex. They continuously sort through the contents of the mind, solving problems at an unconscious level. Sometimes they just project their activities into peripheral awareness. Other times they call attention to things we need to do, such as pick up milk at the store. This explains why, seemingly out of nowhere, a completely unrelated thought and its attendant emotions will spring into consciousness. For instance, you may suddenly remember with dismay an important phone call you forgot to make. Now, Let's say that during all this unconscious driving, a trash can rolls into the street in front of you. If you were keeping track of your driving in peripheral awareness, the trash can will immediately become an object of attention. Even if you were driving completely unconsciously, the visual mind will project that unusual event into peripheral awareness, then call attention to it. If there's time. Yet when something happens that demands an even quicker response, you will react before you become conscious of it. You will suddenly break, swerve, or maybe both, to avoid the trash can. If you're lucky, and without consciousness it will only be luck, you won't run into someone else or get rear-ended by the car behind you. On the other hand, if you were paying attention to driving and more fully aware of everything around you, your reaction would have also happened via consciousness. The inhibitory executive function process would override your automatic reaction to slam on the brakes or swerve, allowing you to brake more slowly, swerve less, or not at all, or in a safer direction. You may have even chosen to hit the trash can to avoid a more serious collision. If you were driving consciously, 
every part of your mind would have had ongoing access to lots of different information relevant to the situation. When the impulse to break and swerve arose, it could be modified by other parts of the mind, resulting in a better outcome. You might even have raised up your coffee cup to avoid spilling it all over yourself. Intentions In one form or another, intention drives everything we feel, think, say, and do. Intention even determines what goes on in our minds, including what we pay attention to and ignore. Whenever more than one course of action is possible, which is almost always, the decisions we make and our ensuing actions are determined by our intentions. The mind system model helps us see where these intentions come from, why they arise, and how they work. You'll understand why you do what you do, and how you can change it for the better. First, we need to distinguish between intentions we're conscious of and unconscious intentions. Remember, all intentions are ultimately generated by unconscious sub-minds. A conscious intention is just one that has been projected into consciousness. When this happens, many different sub-minds have an opportunity to support or oppose that intention before it actually gives rise to an action. This means any action arising from a conscious intention requires a consensus of sub-minds interacting in the conscious mind. This top-down process takes place via the boardroom of the mind. By contrast, actions caused by unconscious intentions happen automatically. All we're conscious of are the actions themselves, after they've already been initiated. For example, you may automatically let go of a scalding hot mug of tea that you tried to pick up without having been conscious of the intention to let go. These automatic actions arise from a bottom-up, stimulus-driven process originating in a single, unconscious sub-mind. Spontaneous movements of attention are another example of this kind of bottom-up, stimulus-driven process. Let's look more closely at how the top-down process involving conscious intentions works in the decision to sit down to meditate and focus your attention on the breath. A single sub-mind first gives rise to an unconscious intention to meditate, then projects it into the conscious mind. There, it becomes a conscious intention that gets communicated to other sub-minds. For this intention to become a decision and get acted on requires that enough other sub-minds agree to it to outweigh all the other competing intentions. The result of this top-down collective decision is that you sit on your cushion with the intention to focus your breath. As we progress in our practice, we repeatedly invoke the top-down intention to pay attention to breath sensations. In response, the somatosensory mind learns to consistently produce moments of attention to the breath. Realize that the somatosensory mind had been detecting breath sensations all along at an unconscious level. That's its job. However, they weren't projected into consciousness until they became an intentional object of attention. Now, with the consensus of enough other sub-minds, those previously unconscious sense percepts get projected into consciousness, where they quickly become objects of attention. Next, consider the bottom-up process involving unconscious intentions, which obstructs our meditation by producing spontaneous movements of attention. When we sit down and start meditating, it's just a matter of time before other unconscious sub-minds begin projecting things into peripheral awareness they want noticed. These moments of peripheral awareness carry an intention for their objects to become objects of attention. For instance, if someone is making coffee in an adjoining room, the olfactory mind will pick up the aroma and project it into awareness. If the associated intention is strong enough, attention will spontaneously shift to the smell of coffee. Then attention may move on to the pleasant thought of having a latte with extra whipped cream. 
Unlike the conscious, top-down decisions arrived at by sub-minds working together, these shifts of attention to distracting objects come from the bottom up, originating within individual unconscious sub-minds. Many different sub-minds are always projecting their objects and intentions into awareness, so when we meditate, we experience lots of distractions. Fortunately, we aren't entirely at the mercy of these unconscious intentions. Over time, you've directly experienced how conscious intentions can influence spontaneous movements of attention. That's why you were able to overcome the problem of gross distraction. As long as there's a strong enough consensus of sub-minds, you can keep attention from responding to unconscious intentions. But how do top-down conscious intentions influence the bottom-up intentions and actions of unconscious sub-minds? Conscious and Unconscious Intentions There's a dynamic interplay between conscious and unconscious intentions. Think about the way bottom-up material becomes conscious. Each unconscious sub-mind decides on its own which content is important enough to need executive processing, and it projects that into peripheral awareness. For instance, say that the auditory sub-mind perceives an unusual sound that it can't identify on its own. It will project the sound into consciousness as a series of moments of peripheral awareness, along with the intention for the sound to become an object of attention. Once the sound enters peripheral awareness, the mind system as a whole can do a quick preliminary evaluation of both the sound and the intention to pay attention to it and make a decision. If the mind system concludes the sound is important enough, attention will shift to it. However, if the decision goes the other way, the intention to attend to the sound will be blocked. If this keeps happening, the object may keep appearing in peripheral awareness, but it will no longer vie for attention. Sometimes a sub-mind deems its content to be so important that it projects it into consciousness with a very strong intention for it to become an object of attention. If no other sub-minds immediately oppose that intention, the object will spontaneously capture attention. In any case, once the object becomes the focus of attention, the other sub-minds will analyze it in great detail. If it's a sound, for example, the visual sub-mind may identify some visual object as the source of the sound, or the discriminating mind may identify the sound based on previously stored information. The mind system blocks information from individual sub-minds in a variety of circumstances sometimes even when an object arrives in peripheral awareness with a strong intention to be noticed. For instance, when we first jump into a swimming pool, peripheral awareness is flooded with sensations from our skin. The same thing happens when we first enter a noisy room. The auditory mind is overwhelmed with sounds. In both cases, particular sub-minds flood the conscious mind with information which the mind system then marks as unimportant. That is, we become habituated to these sensations after a short period and largely stop being aware of them. So, even though the unconscious mind determines the content of both peripheral awareness and spontaneous attention, when that content is consistently dismissed or ignored by executive functions, it will eventually stop being presented to the conscious mind. To return to our earlier example, if you smell coffee during meditation and ignore those thoughts about the latte with extra whipped cream, they will fade from awareness. On the other hand, any object in peripheral awareness that gets attended to will continue to be presented. If this happens repeatedly for the same object, or if attention remains focused on it for a long time, that object gets flagged as something significant. Sub-minds will automatically present it and similar objects to consciousness in the future. For example, always attending to breath sensations at the nose flags those sensations and other breath-related sensations as important. Specific objects can be flagged as important, 
but so can entire sensory fields. Repeatedly attending to any sensory field, introspective or extrospective, flags the contents of that field as potentially important. Paying attention to sounds, for example, increases your awareness of sounds in general. With that increased awareness, specific objects in that sensory field are much more likely to be noticed. Likewise, paying attention to our state of mind, introspective attention, will lead to an overall increase in introspective awareness. That's why directing attention to any particular mental obstacle, such as gross distraction, makes us more introspectively aware of that kind of obstacle in the future. Yet how important any given object or sensory field actually is also depends on the situation. What's important now may not be at other times. When we're relaxed, an insect biting our arm may seem important, but when we're in a life-threatening situation, it's not. To take another example, in daily life, you want to be aware of the sensory information all around you. But in the context of meditation, specifically the higher stages, you will learn to completely ignore that sensory information. So by attending or not attending to what gets presented in peripheral awareness, Executive functions also inform unconscious sub-minds of the relative importance of particular kinds of information in specific situations. Decisions and Actions So how does the mind system make decisions? From the perspective of this model, what does it mean to make a good or bad decision? Obviously, with so many sub-minds, conflicting intentions easily arise, in both meditation and daily life. When this happens, we experience uncertainty or internal conflict. It's like when we're deciding what to order on a menu. The salad would be healthy, but the pizza would taste better. The process of deliberating that we go through is basically the different minds offering their arguments in an attempt to achieve agreement. As long as we're in this state of indecision, the participating sub-minds will keep casting their conflicting votes until they reach some sort of consensus. This casting of votes is, in fact, the executive decision-making process. Although you may eventually say to the waiter, I'll have the pizza, in reality, various parts of the mind contributed to making that decision. It would be more accurate to say, we will have the pizza, but that might confuse the waiter. The point is, many different sub-minds participate in the process of deciding between conflicting intentions. The end result is a conscious decision and intention and a consciously directed course of action. If you're meditating, that means a majority of sub-minds have agreed to direct and sustain attention on the breath and ignore the competing distraction. Of course, this decision-making process isn't limited to meditating and deciding what to eat. It applies to intentions of every kind, in every situation. When an unconscious sub-mind projects an intention into consciousness, that intention will either be allowed, further reinforced, altered, or simply blocked. Any of these responses is the result of interactions occurring in the mind system as a whole and any mental, verbal, or physical action can be interrupted even after it has been set in motion if the consensus happens to shift for some reason. You can, for instance, change your mind and call the waiter back to ask for the salad. Whenever we have to make a decision, there are some sub-minds whose input is particularly relevant. If any of those don't contribute to the decision-making process, Maybe they remain dormant or are preoccupied with something else. It's more likely we'll make a bad choice. This is why people often regret their decisions afterward. What was I thinking? I shouldn't have bought this sports car. I have three children to drive around. Limited participation by too few sub-minds leads to poor decisions. The best decisions come from the fullest participation of every part of the mind system— which is one reason why increased mindfulness is so valuable in daily life. If we can avoid jumping to a quick conclusion 
but without getting paralyzed by doubt, then indecision and opposing inclinations provide an opportunity for many different sub-minds to participate in the decision-making process. For example, immediately identifying with anger typically leads to regrettable actions. But if there's some hesitation in identifying with the anger, maybe because you remember to observe it mindfully instead, then a different result becomes possible. The delay allows information from other sub-minds to rise into the conscious mind, offering different courses of action. Consider what happens during meditation. If we have decided to meditate, there's a consensus in the mind system for attention to focus on the breath sensations. However, at some point, a somatosensory sub-mind may start projecting a sense-percept of knee pain into awareness, along with an intention to make that pain the focus of our attention. The executive function of the mind system working collectively can override that intention and ignore the knee pain, even though it may remain in peripheral awareness. Then, maybe a short time later, a discriminating sub-mind may project thoughts about a favorite activity into awareness. These thoughts also arrive with the intention to become objects of attention. As before, this new intention is opposed by the pre-existing intention to watch the breath. Yet, let's say that this time, the other sub-minds of the discriminating mind support the intention to think about the activity. That inner conflict then becomes conscious, and a decision must be made. However the situation resolves itself, it's experienced subjectively as a conscious decision, leading to a conscious, intentional act of attention. You either consciously decide to return to the breath or to pursue the thought. Still, this outcome is actually the result of a collective decision made on an unconscious level by a group of sub-minds. To stay focused on the breath over long periods requires an ongoing, uninterrupted consensus. Training the Unconscious Sub-Minds To consistently create this kind of consensus, you train unconscious sub-minds through executive processes. Unconscious sub-minds exchange information in the conscious mind, and when that new information has been digested, it changes their behavior. This is learning in the deepest sense of the word. One of the things that makes a human mind special is that we can radically change our programming. No matter how hard you try, you won't be able to teach a lizard to play fetch. The wiring is simply too inflexible. We, on the other hand, are constantly modifying our behavior at every scale, down to the subtlest levels of mental and physical responses. In mind system terms, we can program unconscious sub-minds through conscious intention, so that even following the breath becomes an automatic behavior. Individual sub-minds are highly responsive to conscious intentions. Even when you're first learning to meditate, there are times when quite a few sub-minds unite around the idea of following the breath. As long as this shared conscious intention is strong, individual sub-minds produce relatively few distractions. Yet for a novice, these periods are usually brief. Only with first-hand experience of the positive benefits of meditating, such as greater happiness and satisfaction, will a strong and lasting consensus form around the intention to meditate. A shared conscious intention has a powerful programming effect on individual sub-minds, making them more likely to produce the same consensus the next time around. This means that every time you sit down to practice, it gets easier to stabilize attention on the breath because more sub-minds agree on the benefits of meditating. Whenever we do something supported by a strong intention, the results of our actions are evaluated, and the thinking, emotional mind produces a positive or negative reaction according to the outcome. If the result is judged to be good, such as when we successfully follow the breath, the thinking, emotional mind generates a hedonic feeling of pleasure. 
That feeling is projected into consciousness along with a sense of satisfaction. When the result is judged to be bad, a feeling of displeasure is projected along with a sense of unhappiness and dissatisfaction. Positive effect reinforces the activities and intentions of the unconscious sub-minds, so they're even more likely to be repeated in the future. A negative reaction has the opposite effect. For an action to become firmly established as a programmed response, it must be repeated consistently and often. The more often the same conscious intention leads to the same action in the same situation, the more likely the sub-minds involved will react automatically, without the intention first becoming conscious. For instance, living in the desert, I have trained myself to always crack the car windows in summer so it doesn't get too hot inside. The desired result was clear, and the action required to achieve it was equally clear. Now it's become a habit. The general principle, conscious intentions, repeatedly acted upon, eventually give rise to automatic actions that no longer require conscious intention. Much of human behavior is automatic. Think of walking and eating. In fact, most daily activities, sensing external objects, processing the information, and responding to it, happen unconsciously and automatically. This is because pre-programmed reactions are quicker and much more efficient, given our limited ability to process information on a conscious level. Automatic responses result from programs, inborn or learned, that are already present in the sensory and discriminating sub-minds. Over the course of our lives, we acquire ever more pre-programmed behaviors to deal with all kinds of situations. Nevertheless, we will always encounter circumstances that previously pre-programmed behaviors can't handle. When that happens, it calls for executive function in the creation of new behavioral programs to deal with novel events. The mind system either uses a combination of existing behavioral programs inhibiting certain actions while selectively initiating others, or else produces completely new actions to meet the current needs. As a result, existing programs are often permanently changed, or completely new programs are created. In other words, learning occurs. Key Point 2 Executive Functions and the Mind System Every new skill and novel action results from interactions of the mind system as a whole in the performance of executive functions. Learning any skill, like meditation or playing an instrument, involves effort, trial and error, evaluation, and correcting your mistakes. During all of these learning activities, unconscious sub-minds are interacting collectively in consciousness to create new programs for individual sub-minds. They can also override individual programs at any time. With repetition, the individual sub-minds become programmed so that in the future, whenever it's appropriate, they automatically repeat the same activity. In other words, Consciously practicing a skill trains unconscious sub-minds to perform their new tasks perfectly. The Narrating Mind The narrating mind is a sub-mind of the much larger discriminating mind. However, it has a very special role and importance all its own. It takes in all the information projected by other sub-minds, combining integrating, and organizing it into a meaningful summary. The narrating mind then produces a very specific kind of mind moment called a binding moment of consciousness. The narrating mind and the binding moments it produces are such a subtle and ubiquitous part of the mind system that they are easily overlooked, just as a fish might overlook the very water in which it swims. However, their subtlety belies their importance. The narrating mind weaves the content of the conscious mind into a series of episodes in an ongoing story, which is why we call it the narrating mind. Each of these episodes is then projected back into the conscious mind as a binding moment of consciousness. 
The result is a continuing chronicle of the mind's ongoing conscious activities, which becomes available to the rest of the mind system. For example, as our attention constantly moves from one thing to another, the narrating mind organizes all those different experiences into a coherent description of our environment and ourselves. This description then gets projected via a binding moment into consciousness. This is similar to the way the narrating mind organizes all the varying camera angles and scene changes in a movie, so that it all fits together and makes sense. The output of the narrating mind is particularly easy to convert into words, because the very structure of language reflects the organizational patterns characteristic of the narrating mind. However, don't mistake the activity of the narrating mind for language. The process of putting something into words is a separate mental activity carried out by a completely different sub-mind of the discriminating mind. So you can better understand the unique role of the narrating mind, here's a step-by-step -step example of how information is processed and passed from the sensory mind to the discriminating mind and then to the narrating mind. When the visual mind processes information from the eyes, an image is formed and projected into consciousness. But in this seeing, there is only the scene. That is, the information projected into consciousness is simply an image, consisting of visual sense impressions like color, shape, and contrast. Although certain components of the image may be conceptually enhanced in minimal ways, the image includes no labels or complex ideas about content. Then the image appearing in consciousness is further processed by the discriminating mind, where it's elaborated on using various ideas and memories to achieve a conceptual understanding of what's being observed. The image may be recognized as an aureole, for example. This conceptual representation is then projected into consciousness. But in this recognizing of the aureole, there is only the recognized concept in other words, the only thing projected into consciousness is the idea of an aureole, along with whatever hedonic feeling accompanies that thought. If the colors and shapes of the image were pleasant, and if its recognition as an aureole was also pleasant, the feeling will be one of pleasure. But in this feeling, there is only the felt pleasure. There is nothing else in consciousness at that moment. In this sequence, seeing, Cognizing and feeling are all separate events, distinct moments of consciousness. The narrating mind then assimilates these events, weaving them together into a series of causally connected episodes. I saw it. I recognized it. I enjoyed it. That information is projected back into consciousness, where it becomes available to the other sub-minds. The sense of self and other. The I of the narrating mind is nothing more than a fictional but convenient construct used to organize all the separate conscious experiences occurring in the mind system. Our very concept of self is none other than this narrative I, the center of gravity that holds the story together. Likewise, the it is another imaginary construct of the narrating mind, a convenient fiction imputed to exist in order to link the different parts of the story together. The truth is, we never actually experience any entity corresponding to it. All that was experienced were the image, concept, hedonic feeling, and any emotion that arose in consciousness. This is an important point so take some time to think about it. The narrating mind uses this I, it, or self, other structure to organize the information coming from many different sub-minds in a meaningful way. But the discriminating mind assumes the I and the it are actual entities, concretizing the self, other construct so it seems real and substantial. Thus, the narrating mind's fictional I becomes the discriminating mind's ego-self, and the it is seen as the cause for the hedonic feelings and emotions that arise. 
That fundamental misperception leads to the generation of intentions rooted in desire and aversion. In the example just given, those intentions might lead to grabbing binoculars to see the bird more clearly, or to pursuing the bird, capturing the bird, buying another bird to keep in a cage, or even killing and stuffing the bird for future enjoyment. The earlier sequence of causally connected episodes gets extended. I saw it, I recognized it, I enjoyed it, I wanted it, I pursued it, I obtained it, and I enjoyed it again. Then, of course, inevitably, I lost it, and I grieved. Drawing on stored information about past experiences and other narratives, the discriminating mind also further processes the output of the narrating mind, creating a personal history for the ego self and a description of the world. In the future, perceptions and interpretations based on these complex constructs will trigger desire, aversion, and emotional reactions intended to protect and further enhance the ego self's well-being. The narrating mind then integrates those self-oriented thoughts and emotions into a whole new story, and this cyclical process of reinforcing the ego self goes on and on. In summary, the narrating mind just combines separate conscious events from many different sub-minds into a story, which it projects back into consciousness. But our self-awareness, that ongoing intuitive sense of being a separate self in relationship with a world of objects, comes from how the discriminating mind interprets those stories. Key Point 3 Contents of Consciousness and the Mind System The contents of the conscious mind are always and only mental constructs, fabrications that come from information processing by unconscious sub-minds. The feelings of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral that accompany our thoughts, emotions, and perceptions are the products of these minds as well. The self and the world of conscious experience consist entirely of mental constructs produced by the mind system as it processes information. Our intuitive sense of these mental constructs as real, existent entities is the result of the discriminating mind misconstruing the narrating mind's output. Emotions like desire and aversion are also mental constructs, their specific purpose is to motivate certain types of self-oriented behavior. These emotions and the intentions result from how the mind system as a whole interprets the constructs of the narrating mind. The Enduring Sense of Self You may object to the idea that your sense of being a self is a mere construct. After all, it feels very real. How can we reconcile this powerful sense of self with the idea that we are just a collection of sub-minds? Meditation is all about investigating your actual experience. So I invite you to notice how, when something happens, the I gets imputed only after the fact. Say a memory comes up as you're walking with a friend. Notice how it's only after the memory arises that you turn to your friend and say, I just remembered something. Or consider how an emotion like sadness can be present long before the thought, I feel sad, arises. In each example, and in almost every other experience, what gets attributed after the fact to the I is actually the activity of various sub-minds. To make this even clearer, Consider what happens when we face a dilemma or have a difficult decision to make. You'll discover that here, as well, the I arrives on the scene only after the conflict has arisen. Then, as the conflict continues, the I seems to fret as various thoughts and feelings arise from different sub-minds in support of one option or another. 
even after a decision has apparently been reached, the I might still experience doubts or hesitation if some sub-minds aren't convinced. But sooner or later, seemingly from nowhere, a firm decision arises. That nowhere is none other than the unconscious mind. The decision was made by the collective interaction of some of those unconscious sub-minds. After the conflict has been resolved, comes the thought, I have decided. In all these situations, the narrating mind just takes the ongoing flow of information in consciousness and organizes it into a meaningful story, attributing everything to the imaginary entity called I. The discriminating mind then mistakes this I for an actual individual rather than a product created by a collection of sub-minds. It's as if a room full of people all named George were having a debate, but all you received were reports that George said this and George said that. Like the unconscious discriminating mind receiving information from the narrating mind, you would probably mistake the group for a single very conflicted individual named George. Your decisions and any subsequent intentions and actions don't originate from some self. They are the result of a consensus among many unconscious sub-minds exchanging information via the conscious mind. Key Point 4 Sense of Self and the Mind System The basic enduring sense of self of a separate doer of deeds and experiencer of events is nothing more than a useful but fictional construct of the narrating mind, reified by the discriminating mind. In other words, the little man in the machine, the soul looking out at the world through the windows of the eyes, and the person sitting in the audience of the mind's theater are all just illusions. The discriminating mind expands on the nebulous narrative, I, until it solidifies into a more overt, concrete idea of an ego-self endowed with specific traits. The discriminating mind imputes independent self-existence to this self, imagining that it's a single, enduring, and separate entity. Metacognitive Introspective Awareness Introspective awareness means being aware of the mental objects appearing in peripheral awareness, such as thoughts, feelings, ideas, images, and so forth. Metacognitive introspective awareness is the ability to continuously observe not just mental objects, but the activity and overall state of the mind. In the ordinary, untrained mind, introspective awareness is much less developed. Thoughts or emotions arising in peripheral awareness tend to quickly become objects of attention or else fade back into the unconscious as they are replaced by other thoughts. As a result of your meditation practice, however, you become more aware of the coming and going of these mental objects. For example, with your attention on the breath, you can be introspectively aware of a worrying thought, a mental image, or a pleasant feeling. Then you can allow that thought, image, or feeling to become the focus of attention, or you can choose to ignore it until it goes away. Metacognitive introspective awareness is not just awareness of individual thoughts, memories, and emotions arising and passing. It's a much more powerful and useful form of introspective awareness. In this type of awareness... The narrating mind takes the individual mental objects in peripheral awareness, processes and binds them together, and then projects a description of the current state and activities of the mind into consciousness. These binding moments of introspective awareness provide a comprehensive awareness of the mind itself. Developing this type of meta-awareness being able to perceive the state and activity of the mind clearly and continuously is at the heart of your future meditation progress. Just as peripheral awareness of sensation and mental objects was critical in the earlier stages, metacognitive awareness provides the ongoing context for your meditations in the later stages. Ultimately, in the final stages, the mind itself becomes the object of your investigations.
Important Conclusions About the Mind System Now that we've examined the mind system model in detail, let's review the key points we've identified so far and add two more that will be of crucial importance as you enter the advanced stages of practice. Recall that the conscious mind doesn't actually do anything. Consciousness is a process of information exchange between unconscious sub-minds. Key point one. Every new skill and novel action results from interactions of the mind system as a whole in the performance of executive functions. There is no singular executive in charge. Key point two. The contents of the conscious mind are always and only mental constructs, fabrications that come from information processing by unconscious sub-minds. Key point three. These fabrications include not only a model of reality, but the ego self as well. However, the basic, enduring sense of self, of a separate doer of deeds and experiencer of events, is nothing more than a useful but fictional construct of the narrating mind, reified by the discriminating mind. Key point four. From this, we can draw out the fifth key point. The mind system is a dynamic, self-programming system, one that's constantly changing itself. It is the conscious mind that ties the whole system together and allows it to constantly change and evolve. The sensory and discriminating minds interacting through consciousness condition each other. Every event, large or small, internal or external, makes its mark and repeated events produce a kind of habit energy that accumulates over time. The results are astounding. The mind system creates an entire world from its own mental representations, which it constantly adds to and revises. It assembles a vast and complicated web of views about the nature of reality and the self, and through the processes of learning, reinforcing behaviors, and developing new motor skills when needed, it acquires more and more automatic programs for doing things. And, of course, intention is involved in all these activities. Indeed, every single emotion, thought, word, and deed comes with an intention. Those intentions mold and shape who and what we are, and determine how we experience events and respond to them in the future. The final key point is that the experience of consciousness itself is the result of the shared receptivity of unconscious sub-minds to the content passing through the conscious mind. Who is it that's conscious? The mind system as a whole. Of what is the mind system conscious? The products of the individual sub-minds that comprise the mind system. What is the purpose of the mind system? to ensure the survival and reproduction of the organism, the psychophysical entity it's a part of, thus continuing the cycle of life. This view of the mind may at first seem reductionist or even materialistic. Please don't jump to those conclusions. They're far from the truth. This is only the beginning of the real story. Our continued exploration of the mind in the coming stages will reveal a truth that's much more profound. The mind system model serves as the foundation for these later discussions. In particular, if you grasp the true nature of the mind system, it helps you avoid the problems created by the illusion of being a self in charge of your mind. As you use this model to better understand the mind, the meditation techniques you've already learned and those you'll learn in later stages will all make more sense you will be able to understand the more profound experiences you will have as you progress through the advanced stages. Particularly important are the powerful feelings of happiness and contentment that arise as the mind system begins to work together as a more cohesive, integrated, and harmonious whole. This is called unification of mind, and happens because more and more sub-minds unite around a single conscious intention the intention to meditate, and continues as you progress through the stages. 
Eventually, the mind becomes so unified that internal conflicts cease altogether. The stable attention and mindfulness will be completely effortless. As a final reflection, here are some verses from the Lankavatara Sutra that capture the essence of the mind system. Then the Blessed One summarized the teaching in these verses. Just like waves on the ocean are stirred by wind and dance across its surface, never stopping for a moment, the ocean of the unconscious is stirred by the winds of external events and made to dance with waves of consciousness in all their multiplicity, blue and red and other colors, salt, conch shell, milk and honey, the fragrance of fruit and flowers, and rays of the sun and moon, like the ocean and its waves, they are neither separate nor the same. The seven kinds of consciousness arise from the unconscious mind, just as different kinds of waves arise from the ocean. Different kinds of consciousnesses arise from the unconscious mind. Though the unconscious, the narrator, and the consciousnesses all take different forms, these eight are one and the same, no seer apart from the seen. Just as the ocean and its waves cannot be separated, so too in the mind the unconscious and the consciousnesses cannot be separated. Karma accumulates in the unconscious through the reflections of the narrator and the volitions of the discriminating mind from a world given form by the five sensory minds. Lankavatara Sutra 9, verse 46